Private L.A. Written by James Patterson and Mark Sullivan. Read by Jay Snyder. Dedication for Betty Jane, M.S. Prologue. No Prisoners. One. It was nearing midnight that late October evening on a dark stretch of beach in Malibu. Five men, lifelong surfers, lost souls, sat around a fire blazing in a portable steel pit set into the sand. The multi-million dollar homes up on the fragile cliffs showed no lights save security bulbs. Waves crashed in the blackness beyond the firelight. The wind was picking up, temperature dropping. A storm built offshore. Facing the fire, four of them with their backs to surfboards stuck in the sand. The men sipped Coronas, passed and sucked on a spliff of Humboldt County's finest. Bomber weed, N.P., choked Wilson, who'd done two tours in Iraq and had come home at 26, incapable of love and responsibility, good only for getting high, riding big waves, and thinking profound thoughts. With that hit, I most assuredly have achieved total clarity of mind. I can see it all, dog. The whole cosmic thing. Sitting in the sand across the fire from Wilson, hands stuffed in the pouch pocket of his red L.A. Lakers hoodie, N.P. wore reflector sunglasses despite the late hour. He smiled at Wilson from behind his glasses and scruffy beard, his nostrils flaring, his longish, straw-blonde hair fluttering in the wind. I second that emotion, Wilson, N.P. said, and flicked the underside of his cap so it made a snapping sound. His voice was hoarse and hinted at a southern accent. Wish I could have scored weed that righteous in the go-go days before the crash, said Sandy dreamily as he passed along the joint. I would have seen all, slayed the markets, and lived a life of wine, women, song, and that beautiful herb you so graciously brought into our lives, N.P. Sandy had lost it all in the Great Recession. Brent Woodhouse, trophy wife, big job running money. These days he tended day bar at the Malibu Beach Inn. Those days are frickin' long gone, said Grinder, barrel-chested, dark tan, dreads. Like ancient history, bro. No amount of pissing and moaning about it gonna bring back your stack of Benny Franklins or my board shop. Hunter, the fourth surfer, was stubble-haired and swarthy. He scowled, hit the spliff, said, Ass backward wrong as usual, Grinder. You wanna bring back that stack of Benjamins, Sandy? Sandy stared into the fire. Who doesn't? Hunter nodded toward N.P. before handing him the roach. Like Wilson was saying, M.P., this weed brings perfect vision. N.P. smiled again, took the roach and ate it, said, What do you see? Hunter said, Okay, so like we rise up and storm Congress, take them all hostage, and hole up in there, you know, the house chamber. We do it the night of the State of the Union address, so they're all in there to begin with, president, generals, frickin' Supreme Court too. Then... We make the whole sorry bunch of them hit this weed hard enough and long enough they start talking to each other, getting stuff done, tending to business instead of bitching and crying and blaming about who spent the biggest stack and for what. Speaker of the house hitting it, Wilson said, laughed. Grinder chuckled. <laughs> yeah, on the bong with that sourpuss senator is always trying to shove his morals up your ass. That man would be in touch with his inner freak straight up then. Not a bad idea, Sandy said, brightening a bit. A stone congress just might get the country going again. See there? Total clarity, Wilson said, pointing at N.P. before getting a puzzled expression on his face. Hey, dog, where you come from anyway? N.P. had showed up about an hour ago, said he'd take a beer or two if they wanted to partake of the best in the state. Cannabis cup winner for sure. Smiling now. N.P. turned his sunglasses at Wilson, said, I walked down here from the Malibu Shore Sober Living Facility. They all looked at him a long moment and then started to laugh so hard they cried. Friggin' sober living, Wilson chortled. Oh, dog, you got your priorities straight. Joining in their laughter, 
N.P. glanced around beyond and behind the fire, saw that the beach remained deserted, and still no lights in the houses above. He took his chance. He got to his feet. His new friends were still howling. Nice guys. Harmless, actually. But N.P. felt not a lick of pity for them. Two. N.P., Sandy said, wiping his eyes. What's that stand for, anyway? N.P.? No prisoners, N.P. said, hands back in the hoodie's pouch again. No prisoners, Grinder snorted. That's some kind of MC rap star tag? You famous or what behind them glasses? N.P. smiled again. It's my war name. Sorry, dogs and bros, but a few people have to take it the hard way for people to start listening to us. He drew two suppressed Glock 9 millimeters from the pouch of his hoodie. Wilson saw them first. Soldier instinct took over. The Iraq vet rolled, scrambled, tried to get out of Dodge. N.P. had figured Wilson would be the one, so he shot him first at ten yards, a double whack to the base of the head where it met the spine. The vet buckled to the sand, quivered in his own blood. What the? Sandy screamed before the next round caught him in the throat, flattening him. Frick, bro! Grinder moaned as N.P. turned the guns on him. The surfer's hands turned to prayer. Don't blaze me, bro! The killer's expression revealed nothing as he pulled the trigger of each gun once, punching holes in Grinder's chest. You mother-loving son of a— Hunter lunged to tackle him. N.P. stepped off the line of his attack, shot him in the left temple from less than eight inches away. Hunter crashed into the fire, began to burn. The killer glanced up at the closest homes. Still dark. He pocketed the guns. The wind blew northwest, hard off the Pacific, swirled the beach sand, stung his cheeks as he dragged the other three corpses to the fire and threw them in, face down. The smell was like when you singe hair, only much, much worse. But that would do it. A nice touch. Increase the panic. N.P. got a plastic sandwich bag from his pocket. He crouched, opened it, and shook out what looked like a business card. It landed face down in the sand. He kicked it under Sandy's leg, picked up six empty nine-millimeter shells, and pocketed them. His beer bottle he took to the ocean, wiped it down, and hurled it out into the water. Satisfied, he snapped the underside of his Lakers cap, waded into the surf up to his knees. He walked parallel to the beach, toward Pacific Coast Highway, head down into the wind, the salt spray, and the gathering storm. Part 1. A Vanishing Act Chapter 1 Shortly after midnight, as the first real storm of the season intensified outside, the lovely Gwyn Scott Evans and I were sitting on the couch at my place, watching a gas fire, drinking a first-class bottle of Cabernet, and good-naturedly bantering over our nominees for sexiest movie scene ever. For the record, Gwyn brought the subject up. The postman always rings twice, she announced. Remake. Of all the movies ever made? I asked. Certainly, she said, all seriousness. Hands down. Care to defend your nomination? She crossed her arms, nodded, smiled. With great pleasure, Mr. Morgan. I liked Gwyn. The last time I'd seen her, back in January, the actress had been in trouble, and I had served as her escort and guard at the Golden Globes the night she won Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role. Despite the danger she was in, or perhaps because of it, a nice chemistry had developed between us. But at the time, relationships were not clear-cut in her life or mine, and nothing beyond mutual admiration had developed. Earlier that evening, however, I had run into her leaving Patina, a first-class restaurant inside the Walt Disney Concert Hall complex, where she'd been attending a birthday party for her agent. We had a glass of wine at the bar and laughed as if the Golden Globes had been just last week, not ten months before. She was leaving the next day, going on location in London, with much too much to do. But somehow we ended up back at my place, with a new bottle of wine open, and debating the sexiest movie scene ever. The postman always rings twice, I said skeptically. I'm serious. It's amazing, Jack, Gwyn insisted. 
It's that scene where they're in the kitchen alone, Jessica Lang and Jack Nicholson, the old Greek's young wife and the drifter. At first you think Nicholson's forcing himself on her. They wrestle. He throws her up on the butcher block covered with flour and all her baking things. And she's saying, no, no. But then Nicholson comes to his senses, figures he misread her, backs off. And Lang's lying there panting, flour on her flushed cheeks. There's this moment when your understanding of the situation seems certain. Then, Lang says, wait, just wait a second, before she pushes the baking stuff off the butcher block, giving herself enough room to give in to all her pent-up desires. Okay, I allowed, remembering it. That was sexy, really sexy. But I don't know if it's the best of all time. Oh, no, Gwyn replied. Beat it. Be honest now. Give me a window into your soul, Jack Morgan. I gave a mock shiver. What, trying to expose me already? In due time, she said, grinned, poured herself another glass. Go ahead, spill it. Name that scene. I don't think I can pick just one, I replied honestly. Name several, then. How about Body Heat, the entire movie? I saw it over in Afghanistan. As I remember it, William Hurt and Kathleen Turner are, well, scorching. But maybe that was because I'd been in the desert far too long by that point. Gwen laughed deep, unabashed. You're right. They were scorching, and humid, too. Remember how their skin was always damp and shiny? Nodding, I poured the rest of the wine into my glass, said, The English patient would be up there, too. That scene where Ray Fiennes and Kristen Scott Thomas are in that room in the heat with the slats of light, and they're bathing together? She raised her glass. Certainly a contender. How about shampoo? I shot her a look of arch amusement, said. Warren Beatty in his prime. So was Julie Christie. There was a moment between us. Then my cell phone rang. Gwen shook her head. I glanced at the ID. Sherman Wilkerson. Damn, I said. Big client. Big, big client. I, I've got to take this, Gwen. She protested. But I was just going to nominate the masquerade ball in Eyes Wide Shut. Shooting Gwen an expression of genuine shared sympathy and remorse, I clicked answer, turned from her, said, Sherman, how are you? Not very damned well, Jack, Wilkerson shot back. There are sheriff's deputies crawling the beach in front of my house and at least four dead bodies that I can see. I looked at Gwyn, flashed ruefully on what might have been, said, I'm on my way right now, Sherman. Ten minutes, tops. Chapter Two Speeding north into Malibu on the Pacific Coast Highway, driving the VW Tuareg I use when the weather turns sloppy, I could still smell Gwyn, still hear her words to me before the cab took her away. No more dress rehearsals, Jack. Pulling up to Sherman Wilkerson's gate, I felt like the village idiot for leaving Gwyn. Wanted to spin around and head for her place in Westwood. Wilkerson, however, had recently hired my firm, Private Investigations, to help reorganize security at Wilkerson Data Systems offices around the world. I parked in an empty spot in front of the screen of Bougainvillea that covered the wall above the dream home Wilkerson had bought the year before for his wife, Elaine. Tragically, she died in a car wreck a month after they moved in. Head ducked in the driving rain. I rang the bell at the gate, heard it buzz, went down steep wet stairs onto a terrace that overlooked the turbulent beach. Waves thundered against the squalling wind that buffeted various L.A. sheriff's vehicles converged on a crime scene lit by spotlights. They're in the fire, four dead men, Jack, said Wilkerson, who'd come out a sliding glass door in a raincoat, hood up. You can't see them now because of the tarps, but they're there. I saw them through my binoculars when the first cop showed up with a flashlight. Anyone come talk to you? They will, he said, close enough that I could see his bushy gray brows beneath the hood. Crime scene abuts my property. But you have nothing to worry about, right? You mean, did I kill them? Crime scene abuts your property. I was at work with several people on my management team until after midnight. Got here around one, looked down on the beach. Saw the flashlight, used the binoculars, called you. 
Wilkerson said. I'll take a look, I said. Unless it's dire, tell me about it all in the morning, would you? I'm exhausted. Absolutely, Sherman, I said, shook his hand. And one of my people is coming in behind me, in case you have the driveway alert on. He nodded. I headed to the staircase to the beach, watched Wilkerson go into his house and turn on a light, saw moving boxes piled everywhere. Either poor Sherman was leaving soon, or he'd never really arrived. Chapter 3 My cell rang when I was just shy of the yellow tape. It was Carl Mentone, also known as The Kid, a twenty-something hipster tech geek and surveillance specialist I hired last year in one of my smarter moves. You here already? I asked. Up on Wilkerson's Terrace, the kid replied. Eagle's perspective. Shoot what you can in this slop. Record what I'm transmitting. Smooth on both counts, Jackie boy. I've got a lens hood, no need for infrared with the lights, and I'm already getting a feed from your camera to the hard drive. Don't call me Jackie boy, I said, clicked the phone, saw a sheriff's deputy coming to the tape, and shifted the pen clipped to my breast pocket. The kid and I now saw the same things. We're asking people to stay away, the deputy said. I showed him my badge. Jack Morgan, who's commanding? The deputy got lippy. You may have clout over at LAPD, but... I spotted an old friend moving out from under the tarps, called... Harry? Captain Harry Thomas ran the sheriff's homicide unit. I'd known him since I was a young teenager. Sixty-two now, the homicide commander had been a friend of my father's, back before my dear old dad crossed the line, built clients, and ended up dying in prison. There was a time when the old man was going downhill, and before I joined the Marines, when Harry Thomas was one of the few people who seemed to care what happened to me. Harry's craggy face broke into a grin when he saw me. Jack, what the hell brings Private out here in the middle of a storm? Ducking the rope past the miffed deputy, I said, Four dead bodies burning in a fire, and my client owns the house right above us. Public beach, Harry said, glanced at Wilkerson's home. Thin reason to be inside my crime scene, unless your client wants to confess. He's clean. But now that I've had to leave my incredibly lovely date in the lurch, and I'm all the way here, I'm curious. Can I take a look? Harry hesitated, said, No funny business, Jack. Me? Uh-huh, the homicide captain said, not buying it. Boots and gloves. A few moments later, wearing protective blue paper booties and latex gloves, I ducked under the tarp system that had been erected over the crime scene. The space stank of burned flesh. The victims, four men in apre surfwear, lay face down in the wet ashes of a fire pit. Forensics techs were documenting the scene. I got out a tissue and pretended to blow my nose before passing it over the camera pen on my lapel to remove any raindrops. Harry said, Dog walker found them. Crazy to be out in this storm. Lucky for us, though, we managed to protect it within an hour of when we think the shootings went down. Illegal to have a fire here with or without a portable pit. It was like they were begging for trouble. People are very touchy around here about the rules. Come on, Harry, I said. You think someone double-tapped each of these guys over fire pit rules? This looks professional. A planned hit. Yeah, he admitted, distaste on his lips. Looks that way to me, too. IDs? All locals, all die-hard surfers. One's a former investment guy, tends bar now down the highway. Another's a young vet who came back from Iraq with some issues. The other two, still waiting. They weren't carrying wallets like the first two. Armed robbery gone bad? If one of them was carrying something valuable enough, I suppose. Or they all shared something in common, a secret maybe, and this was revenge, I replied, squatting to look at the sand around the corpse's feet. Rain and wind must have hammered this place. No tracks. No drag marks. That's all she wrote until the lab work tells me more, the homicide captain said. But about that, Jack, I won't be keeping you in the loop. In an easy manner, Harry was telling me that, old friend or not, my time was up. 
I was about to rise from my crouch when I noticed a mustard-yellow card sticking out from beneath the dead bartender's leg. Before anyone could tell me not to, I scuttled forward and snatched it up. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Harry demanded. Back of the card was empty. I flipped it to face my camera pen, paused, handed it to a scowling Harry Thomas, and saw what was written in eighteen-point letters. No prisoners. Chapter 4 The killer who called himself No Prisoners drove an Enterprise rent-a-car toward a set of automatic doors in the City of Commerce in southeast Los Angeles. He pressed an app on his iPhone and the doors began to rise, revealing a large, high-ceilinged, cement-floored workspace that had once housed a diesel truck repair shop with three additional roll-up doors at the far end. He took the place in at a glance. Two white delivery vans, six cots, a makeshift kitchen, four metal folding tables pushed together to create one large surface covered with computer equipment, and several tool and die machines, including a lathe, a grinder, and a welding torch with two tanks of acetylene. Five ruggedly built men turned from their work to watch him pull in out of the rain, park, get out, and draw the two glocks from the pouch of his Lakers hoodie. None of the men looked remotely concerned, not even a blink. The killer expected no less of them. How'd it go, Mr. Cobb? called one of the men, late twenties, with a gymnast's muscles and the attitude of an alley dog that has fought for every scrap life has grudgingly yielded to him. Outstanding as expected, Mr. Nickerson, the killer replied, before setting the guns in front of a bald, lean Latino man who sported tattoos of the Grim Reaper on both bulging biceps. They were new tattoos, livid. Break these down, Mr. Hernandez. Straight away, Hernandez said, accepting the pistols. He laid them on a heavy-duty folding table set up as a gunsmith's bench. A sniper's rifle sat in a vice awaiting adjustment. A slighter man, early thirties, with a bleached goat's beard, got up from behind a row of iPads, all cabled to a large server beneath the tables. Did the rain screw up the feed? Cobb removed the sunglasses. You tell me, Mr. Watson. Watson took the sunglasses from Cobb, cracked open a hidden compartment in the frame, removed a tiny SIM card. While he fitted the card into a reader attached to one of the iPads, Cobb tugged off the baggy sweatshirt, revealing a ripped, muscular physique beneath a black Under Armour shirt. He reached beneath the collar of the shirt. An edge came up. He pulled. The beard, the latex, the blonde wig, the entire no-prisoner's disguise came off revealing a man in his late thirties with a gaunt, weathered face that time and misfortune had chiseled into something remarkable. Scars ran like strands in a spider's web out from the round of his left jawline toward a cauliflower ear barely hidden by iron-gray hair. It was the kind of face people never forgot. Cobb knew that about himself, and he'd suffered for it in the past. He wasn't going to make that mistake twice. He laid out the pieces of the disguise on a third folding table before looking to a wiry African-American man holding another iPad connected to a set of earphones hung around his neck. Where are we, Mr. Johnson? Cobb asked. Johnson stabbed a finger at the iPad. From the traffic we've been monitoring, L.A. sheriffs got their big guns on the beach. Better than we hoped for, Cobb remarked, before glancing to the fifth man, the largest of them all, curly, red hair, ice blue eyes, and a rust-colored, out-of-control beard that made him look like some crazed Viking. Mr. Kelleher? Kelleher nodded. Associated Press Brief ran fifteen minutes ago. Four dead males on Malibu Beach shot gangland style and set a fire. He looked up, puzzled. That wasn't the plan, Mr. Cobb. Cobb regarded him evenly. Burning them amplifies things, moves events along quicker, Mr. Kelleher. Other coverage? Kelleher took that in stride, said, All news radio picked up the AP story. Outstanding, Cobb said. Start the social media component. The big man nodded and went to sit next to Watson, who stroked his goat's beard and looked at Cobb, smiling. You caught just about everything. I edited it down to the pertinent sequence. Got sporty there, didn't it? Watson was by far the smartest man in the room. A genius, as far as Cobb was concerned. He'd never known anyone like Watson. 
a man who could handle tasks of extreme physical endurance while digesting vast amounts of data and information at a baffling rate. When Watson worked with computers, it was like he was attached to them, his own brain melding with the processors, able to analyze, compute, and code with the same mind-boggling speed. Let me see, Cobb said, moved behind Watson. So did the other men. Watson gave his iPad a command, and the slayings from Cobb's perspective played out on the screen. Hernandez chuckled when Grinder, the barrel-chested surfer, pleaded for his life. It's like he's saying, don't tase me, bro, Hernandez said. The others weren't listening. They were engrossed in the blinding quick move Cobb had used to avoid being tackled by the final man to die. Damn brilliant, Mr. Cobb, said Nickerson. You lost none of it. Johnson scowled. I still say you should have sent one of us. We're expendable. Cobb stiffened, felt angry. No one here is expendable, ever. Besides, why would I ask you to do something I wouldn't do myself? You wouldn't, Kelleher said admiringly. First in. Last out, Cobb said. We are in this together, Watson said. Upload to YouTube now, Mr. Cobb? Cobb shook his head. Let's wait. Let them make the connection to the letter before we hit them with total shock and awe. Chapter 5 The kid met me up on Wilkerson's rain-soaked terrace around 1.30 that morning, about the same time the first news of the killings was reaching the Los Angeles airwaves. You get it all? I asked. Everything you shot, the kid replied, tugging his hood down over hair he slicked back crooner style. I didn't get squat from my perspective. Smell bad? Horrible. Have Cy review the footage, then attach the files to Wilkerson's personal stuff. Reason? In case someone says he did it and we need to prove he didn't, I replied, headed toward the Tuareg, suddenly tired and wanting to sleep. On the drive home, as my headlights reflected off the water sheeting Highway 1, I considered calling Gwyn, but knew she had to be up in five hours, getting ready to head to London. Then, for reasons I can't explain, my thoughts slip to the only person I know who has never minded me calling at odd hours. I reached over to the touch screen on the dashboard, called up Justine's number, which appeared with a photograph of her I'd taken a couple of years ago. She was standing in an avocado orchard above the ocean in Santa Barbara. It was late in the day, golden light. A breeze was blowing. Justine was brushing her hair from her eyes and smiling at me. As I glanced at the photo, the full memory of that day came in all around me, as if I were there with Justine again in the orchard and the warm breeze blowing off the Pacific, back when it had all seemed perfect and inevitable between us. But then we ran into the same problem again. I couldn't open up to her the way she wanted me to, the way she needed me to. So we decided we had to keep our relationship strictly professional. Whatever the hell that will mean. Blowing out a rueful breath, I wondered if I was ever going to get over a woman I still love but just can't seem to be with, at least on her terms. And maybe mine. It's complicated. Justine is a psychologist, a fine one. She also works for me, and my cell phone rang so loudly I jerked the wheel and skidded before riding the Tuareg. The touchscreen was flashing caller ID. I stabbed the answer button, said, David Sanders, how are you? Not good, Jack, Sanders croaked. Not fucking good at all. Sanders was a powerful entertainment lawyer who'd been a discreet client of privates several times in the recent past. And every time Sanders had called, it had been like this, in the middle of the night, with some mess to be cleaned up. You ever sleep, Dave? I asked. Not when I'm dealing with a shit-fest of potentially titanic proportions, Sanders growled. I want to hire private. You, personally. I'd like you leading. I'm... Hired, Sanders insisted. Be at LAX at 7.30, the heliport. Bring a forensics team with you and someone who knows kids. Kids? Where are we going? Oh, hi, Sanders said. Tom and Jennifer Harlow's place. Uh-oh, I said. A very scary uh-oh, Sanders said before hanging up. Chapter 6 the streets in Santa Monica were still slick and blustery around 5.15 that morning, 
as Justine Smith climbed out of her car in shorts and a sweatshirt, drinking water and groaning. Her muscles hurt in places she hadn't known she had muscles. And yet, here she was, back for more punishment. Am I a masochist at some level? Is that why I work too much? My love life is a zero, and my body feels like someone whacked it with two-by-fours? Unable to formulate a coherent answer, Justine stiffly crossed the street toward a light industrial building with a garage door that bore a sign reading, Pacific CrossFit. Justine had a hate-love relationship with CrossFit, which was tougher than any other exercise program she'd ever followed. No high-tech machines, no mirrors, no fashion statements. Just Olympic free weights, gymnastics equipment, and the guts to perform brief, insanely intense workouts that often left her soaking wet, gasping on the floor, and sore for days. Justine came from academics, not law enforcement but her current job at private required her to be kick-ass strong. So when she discovered that many U.S. Special Forces operators, firefighters, and cops were switching to CrossFit for their physical training, she'd signed up at the gym, or box, closest to her. The first few weeks, she honestly thought she was going to die during the workouts. Rather than let the new regime defeat her, however, she had embraced it with her typical zeal, no matter what. She'd been first at the door on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday mornings, even before the ex-SEALs and LAPD SWAT team cops who usually showed up for this early class. Six months, she thought, then admitted that she still feared CrossFit. But she absolutely loved the fact that she could now do 20 dead hang pull-ups, deadlift 225 pounds, and her abs were ripped. There was no other way to describe them. The coach opened the door to the box from inside. A blue Toyota Camry rolled up to the curb and a guy Justine had never seen before climbed out stiffly. She crossed through a small lobby, past a changing room, and out into the box itself. She glanced at the whiteboard on the wall before starting her warm-up. When she saw the workout of the day written there, her stomach fluttered with anxiety. Grace, thirty clean and jerks for time? A man's voice groaned behind her. That's crazy. I can't move from the box jumps yesterday. Justine looked over her shoulder and saw the new guy, mid-thirties, curly brown hair, trimmed beard, and really, really nice hazel eyes. Soreness is a way of life here, Justine said. He smiled at her. A really nice smile. Paul, he said, holding out his hand. It's my fifth class. She smiled back, shook his hand, and said, Justine, a little over six months. Does it get better? Nope, she said. Not one bit. Chapter 7 It only gets worse, Justine thought, fighting the queasy feeling building in her stomach as people all around her grunted, moaned, and dropped bars loaded with rubberized weights that boomed and bounced off the rubber floor. Justine was twenty clean and jerks into the workout, with the prescribed ninety-five pounds on her bar. The big timing clock on the wall was running. Four minutes had passed since she'd started. Impossibly, one of the ex-seals had called, Time! at one minute forty seconds before collapsing to the floor. A big part of Justine wanted to lie down there with him and beg for mercy, but a better part of her got angry. She was not giving up. This was a fight to the finish, and she was finishing. Ten more, little sister, Justine thought, before leaning over to grab the bar with both hands. She gripped it, squeezed her core tight, and rose slowly, keeping the weight snug to her legs until the bar crossed her knees. Then she exploded upward, shrugging her shoulders, raising her elbows, creating a moment of inertia when the bar felt weightless. Quick as she could, she dropped beneath the weight, caught it in a racked position, and then exploded again, driving the bar overhead, where she balanced it a second before letting the weight crash to the floor with all sorts of satisfying fury. Sweat gushed off Justine's forehead. Almost every muscle in her body burned, but she was grinning. She liked the grunting, the weights crashing, the feeling like you were in a race against time. It was primal, physical in a way she'd never known before. Nine more, little sister. You, lady! Or an animal, Paul gasped minutes later as Justine struggled to get off the floor and to her feet. 
She'd finished Grace in personal record time. Thanks, she panted. I think. No, seriously, Paul said. You just kicked my ass with a heavier weight. Justine smiled. Welcome to CrossFit, where strong is the new thin. Paul laughed. I guess I need to learn to check my ego at the door. That's what they say. Still smiling, she turned away and headed toward the locker room and the showers, thinking how funny it was that she was able to go from Justine the warrior goddess to Justine a little boy crazy in a matter of moments. But he was nice and self-deprecating. And did you notice? No wedding ring? Justine? She startled, looked into the lobby. The giddiness faded, replaced by a vague sense of loss. Jack was standing there, looking like he hadn't slept. Jack, she said, what are you doing here? We caught a case that feels epic, and I need you with me on it, now. Paul passed by. Justine's eyes flickered to him and then back to Jack. She shook her head. I'm already swamped. It's not fair to our other clients, expecting me to... Jack took a step closer, murmured, Tom and Jennifer Harlow. Justine blinked. Give me ten minutes. Chapter 8 Forty minutes later, we were harnessed into jump seats bolted to the interior walls of a helicopter that Dave Sanders had chartered for some ungodly sum of money. The lawyer, a bear of a man in a linen blazer, an orange Hawaiian shirt, khakis, and sandals, sat beside me. Next to Sanders was Dr. Seymour Kloppenberg, or Psy the hip polymath criminologist who runs Private's lab in Los Angeles, and Maureen Roth, also known as Mobot. Roth works with Psy as a technical jack-of-all-trades, is even quirkier than he is, and at fifty retains one of the sharpest and best-educated minds I know. Opposite us were Justine and Rick Del Rio, my oldest friend, a fellow ex-Marine with a pit bull's heart. Next to Del Rio were two people I'd heard of but never met before. Camilla Bronson, a very put-together blonde in her forties, was the Harlow's full-time publicist. Originally from Georgia, she spoke with a soft, genial twang. The tall, ripped, and red-haired man in his mid-forties beside her was Terry Graves, the president of Harlow Quinn Productions. What we're about to tell you goes nowhere without our permission, Sanders announced as we lifted off and he handed me a folder. I expect all of your people to sign these non-disclosure forms before we get to the ranch, Jack. Not necessary, Dave. You're covered under client privilege, I said, fighting off a general unease that had been growing since we'd boarded the helicopter. I flew choppers in Afghanistan. I got shot down in a Chinook, and a lot of men died. I've never been truly comfortable in a helicopter since. I glanced at Justine, who was watching me. Dealing with the memories of the crash was how I'd come to meet Justine, one of the few people I've ever let get a glimpse of what goes on inside my head. I glanced at Del Rio, who'd been on the bird with me when it went down, the only other survivor of the crash. I guess I expected him to be agitated, or at least tense, but true to form, Del Rio was stone cold. Just the same, we like them signed, sniffed Camilla Bronson. A lot at stake here. Terry Graves agreed, removing sunglasses to reveal bloodshot eyes. Suit yourself, I said, taking the folder. Tell us what's going on. Sanders hesitated, said, Tom and Jennifer and their three kids disappeared from their ranch in Ojai. They've vanished. What? Justine said. How's that possible? Del Rio snorted, said, Yeah, people like that can't just disappear. Mobot and Psy were nodding, too. I understood and shared their skepticism. Tom and Jennifer Harlow were arguably the most powerful and glamorous couple in Hollywood these days, mega-celebrities, who had won multiple Academy Awards, written best-selling books, and given their time and names to causes worldwide, including a foundation they'd set up themselves called Sharing Hands that raised millions for orphanages across the Third World. During the twenty minutes it took us to fly north to the rolling hills of Ojai, Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Terry Graves laid out what they thought we should know. For the past nine months, the Harlow family had been living in Vietnam, where they had been making a film, Saigon Falls, 
an epic and tragic story of love and intrigue that unfolds in the last doomed years of the American War. Tom Harlow was writer, director, and lead actor. Jennifer Quinn Harlow was starring opposite her husband. Through their company, Harlow Quinn, they were also producing the film. It's the project of their lives, Sanders said. The one that will immortalize them, Camilla Bronson agreed. You should see the rushes, said Terry Graves. Just brilliant stuff. The Harlows had come back from Vietnam on their private jet four days before. To avoid the paparazzi, they'd kept the details of their return secret and landed at Burbank. The lawyer, the publicist, and their head producer were there to greet them. The Harlows were blitzed from the long flight and the longer shoot on location, but they were also determined to complete the principal filming on a soundstage on the Warner lot starting the following month. So Saigon Falls is a Warner project? Justine asked. Terry Graves shook his head. They're a minor player. No other studio in town wanted to touch the project. They all thought it was too risky, more art than commerce. Warner is involved in a nominal way. Kind of a nod to Tom and Jennifer for how much money they've made for that studio over the years. Camilla Bronson said, Tom and Jennifer raised money for the film privately to supplement what they decided to fund themselves. Which was how much? Mobot asked. The publicist and the producer looked at Sanders. The attorney shifted in his seat, glanced at Justine, who was signing the non-disclosure form, said, Sixty of the ninety-three total at last count. Personally? Dr. Sy said, as shocked as I was. The vast majority of their fortune, Sanders affirmed. But they were passionate about Saigon Falls. Zealots, in fact, Terry Graves explained. Camilla Bronson nodded, said, Tom and Jennifer were either going to make a masterpiece and a bigger fortune, or they were going to lose everything they had, Sanders said. In all honesty, I met them at the airport because I desperately needed to explain that costs associated with Saigon Falls had overwhelmed their ability to maintain their current lifestyle. You mean they were broke? I asked. Not quite, but they were teetering right on the razor's edge of it. Chapter 9 As the Southern California landscape blurred below us, Sanders went on. At the airport, I explained their dire financial situation, held nothing back, told Tom and Jennifer they were going to have to take draconian measures or face bankruptcy. What did they say to that? Justine asked. Terry Graves said, Tom acted unconcerned and said he had it covered, that a new investor had appeared who was underwriting the completion of Saigon Falls. He say who that investor was? I asked. The producer shook his head, looking highly irritated. Tom is like that, likes being mysterious for no reason at all. Creative tension, Camilla Bronson explained. Tom, and this is off the record, believes in withholding information. He does it with everyone. So does Jen, for that matter. They believe it keeps people on their toes. Okay, I said. So then what happens? Sanders replied. They pleaded exhaustion and left along with Cynthia Maines, their personal assistant in two rented Suburbans, bound for the ranch for six days of R&R. &R. Terry Graves looked like he'd bitten into something sour. Typical of them. They knew we had a week of endless meetings set up. They'd been out of the country nine months, for God's sake. But they just announced that it would all have to wait, and away they drove, leaving us in the lurch. Jen thought the kids deserved it, said Camilla Bronson. Six days to help them reacclimate. Anyway, that's the last we've heard of any of them. Sanders said. So how do you know they've disappeared? Justine asked. They've got two days left, right? The Harlow's publicist said, True, but they just stopped answering their phones, texts, and emails. When? Night before last, the producer said. I called all day yesterday on their private cell numbers and Cynthia's cell and got no response from any of them. The Harlow's attorney said, Finally, around midnight last night, the housekeeper at the ranch, Anita, answered the house phone. The housekeeper claimed to have just returned to the ranch with two other members of the staff. The Harlows had given them all nine months off with partial pay while a caretaker maintained the place in their absence. Anita said the ranch was empty, Sanders said. She said there were signs that the Harlows had been there, 
but that there was no one there now, no one. I told her not to touch anything, that she and the others were to go to their quarters and wait for me. Then I hung up and called you, Jack. So let me get this straight, I said, trying to wrap my head around the situation, looking for fact, not conjecture. Not only are the Harlows and their children missing, but the Harlows' assistant, Cynthia Maines, said Camilla Bronson. Yes, she's missing too. And the caretaker? As I understand it, the attorney said. No one else? Justine asked. Sanders hesitated, replied, Not that we know of. How do you know they haven't just gone off somewhere on vacation? Mobot asked. Because TMZ or one of the other gossip sites would have found them, Terry Graves said. Okay, I said, skeptical. Ransom notes? The attorney said, Maybe there's one at the ranch. We don't know yet. I'm not questioning your judgment here, Dave, I replied. But why not call the FBI in? They're the missing persons experts. We can't do that, Camilla Bronson said. At least not until we find out what's going on. Sanders nodded. We don't know what's happened, and until we do, we're not going anywhere near law enforcement. I said, it's also a question of business, isn't it? If the people already invested in Saigon Falls were to find out the Harlows were missing, all hell would break loose. Terry Graves stiffened, but said, Understandably, we don't want that. I wondered how far we could push a missing persons investigation before the feds found out, took over, and tried to hit us with obstruction charges. That likelihood would be amped by the celebrity factor. The FBI loves celeb cases. Fair enough, I said at last. But any evidence of violence and we're notifying the cops and the feds. Before any of them could respond, the helicopter swung on the wind and dropped suddenly. I had a moment of flashback to the Chinook, right after we were hit by ground fire and the rotor disintegrated above us. I glanced quickly to Del Rio, who looked unaffected as he said, Maybe you're wrong. Maybe the Harlows did take off to some unlikely place, wore disguises, managed to avoid the paparazzi. Not a chance, Sanders replied. I checked the Harlow's visa and Amex records. They haven't spent a dime since they bought gas down in Ojai the night they arrived. Which is an absolute impossibility, added Camilla Bronson. Why is that? Kloppenberg asked. The publicist said, Because Jennifer Harlow is a certifiable world-class shopaholic. Chapter 10 it's true, Sanders said. The Harlows, and Jen in particular, rack up a lot of credit card charges every day, but since the night before last, nothing. Out the helicopter window, the Harlows' Ojai Ranch came into view, a beautiful, otherworldly place with a sprawling white ranch house, gardens, fountains, barns, and other outbuildings flanked by horse pastures and groves of almond, orange, and pecan trees. I spotted the two Suburbans in the driveway before we landed. As the rotors died down, I finally released the tension in my fists, and all sorts of ideas bounced around in my mind. Were we on some kind of wild goose chase? Would the Harlows just be sitting inside, having breakfast? Climbing from the helicopter after Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Terry Graves, I spotted three middle-aged Latina women in maroon uniforms trotting toward us from one of the outbuildings. The publicist, the producer, and the attorney immediately veered off course and went straight to the women, with my team in tow. Have you spoken to anyone? Camilla Bronson demanded. The three wrung their hands, shook their heads. The tallest, whose blouse was monogrammed Anita, said, No, I swear to you, we do exactly what Mr. Sanders say. We go to our rooms, say nothing to nobody. Just wait for you. We no sleep. Let's continue to keep it quiet, Sanders replied. The publicist glanced at me, said, The press jackals will be all over this if we let them. Besides, we really don't know anything yet, do we? Terry Graves said. We followed him. Behind me, I heard Cy whisper to Mobot, Well, I was thinking alien abduction, little green men looking to perform experiments on the most beautiful beings on Earth. What about you, Marine? Specters? Ectoplasmic transport, she said. I had to suppress a grin. Who you gonna call? Kloppenberg whispered. Private Ghostbusters. 
I glanced over my shoulder to find the two of them beaming at their wit, and Del Rio and Justine hiding their smiles. Sanders turned from the three Mexican women. Is there something funny in all this? No, Dave, I said, covering. Not at all. Looking to Justine, I said, You interview the help. To Del Rio, I said, Take the outbuildings and the security system. Sai, Mobot, you're inside with me. We're coming inside, too, Camilla Bronson said. I'd rather you didn't, I said. At least until we've done our initial sweep. Not a chance, the publicist replied icily, and followed Sai and Mobot toward the veranda. Terry Graves and Sanders followed her. Before I could argue with them, Justine squealed with delight. A female old English bulldog had appeared out of nowhere, panting, nervous, her white fur and paws soiled, as if she'd been digging in the dirt. That's Miss Stella Kowalski, Anita choked, tears welling in her eyes as Justine went to pet the bulldog. She's the children's. Miguel's, you see? The dog goes everywhere with them, even Vietnam. This, no good. She's therapy dog, Miguel. He loves her. At that, the bulldog began to whimper and cry. Chapter 11 It took us several hours to make an initial inspection of the Harlow's ranch house. Most rooms remained in mothballs, the furniture still wrapped in plastic. But the core area of the sprawling home spoke of a family wearily trying to resettle after a long journey, and, yes, of a life interrupted. Littering the kitchen counters were dirty dishes, half-eaten meals, and glasses crusted with dried red wine. The fridge was filled with vegetables, fruit, cartons of soy milk, and the pantry was stocked with a multitude of gluten-free items. The trash in the compactor stank of chicken blood. A cold mug of coffee sat in the microwave, which flashed, finished. The telephone answering machine was filled with multiple messages from Camilla Bronson, Terry Graves, and Sanders, as well as several production assistants, film editors, and fashion designers, all of them apologizing for intruding but desperate for a few minutes of the Harlow's time. The television in the den off the kitchen was on, muted, showing the Cartoon Network and Scooby-Doo facing down yet another monstrous imposter. Lining a hall that led out to the garage was evidence of Jen Harlow's legendary consumerism. Stacks upon stacks of unopened boxes, recent and past shipments from various catalog merchandisers. In the garage, we found five wheelless cars set up on blocks under custom covers that identified them as a Bugatti, a Maserati, a classic Corvette, and two Land Rovers. That's not right, Terry Graves said, openly worried now. Tom told me he was looking forward to driving the vet. There were pictures of the celebrity couple all over the house. Most of them were what I call power shots, photographs with politicians, say, or with various Hollywood moguls, at award ceremonies and the like, images designed to boost an insecure creative soul. A few candid photos showed the couple with their three children, Malia, 13, adopted in Ethiopia, Jin, 11, adopted in China, and Miguel, eight, adopted in Honduras, and born with a severe cleft palate. More images depicted Tom or Jennifer or both in some far-flung and impoverished land, posing with gangs of smiling children or holding a withered infant in their arms. Camilla Bronson's lower lip trembled as she saw the photos, and she said, Oh, God, what's happened to them? They're such good people. I left her and went to the west wing of the ranch house, which held guest quarters, a state-of-the-art gym, an indoor pool, and a twenty-seat screening room. The pool was empty. The gym and the screening room appeared unused. Lights burned in the hallway that led to the east wing and five bedrooms laid out like a dormitory, with two bedrooms on either side of the hall and the Harlow's master suite at the far end. The bedroom on the right-hand side, closest to the living area, was Malia's. Her suitcases were half empty on the floor. An iPhone 4S with a dead battery lay hidden between the bed and the end table. The sheets were rumpled and cast lazily aside, as if the teen had gotten up for a drink of water or to go pee or maybe had just left the bed unmade for the day. Jin's room across the hall was more chaotic, with clothes in piles on the carpet and strewn on the furniture, a canopy bed covered in stuffed animals, 
and another menagerie on the dresser. The bedroom of the boy Miguel, however, was different. Neat freak different. The bed made with almost military precision. But when I walked past the bed, I smelled something acrid in the air. Sniffing around, I soon found its source. Someone had wet the bed. The room across the hall from Miguel's was empty, the mattress stripped, the blankets folded and put into clear plastic protectors. I wondered if it had been set aside for some future fourth orphan the Harlows planned to adopt. I reached the master suite, a simple yet elegant space with a Steinway Grand in the corner, shelves bulging with books, and a huge teak bed, crisply made with fresh white sheets and a folded duvet. A bay window overlooked the orchards. Paintings and several mirrors, including one narrow mirror six or seven feet long, hung horizontally high on the interior wall of the bedroom, all feng shui remedies, no doubt. Found the Oscars, Mobot called to me as she exited a massive walk-in closet to my right, hands behind her back. They were all wrapped in newspaper and stuck at the bottom of one of Jennifer's drawers. Can you imagine doing that to an Academy Award, Jack? The Harlows are unimpressed with themselves. Sanders said, coming in behind us with Camilla Bronson and Terry Graves. They don't judge themselves on the basis of public accolades, Terry Graves said. Deep down, it's always about the work. If you say so, Mobot replied with little conviction. Know what else I found piled on top of the Oscars? I couldn't imagine, the publicist sniffed. As I said, Jennifer has one of everything. Mobot smirked as she brought out from behind her back a rather large and anatomically realistic dildo with a suction cup jutting out the back end. Chapter 12 You know why they'll go for it? Cobb asked Nickerson as he steeled a knife with a short, wicked-looking obsidian blade. They'll go for it because big city hotshots are not... Deep down, they're just like some limp dick chieftain in the old country. Small-minded, predictable, and therefore susceptible to fear. Ignorance breeds it, fear, which is useful, as you know. Damn straight, Mr. Cobb, Nickerson replied, turning the blade. Justifiable in a state of war. They were in the garage in the city of commerce. Johnson was sacked out on the cots. Kelleher and Watson worked at computers. Hernandez watched coffee drip and worked more salve into his new tattoos. Cobb made a pistol with his fingers, aimed it at Nickerson, and said, Perfectly justifiable in dire times such as these. People who get power have to be worms in order to get power. What we're doing is just electrifying the soil they live in, getting it so hot and shocking they'll be forced to surface and squirm in the light of day. Then we'll have them. Hernandez came over, set a mug in front of Cobb, said, With all due respect, the pharmacy? Is that the place to maximize our efforts? Cobb ran two fingers over the spider web of scars on the left side of his face and considered Hernandez with cold intent. Hernandez was brave to the point of being impetuous, which made him one of Cobb's best men and also his worst man. Hernandez had amazing physical skills and would fight to the death if provoked but he tended to add lib on plans when it was unnecessary. And he couldn't see the big picture, a general weakness of character and intellect, at least as far as Cobb was concerned. For this to work, Mr. Hernandez, we don't want anything that could be construed as political, Cobb said at last. Nothing symbolic, if you will. No statements. Nothing to suggest this is anything other than a single maniac at work. So why the pharmacy? It's mundane. It's every day. And because of that, more people will relate to it, and the fear and the panic and the pressure will grow. We want every citizen of L.A. to feel like their daily lives are jeopardized. End of discussion. He turned from Hernandez, glanced at the atomic clock on the wall, 1,400 hours, and said, Okay, Mr. Watson, upload it. Straight away, Mr. Cobb, Watson said and began giving orders to his iPad. I'm taking it through scrubbing sites in India, Pakistan, and Hong Kong. Zero chance they'll pull an IPN on us. Cobb understood. Make sure you mix up the paths you take online. 
It's just like being on the job. No routine routes. Change it up all the time. Got the Facebook page up, Kelleher said, pivoted in his chair, stroked his red beard. You like? Cobb glanced at the iPad in front of the big man. A Facebook page filled the screen, topped with the headline, No Prisoners, Faces of War, L.A. Outstanding, Cobb said. Show them their ignorance, sow fear through them virtually. I'm going to catch a nap before things really ramp up. Sixteen hundred? Hernandez asked. Yes, Cobb said, before going to a cot and lying on it with one arm flung over his eyes. As a matter of survival, he had long ago taught his mind and body to shut down on command. When they did so this time, he plunged into a deep, dark void that after an hour gave way to dreams. It was night. The chill wind smelled of wood smoke, tobacco smoke, coffee brewing, horse sweat, and the high desert. Boots crunched on sand and rock. Dogs began to bark before gunfire threw jagged flares through the night. Women and children began to scream. In his dreams, Cobb heard men begging for mercy. He felt nothing but satisfaction at the screaming, at their pleas, and with that grew a sense of righteousness that surged when the first explosion hyperlit his mind, shook his body so hard he thought for a moment he'd been hit by the rocket-propelled grenade. Then Cobb bolted upright, instinctually grabbing the throat of the man shaking his shoulder. Watson choked and looked down at him, bug-eyed. No, Mr. Cobb! Kelleher yelled, grabbing his wrist. It's a good thing! Cobb came free of the dream, fully awake, and slowly let go of Watson's throat. We've gone viral, Kelleher said as Watson choked and coughed. Already? Cobb said, sitting up, shedding the grogginess. Johnson and Nickerson were standing there, too. Watson crowed in a hoarse voice. One hour twenty in. We've got seventy-five hundred hits on YouTube. Kelleher grinned. And two thousand thumbs down on Facebook. Those numbers will grow, Cobb remarked. Definitely. Hernandez said behind him. Fricking exponential! Cobb twisted to see not bald Hernandez, but blonde-locked and bearded no prisoners, slipping the mirror sunglasses on to complete his disguise. Cobb smiled, said, Outstanding in every goddamned way, Mr. Hernandez. Chapter 13 Put that thing away, Sanders snapped reddening after the initial shock of seeing the dildo in Mobot's hand. Jennifer Harlow's private... Uh, needs are not at issue here. Maybe, maybe not, Mobot shot back. There are drawers full of sex toys and gear in her closet. His, too. Camilla Bronson blanched. You cannot mention this to anyone. She must have said that six times over the next fifteen minutes as we discovered all manner and size of dildo, butt plug, suction tube, cock ring, and artificial vagina in the Harlow's closets. There was also a sex swing and a device that resembled a gymnast's vaulting horse, equipped with a powerful motor inside and a mechanical penis jutting out of the top. Never seen one of those before, I commented. It's called a Sibian, said Sai, who'd just come in. The penis attachment not only goes up and down, it can be set to rotate or corkscrew. And you know that how? Terry Graves asked. Kit Kat's got one? Kloppenberg replied matter-of-factly. Sanders frowned. Oh, the hell is Kit Kat? Size virtual girlfriend, Mobot said. Not really wanting it discussed that my chief criminologist's private life consisted of online video sex with a woman in our Stockholm office, I quickly changed the subject. Asked, find anything in the kitchen, Seymour? Sai nodded. Enough mold and bacteria to say those dishes and glasses are from 36 to 40 hours ago at the outside. I'll be able to give you a more definitive answer once we get back to the lab. 36 to 40 hours, which meant the Harlows had left the house voluntarily or involuntarily, roughly two days after they returned home from Vietnam. What had happened in those two days? I left the others and again walked around the house, trying to see something I'd missed on the first pass, trying to imagine the things that might have unfolded in the time before the family disappeared. Had they left on their own, 
or at gunpoint? In what vehicle? And what about the caretaker and the personal assistant, Cynthia Maines? I had more questions than answers, and the growing feeling that I was indeed missing something, something that was staring me right in the face. Then again, little of the scene made sense to me. There were no signs of violence that I could find, no indication that they'd been forcibly taken, no blood, no broken furniture, certainly no ransom note or demand of any kind. So what had happened here? I discovered an editing room in the basement below the east wing of the house, with five big screens, all linked to a mainframe server and a state-of-the-art editing and mixing console. I tried a door beyond the console. It was locked. I turned, my eyes drifting across the electronics in the editing room, and it hit me. There were no computers anywhere. No desktops, no laptops, no tablets, no handhelds except for the dead iPhone in Malia's room. This was a wealthy family in a home equipped with the highest-end techno gadgets. No computers beyond that phone? Impossible. So they were gone, too. But there had to be some kind of backup system, right? A cloud connection, at least? I was about to go find Mobot and the trio I'd come to call the Harlow team to dig into that issue when Del Rio found me. Went through the caretaker Hector Ramon's place, Jack, he said. It's like the main house, used, but abandoned. There's a cat down there, walking around, meowing. No signs of struggle? None, Del Rio said. Maybe Sai's not that far off, then. Maybe that's what scared the bulldog and made the computers all disappear. It is an alien abduction. Yeah, maybe. Except for the fact that for two hours, the night before last... Either the electricity blacked out and the backup to the security system suffered a complete failure, or the system was disarmed and fucked with by total pros. Chapter 14 Me, Del Rio, Cy, Mobot, Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Terry Graves were all crowded into a small room off the garage, watching a big screen split into ten frames. Each frame displayed a different feed from security cameras arrayed around the ranch, at the gate, near the barns, above every exterior door, and at intervals on the roof, panning the near grounds. Fairly sophisticated system, said Del Rio, who on the whole is largely unimpressed with security he didn't himself design. Redundant controllers, satellite link, cable link, pressure sensors inside the fences, lasers in the hallways. Fiber optics in the windows. Panic room off the master suite. I didn't see any panic room, Sai said. Del Rio tapped a feed that showed a room equipped with couches, a refrigerator, and two sets of bunk beds. Entrance is off Jennifer's closet. Looks like a frickin' fortress. But obviously, they never made it in there. Which means something happened to the security system? Mobot asked. They were never alerted? Something did happen. Del Rio agreed. I reviewed the logs in the two computers that run the show. At 7.27 p.m., two nights ago, the entire system went down, the backups failed, and no alerts were issued to police or the folks who installed this. And who was that? I asked. Del Rio got a sour look. You're not going to like it. I cocked my head in disbelief. Tommy? His people, anyway. Who's Tommy? Camilla Bronson asked. My brother. The guy in the papers? Sanders asked in a groan. The one implicated in that murder? One and the same, I said. What was the likelihood of that? My brother designed and installed the system. A system that failed? You think he could be involved here? Terry Graves asked. I considered the producer's question, but then shook my head. Tommy's a whack job, but his specialty is security systems. How exactly did it fail? Del Rio ran a paw over his stubble chin. Logs say the computers ran diagnostic software upon rebooting at 9.27 p.m. two nights ago. It detected a failure in the trip connection to the backup generators four seconds before the ranch's main power line died. You call Southern Cal Edison? Cy asked. Del Rio nodded. A transformer blew about that time. Cut power all over Ojai. Took three hours to bring electricity back online. 
But you said the computer log showed the system was only down for two hours, not three, I said. That's right, Del Rio said. The logs say the generators kicked back to life at 927. Main power came on about an hour later. So someone inside cut the generator and then what? Reconnected it? He nodded again. I figure coordinated attack inside, outside. Takes a few minutes for the system to reboot. Enough time to vanish when you're done. My mind raced through the people who were supposed to have been on the ranch that night. The Harlows, their kids, the caretaker the Harlow's personal assistant. Cynthia Maines, I said. What? Camilla Bronson asked. Unless I'm out to lunch here, the only beds in the house I've seen used were the family's. If Maines was here, where did she sleep? Maybe she didn't, Terry Graves said. Or maybe she cleaned up after herself, made it look as if she hadn't slept here, Mobot said. I mean, the Harlow's bed was made, right? Or Jennifer and Tom just hadn't gone to bed yet. I said, gesturing at the screen. You find tapes from these feeds? Del Rio nodded, gave the keyboard several commands. The screen images jumped and now carried a timestamp four days prior. Del Rio said, The cameras are set up with motion detectors. They only record when there's movement. Lights, too. You can see the two days of activity leading up to the system failure in, like, five minutes. He speeded up the tapes. My focus jumped all over the split screen, seeing the Harlows arriving four nights ago, hauling gear from the suburbans into the house, greeting a man wearing a straw cowboy hat, who I assumed was the caretaker, Hector Ramon, and the three kids going in and out of the house multiple times during the days and into the evenings with the bulldog rambling behind them. The dog seemed never to leave their side. Tom Harlow appeared infrequently. His wife was everywhere a frenetic personality. On the second evening, however, Tom came to the back door to watch Jennifer leave on her run, which Sanders said was a daily ritual, along with yoga. The last recording took place moments before the system failed, roughly 36 hours after the Harlows had returned to the ranch. The back door and deck view again, looking down at a steep angle. Jennifer returned from her run in the dark, sweating, chest heaving, and climbed onto the lit deck. Del Rio typed, turn that frame full screen. Jennifer slowed, stopped, turned to look behind her. The light beyond the deck was dim, shadowy, so I caught only a flicker of movement in the shadows, the hint of a human form, before the screen blinked black. What? Mobot began. Del Rio held up his hand. Wait, you're going to see the first thing the cameras picked up after the system rebooted two hours later. The screen jumped back to life. Stella, the Harlow's bulldog, was on the deck in much the same place where Jennifer had been when the screen went blank. The dog was frantic, howling and ripping at the screen door as if she'd seen something worse than a ghost. Chapter 15 At the same time, 100 miles to the south, in her Civic Hybrid parked down the block from a CVS pharmacy on La Cienega Boulevard, Sheila Vicente was a woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown. An assistant district attorney juggling a monstrous caseload, including the upcoming prosecution of a capital murder case, she was also a divorcing mother of two, and on the line with her soon-to-be ex-husband. Do you think I'm a doormat you can just walk on? Vicente demanded. Silence. Then her husband, cold, said, No, just the same old inflexible... Bitch! she said, struggling for control. I'm a bitch because you have the gall to call me at the 11th hour and ask for a different weekend with the boys so you and your plastic boob girlfriend can jet down to Cabo for a quick 48 in the sack? Pat's got two days off from rotation, her husband shot back. It's rare. Not as rare as a day off is for me, Sheila shrieked. I haven't had one in three weeks, she threw down her cell. Sheila shook from head to toe, trembled against every bit of will she had left, staring into the distance at what had once been a dream life, barely aware of the blond man with the scruffy beard, the mirror sunglasses, the baggy pants, and the Lakers hoodie pimp-strolling confidently by her car up the sidewalk and into the pharmacy. Mommy? A thin little voice came from the back seat. Mommy sad? She looked in the mirror 
saw her two-year-old son so worried, and knew now she had no choice. She had to go through with it. As much as she hated the idea, she was going to fill a prescription for antidepressants. Serious antidepressants. Chapter 16 Hernandez checked his disguise in a mirror in the cosmetic section. Not even his own, not-so-dear and dead mother would recognize him like this. Gringo to the max, man. I could be one chubby boy under all these clothes, right? How many? Cobb's voice muttered through the earpiece hidden beneath the locks of the blonde wig, breaking Hernandez from his thoughts. Nine total, Hernandez replied. Silence. Then a comment from Watson. Video and audio feeds are crisp and strong. Cobb said, Take five, Mr. Hernandez, drop the card, and leave. Going mundane, Hernandez said, feeling a familiar thrilling sense of dissent, of regressing to the primitive, of tasting bloodlust. He angled through the store, sniffed the perfumed air, plucked a king-size Reese's peanut butter cup, and tore it open. He dropped the candy into his mouth, savoring the melt as he walked to the prescription window, noticing that the pharmacist was on break. An old black woman stood to one side, hands on her wooden cane, waiting for her medicine, looking at him suspiciously. A pimply red-headed woman, the only one behind the counter, said brightly, Here to pick up, sir? More like a drop-off, Hernandez said, drawing the suppressed weapons. He shot her at point-blank range with the right-hand gun and then whirled, looking for the old woman. The crazy bitch was already swinging at him with her cane. It broke across his arm, right across the new tattoo, setting it afire, shocking him, but only for a moment before he realized she was moving to stab him with the splintered end of her cane. Hernandez's left hand swung instinctively, aimed at the old woman's chin, and shot her there. She crumpled to the tile floor. Weak, Mr. Hernandez, Cobb said. You should have taken her first. Hernandez ignored the criticism stalked through the aisles, his arm screaming in pain. But believing that no one else in the store, what with the Muzak braying, had heard the suppressed shots or the bodies falling. Guns back in his hoodie's pocket, he walked past a teenage girl shopping for nail polish in aisle three. He skirted a plump guy looking at razors in aisle five, but killed an older man checking out incontinence pads in aisle seven. He considered the middle-aged woman perusing the paperback racks, a mystery novel in one hand, but then shifted his focus to the two clerks manning the front desk, man, woman, both in their late twenties. The male clerk died stocking cigarettes, shot in the back. You got company coming, Cobb said. Move! The female clerk died screaming, the first to be aware of her impending death, trying to crouch and hide beneath the cash register. Hernandez turned, surging on adrenaline. He began to hum a favorite tune. It never got old, this feeling, better than any video game ever. Nothing came close to the real thing. Difference between porn and... Ten feet away, an anxious Latina woman in a blue business skirt and pink blouse and her thumb-sucking toddler in the seat of her shopping cart were staring at him, frozen with terror. No, Sheila Vicente sobbed. Please, I'm just here for the Xanax. Every nerve fiber... Every cell in Hernandez told him to wax her right now. The kid, too. It would make a statement. No quarter would be given. He took two steps toward the young mother as she wrenched her child to her breast and sank to her knees, begging incoherently. He stood over her, the guns aimed at her crying eyes and the back of her little boy's head, savoring the power, smelling the torrents of fear pouring off her. His fingers sought the triggers. Stop, Cobb said and then told Hernandez exactly what to do. Hernandez didn't like it, but for once, he followed orders to a T. Cell phone, Hernandez barked at her. Give it to me. Shaking, crying, Sheila Vicente got her cell and threw it down. Hernandez crushed it with his heel, slid the guns into his hoodie. He crouched before her, handed her a baggie with a lime green card in it, said, I want you to personally give the mayor this. Don't show the cops. Just tell them that you have a personal message for the mayor from me. Tell that bitch that unless she complies with my demands, there will be no mercy after this. None. Then Hernandez stood, turned, chuckled, and walked out the door of the pharmacy, 
humming that favorite melody of his as if he had not a care in this world. Part 2 Squeeze Play Chapter 17 Stella the Bulldog sprawled on her side, panting hard, as if she had run for miles in a torrid heat. Justine lay on the veranda floor, stroking the poor beast's head and laying wet towels over her body. Justine has a thing for dogs, and they have a thing for her. She owns two, spoils them silly. She's been getting progressively worse, said Justine when I exited the main house with Sanders and Del Rio. We're going to have to take her to a vet. No vets, Camilla Bronson snapped. I know for a fact that Tom and Jennifer put a chip under her skin. They'll ask questions. So what? The dog's sick, Justine said firmly. She probably got into some bad meat and now she's suffering for it, Sanders said. Yes, just keep her out here so she doesn't dump or puke in the house, Terry Graves said. Justine set her eyes on the attorney, the publicist, and the producer in a way I'd seen before. She no longer liked the Harlow team. They were clients. She'd do the work, but she wouldn't like them. She stated flatly, This pup gets any sicker, I'm taking one of the Suburbans and going to... Trying to defuse the situation, I said, Tell me about the house staff. What about them? Sanders asked. I need to know their story. I just spent two hours with them, Jack, Justine said, then looked at Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Terry Graves. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anita Fontana, 34, the head housekeeper, had been with the Harlows for twelve years, ever since the actors bought the ranch. She appeared the most upset, kept looking at a picture of the family she had by her bed and weeping. She said she loved the Harlows, especially Miguel. The Harlows were demanding but fair, generous at times, surprisingly cheap at others, and somewhat aloof from their children. Aloof? Camilla Bronson cried. That goes nowhere. Do you understand? How couldn't they be aloof at some level? Justine shot back. Busy careers and philanthropic work chew up vast amounts of time. Jen and Tom are excellent parents, the publicist retorted. Anyone who says otherwise is either a fool or a liar. Then all three of them must be fools or liars, Justine replied. The cook, Maria Toro, agreed in large part with the housekeeper's take on their bosses. She'd been with the Harlows eight years, said Jennifer was always trying to keep Tom on a vegan diet, but that he loved meat. Jacinta Feliz, the maid, had been at the ranch two years before the furlough they'd been given during the Harlow sojourn in Vietnam. She said Malia suffered nightmares and was a lonely girl, Justine said. That's not... Camilla Bronson began. Terry Graves cut her off, said... Listen to the woman and quit trying to spin things. The publicist was indignant. I'm not spinning. Yes, you are, Camilla, and it's not helping, Sanders said. Go ahead, Miss Smith. The boy wets the bed regularly, Justine went on. Jin has several imaginary friends and believes her stuffed animals come to life at night. I said, what about the Harlows? When was the last time they were in contact? Justine replied that Anita said she'd been in touch with the Harlows several times in the last month, trying to coordinate their arrival with the house staffs. The original plan called for the three women to return to the ranch two days before the Harlows, but then, Anita said, she'd gotten a call from Cynthia Maines, a change of plans. The women were to return three days after the Harlows' return. First I've heard of that, Sanders said. Camilla Bronson threw up her hands. Which means what? Justine said, changing the arrival date makes it possible for the Harlows to disappear. That way, the caretaker is the only other person to deal with, which makes me think that Cynthia Maines is of interest to us, perhaps our insider. My God, Terry Graves protested. I can't believe that. Sanders shook his head. Cynthia was devoted to the Harlows. The publicist for once said nothing. I said, I think there's sufficient cause to bring in the FBI. That soured the Harlow team. Do you know the shitstorm you'll cause? Camilla Bronson demanded. For me or for you? Her jaw clamped shut, but she was staring bullets at me. I agree with Camilla, Terry Graves said. I do too, Sanders said. 
At this moment, there's insufficient evidence to bring in the FBI. Dave, you called us in, I began. I think the missing two hours and the dog's reaction are enough. I don't, and you work for us, and for the Harlows, Jack, the attorney said firmly. I, we, want private to find them. Yes, Camilla Bronson said, more sure of herself. We don't want this getting out unless it absolutely has to. Anything you need to do, you do, Jack, said Terry Graves. Just keep this quiet for a few days to see if they show up or we get a ransom note. In the meantime, you keep your people working. What's this about? I asked. Money? Damn right, the producer retorted. We have a lot riding on Saigon Falls. All of us have sacrificed for this project, and word of the Harlow's disappearance could cause the entire project to collapse, taking tens of millions of dollars and our futures with it. Sanders and Camilla Bronson nodded. I glanced at Justine, whose expression was hard. I could feel it, too. These three had some other angle on this that we weren't seeing. But they were paying, and I had to agree that other than the traumatized bulldog, there was no sign of violent struggle anywhere inside the compound. Except for the power and security system issues, they could have just walked away. Hell, for all we knew... Maybe Tom and Jennifer had screwed with the security system, wanting to disappear for one reason or another. Tom liked keeping secrets. It would not be entirely out of the question. I'll give you two days, I said. Three, Sanders said. Camilla Bronson said. Where are Anita, the others? In their quarters, Justine said. I'm getting them out of here, she said, turning. They're coming with me to L.A. I don't want any of them talking to anyone. My cell phone rang. I glanced at the caller ID, LAPD Chief Mickey Fesco. I squinted, trying to think of what my fair-weather friend might want this time. I flashed for a second on my brother, Tommy, who was being investigated in the murder of Clay Harris, a surveillance expert who once worked for me. I'd been in the next room when the shooting went down, heard the shots, but saw nothing. My brother told me it was self-defense. I'd left him at the crime scene to deal with his own mess. Had Tommy implicated me? It was all I could think of, unless Fesco had gotten wind of the Harlow's disappearance. I turned away from the others, walked off the veranda out onto the lawn beneath the live oaks. Mickey, I said, trying to sound even, nonchalant. Jack, how soon can you and Del Rio be in the mayor's office? What's going on? How long, Jack? I looked over at the helicopter parked on the Harlow's front lawn. Give me clearance to use the helipad? Done. Forty minutes, tops, I said. We'll be waiting, Fesco said. No clue, Mickey? Turn on the radio, Jack. Turn on the TV. It's on every goddamn station in L.A., and they don't know the half of it. Chapter 18 Well done, Mr. Hernandez. Cobb said to the killer as he stripped off the no-prisoner's disguise inside the rear of one of the white panel vans. Why didn't I take her? Hernandez grunted. Because by our letting her live, the terror will rise. It has a face now, a voice. Could have been her and the kid lying there and not talking, agreed Johnson, who was up front, driving them east toward the city of commerce. Could have been anyone, Hernandez said, humming again. People don't like change, gentlemen, Cobb observed. I don't care if you're a Taliban in East Jesus Stan or a mom in Litchfield, Connecticut. People like their routines, their habits. When you threaten their habits and routines, they get upset, lash out, and do all sorts of things they would not normally do. Like take sharp terms in a negotiation, Mr. Cobb? Johnson asked, grinning in the rearview mirror. That too, Mr. Johnson, Cobb agreed, allowing a rare smile that only deepened the lines of the spiderweb scar on the left side of his face. And now? Hernandez asked. Cobb's smile disappeared. We let Mr. Kelleher and Mr. Watson continue to execute their end of the plan, and we wait for contact. You sure they'll try now? Johnson asked. Dead sure, Cobb said. Worms just can't help themselves when they feel the soil all around them getting 
prickly and hot. Chapter 19 On a screen in the private office of the Honorable Diane Wills, Mayor of Los Angeles, the killer rose from a squatting position in front of Sheila Vicente, his back to the camera as he exited the pharmacy. In a voice oddly composed, given the traumatic experience she'd suffered not two and a half hours before, Sheila Vicente said, He was humming that old door song before he saw me in Enrique. He was humming it as he left. She shifted in her chair, started to weep. Mayor Wills went to console her while a handful of L.A.'s other high and mighty looked on. L.A. Police Chief Mickey Fesco, L.A. County Sheriff Lou Camerata, L.A. District Attorney Billy Blaze. Del Rio and I had come off the helicopter 20 minutes before. We'd flown down from Ojai with the Harlow's management team and the help, leaving Justine, Sai, and Mobot to continue the search, at least until dark. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out what their angle was. Calling us in on a missing persons case, then not taking our advice to bring in the FBI. But I had had little chance to think about that. The entire flight down, we'd watched the news coverage of the shootings at the pharmacy on La Cienega. Local news interviewed a teenager who'd been inside during the killings, shopping for nail polish. It was creepy, the teen said, beginning to choke. I never heard a thing until one of the clerks started screaming bloody murder, like cabin in the woods or something. But that and the body count was about all we knew until we got to the mayor's office, watched the raw footage of the killing spree, and heard Sheila Vicente describe the killer humming as he left. Peace, Frog, Del Rio said. That was the song? Vicente had composed herself again. She nodded at Del Rio. You know, blood in the streets. It's up to my ankles? Bloody red sun of fantastic L.A., Del Rio replied. You were supposed to give a message to the mayor, is that right? Chief Fesco said. Ruddy, coarse skin, early fifties. Fesco is as smart as any man I know. Also, one of the most cunning. He's a good cop. He's a better politician. Which was what had puzzled me about the killings. Why were we here? Why had Del Rio and I been allowed to see the raw footage? Yes, and only to the mayor, Vicente said, looking to Wills, a tall, formidable, red-haired woman who long ago played volleyball at UCLA and graduated first in her class at Stanford Law. What is it, dear? Mayor Wills asked. Sheila Vicente reached into her purse and, with trembling hands, drew out a baggie. I could see there was something inside it but couldn't tell much more. The assistant district attorney started to hand the baggie to the mayor, but Chief Fesco was quicker and blocked the transfer. Lay it on the desk, he said. No more fingerprints. He wore gloves, flesh-colored thin gloves, Vicente said. I crossed the room to the desk, saw the lime-green card in the baggie, and saw the printing, No Prisoners. Four yesterday, five today. He's on an escalating spree. Those were my first thoughts. I said, Captain Harry Thomas with the sheriff's homicide has a card just like this, taken in evidence at the Malibu beach killings last night. Sheriff Camerata scowled but said, That's true. Sheila Vicente said, Mayor, he told me to tell you that unless you comply with his demands, there will be no mercy after this. None. What demands? Mayor Will said. I haven't heard any demands. There was a silence for a beat, broken by Chief Fesco, who paled considerably before saying, I have, in letters yesterday and today, and then again on video, two hours ago. What? cried Blaze, the district attorney. And you told no one? demanded Sheriff Camerata. Fesco bristled. At first we thought it was just some nut job writing crazy letters. We had no word that you found that calling card at Malibu last night. Until the killings at the CVS, we had nothing to say the threats were real. What threats and what video? Del Rio asked. Fesco nodded to his assistant. The ones we got two hours ago. The assistant tapped an order into a laptop computer. YouTube appeared on the big screen. The featured video on the page was entitled, No Prisoners, Faces of War L.A. Play it, Fesco said. 
The slayings on the beach were ruthless, precise, and shot from the killer's perspective. The camera work seemed remarkably smooth, given the brutality of the action. The only parts of the killer you saw, however, were the gloves and the guns. After the last man fell dead, a warning appeared. If you do not comply, many more will die. No one is safe. No one. 125,000 hits, Del Rio said, tearing me from thoughts of being under the tarps the night before, looking at the burned bodies of the four men I'd just seen executed on video. Comply, the mayor said. Comply with what? Fesco paled again, swallowed, and said, He wants money to stop the killings. Lots of money. Chapter 20 Let me get this straight, Mayor Will said, sinking into her desk chair. He's killing people to extort the city? This explains it, Fesco said, nodding to his assistant again. YouTube disappeared replaced by high-res photographs of two typed letters. We got the letter on the left yesterday morning, the one on the right this morning, both through snail mail. I scanned the two letters, both talked about senseless killings that could easily be avoided, and suggested that failure to accede to the demands would result in mass terror and damage to the Los Angeles economy. After all, the letters read, who wants to be a tourist in Murder Central, USA? The first letter demanded a million dollars to prevent further killings. The second asked for two million and threatened that the price would rise again if no prisoners was not contacted by ten the following morning. The letters gave instructions for Fesco to initiate contact by posting a specific term, tribute, in an update on the LAPD's Facebook page. In turn, the chief would get information about where and how to transfer the money. The letters also warned that failure to make contact and payment within 24 hours would cause the daily death toll to increase by one. Using social media as one of the levers, Del Rio commented, you're dealing with someone young, educated, a planner. I nodded. And ex-military, I'd expect. Camarada, a former U.S. Army Ranger, snorted. Why? Just because he uses the handle no prisoners? He could have played football as in take no prisoners, or soccer for Christ's sake. Who is this amateur? I ignored the barb, said, Could very well be, Sheriff. That's just the way it feels to me. He nodded coldly. We pros don't go on feelings. Well, there you go, I replied. But honestly, I'm as confused as you are, Sheriff, as to why Rick and I were asked here. All eyes traveled to Chief Fesco, who cleared his throat. In my opinion, what we have here is the makings of a first-class career Armageddon, a worse spree killer than the DC sniper. How we handle this will pretty much determine our political fates, especially if the death count continues to rise. So what I'm about to suggest does not leave this room. Are we agreed? Slowly, reluctantly, all those gathered nodded, including me. I think Jack's right in his reaction, and so is Del Rio. And that's part of why I asked them to join us, Fesco began. This pay-to-stop-the-killing angle, I've never seen it before. And there's something about the way this is being done. Call it a feeling if you want, Lou. But this guy is not going to stop. He's highly trained, and he's going to kill until we either catch him or we buckle and pay him off. We are not buckling. Mayor Will said emphatically. The city of Los Angeles will not be paying any murderous extortionist on my watch. Exactly my thoughts, Your Honor, the chief replied with a slow bow of his head. I never for a moment considered advising you to pay. But we are faced with a double-edged sword. If we don't pay, we must ask ourselves whether we are also dooming six innocent people to die tomorrow. You don't know that, Sheriff Camerata snapped. You want to take the chance? Fesco shot back, reddening. No, the mayor said. What are you suggesting, Mickey? Fesco took a breath, glanced at me. We could call in the FBI and their profilers and let them take control of this, but then the extortion campaign would leak everywhere. Any way you look at it, a PR nightmare for us. I sense an ore coming, 
Mayor Will said. Or we can bring in private on a hush-hush basis, as, say, consultants. Why in God's name would we do that? Sheriff Camarada demanded. I was wondering the same thing, and I could tell Del Rio was, too. Because they're not tied to the goddamn Constitution, Fesco said. They can simply do things we can't, legally. They can take risks that we can't. You mean they can cut corners and break laws? The mayor said coldly. I didn't say that, Your Honor, Fesco soothed. But consider that six lives are at stake tomorrow, and seven the day after that. Wouldn't you cut a few corners to save those lives? I held up both hands. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where am I legally here? Where's private? My firm isn't going to do your dirty work and then have you turn around and slap us with some Bill of Rights violation. That won't happen, Fesco said. How are you going to ensure that? I demanded. The mayor is going to grant you blanket immunity beforehand, Jack. And the district attorney is going to sign the guarantee of that. And so are the state's attorney general and the governor. Chapter 21 In the garage in the City of Commerce, Watson clapped, pointed at the iPad in front of him, and roared. There she blows! Tribute on the LAPD Facebook page! Cobb set down a cup of hot coffee and hurried to see. There it was. Tribute to the Fallen at CVS. You were right on the money, Mr. Cobb, Johnson said admiringly. Cobb glanced at his watch. It was 8.30 in the evening. An hour before I'd predicted, but we'll take it. He turned to Kelleher, said, Your ball from here. The big man smoothed his red beard and began typing on his keyboard. Use the new Delhi and Panama crisscrosses, Watson said. Kelleher's left eye screwed up. Who taught you about the new Delhi and Panama crisscrosses? Just saying, Watson said. No chance they're paying us two million tomorrow, Nickerson said. Of course not, Cobb agreed. They'll try some sort of scam. Why? Watson muttered. Because the whole world's a scam, Mr. Cobb. Damn right it is. Cobb said, feeling in the groove of a familiar rant. Everybody's in a scam or being worked by a scammer. Look at Wall Street. Scam. Medicine? Scam. Politics? Scam. Religion? Bigger scam. Military? Biggest scam, said Hernandez and Johnson in unison. Plunderers, Nickerson said. Cobb cracked his knuckles, gestured with his scarred chin to Kelleher. Time to work them a little harder now. Turn up the voltage. Chapter 22 I got back to my house around ten. I'd been up for forty-two straight hours, running on fumes, desperately in need of rest. The following day was shaping up to be a brute, and I wanted to have my wits about me, rather than stumbling around foggy, maybe making a mistake that might cost six innocent people their lives. Justine called while I was brushing my teeth after a well-deserved shower. I just got home, she said. Join the club, I said, and yawned. What was the emergency meeting about? Can't talk about it. Anything new up at the Harlows? Not at the ranch, no. Or at least nothing until Cy and Mobot can run tests on the samples they brought back. I don't like Sanders and the other two. I could tell. They're playing us somehow. In the background, I could hear dogs barking. How's the bulldog? Better, Justine said, settling in. You took her with you? You think I was going to let the dog be taken hostage by Camilla Bronson and locked in some hideaway along with the Harlow's help? Locked. That's a little strong. Is it? I knew better than to argue any further. Listen, I've got to sleep. One more thing, she said. When I went online, I saw a story the AP picked up from a newspaper in Guadalajara. I rubbed my head, which was pounding. Okay. It says that Tom and Jennifer Harlow were spotted stumbling around one of the more notorious sections of that city last night, she said. Witnesses claimed they looked past the point of drunkenness. Guadalajara? Yes. I rubbed my temples. 
Looks like you're going to Mexico in the morning. Take Cruz with you. But the dogs, she began. A beep sounded. Call waiting. I looked, closed my eyes, and swore my head was being split in two. My dear brother Tommy was calling. You're one of the most competent people I know, I said to Justine. Figure it out. Get to Guadalajara. Find the Harlows. I hit answer, said, Tommy? <laughs> Tommy said, laughed. He'd been drinking. My brother always laughs with a, <laughs> when he's been drinking, another shitty trait Junior picked up from our late father. Didn't think you were going to answer there, bro, he said. Long time no see. What do you want? We hadn't spoken in months, certainly not since Clay Harris died. My mouthpiece called a couple of hours ago, Tommy said. That son of a bitch Billy Blaze is indicting me. I flashed on District Attorney Blaze during the meeting in the mayor's office. He hadn't said a word to me about my brother. But then, why would he? Tommy kept grumbling drunkenly. Fucking murder one on circumstantial evidence? Can you believe that, Jack? They got no gun, no forensic evidence. Other than the fact that you were picked up drunk and driving the dead man's car. No powder blast on my coat or hands, Tommy said. You've always been clever, I replied. But anyway, sorry to hear you're going to trial. I'm beat up tired, heading to bed. Heh, <laughs> Tommy said, laughed with more bitterness. My liar says Billy Blaze will be there for the arraignment. Up for re-election next month, you know. Tommy, I began before my brother's voice changed, became arch and knowing. I get to speak, Jack, he said. Did you know that? At the arraignment? I have the right to speak my piece, even against the advice of counsel and all. You should be there to hear what I have to say, brother. You really, really should. And then the line clicked dead. A few minutes later, I lay in bed in the darkness, thinking, what is there to stop Tommy from bringing me down with him, implicating me in a murder I was in no way part of? Just to see me fall into the void after him? Just to see me ruined at last? Nothing, I thought as I plunged into sleep. Nothing at all. Chapter 23 At five minutes to six the next morning, Justine sipped the last of her espresso and then groaned as she got out of her car and shuffled across the street toward the CrossFit box. She'd had barely four hours sleep. Stella, the Harlow's bulldog, had whimpered until Justine had let her up on the bed. The dog had proceeded to snore and fart all night long. But she really is a sweetheart, Justine thought as she entered the gym. What had happened to frighten her so badly? What had happened to the... Justine! Hi! Justine startled and looked over to see Paul, the guy with the nice smile, nice eyes, and no wedding ring. He was stretching his hip flexors against the wall. Hi, she said, realizing that she must look like hell. She hadn't even had time to run a brush through her hair before she'd run out the door. But Paul didn't seem to mind. He just grinned, said, Trying to keep up with you yesterday put me in a coma at work. She flashed to the grueling workout they'd endured the day before. Sorry, she said, moving to get a jump rope to warm up. What do you do? I teach English. UCLA? she asked. It was the closest university she could think of. No, Paul said, his face falling slightly. Bonaventure. Charter school. Justine felt like she'd slighted him somehow. Instead of starting to skip rope, she said, Teaching is a noble calling, a way to change lives. Paul brightened again. I like to think so. My students, they're everything. That's really nice, Justine said, smiling as she started skipping. You make a difference. I like to think so, he said. What do you? Before he could finish, the coach called the class into the group warm-up, three rounds of Russian kettlebell swings, lunges, and inchworm push-ups. Ten minutes later, sweating, feeling her muscles burning to life, Justine prepared to start the actual workout, a twenty-minute AMRAP or as many rounds as possible in 20 minutes, of five handstand push-ups, 
ten wall balls and fifteen box jumps. Handstand push-ups? Paul moaned. Is that even possible? Took me five months, Justine said, kneeling on the floor, getting ready to kip herself up against the wall. You're bionic, Paul said, and moved off to another part of the gym. Justine watched him go, thinking how nice it was that he really seemed to love his job, saw it as a calling. It was rare these days to meet a guy who wasn't chasing money or power or whatever. A guy who... Go! She threw her feet overhead, balanced against the wall, and started to grind out the workout. One little sister, four more now. When it was over, she'd done twelve rounds in the allotted twenty minutes. Not the best in the gym, but a perfectly respectable showing given the lack of sleep. She peeled herself off the floor as Paul staggered up and said, This is bad. I'm supposed to give a lecture on Moby Dick in my AP class, and I feel like the harpooned whale. Justine laughed. It was an absurd line, but she liked it. A funny guy, too. So, Paul said, that guy who picked you up yesterday, Justine hesitated, then said, my boss. Oh, Paul said, looking relieved. What do you do? As a rule, Justine didn't like talking about what she did, especially with single men. When they found out she worked for private, many of them were intimidated. One guy had recently told her he couldn't date a woman who was capable of discovering his deepest secrets. Actuarial, she said. Boring. Sounds fascinating, actually, Paul said, glanced at his watch. Feel like grabbing a cup of coffee before work? It's only seven. For a second, Justine was tempted, but then she shook her head. Can't, sorry. I have to be on a flight to Mexico at eight. For actuarial work? As a matter of fact, Justine said. Rain check? You bet, he said, beaming. I'd like that. Good, Justine said, and left. She ran across to her car, thinking that maybe the romantic part of her life was not such a mess after all. She had opportunities on the horizon. Chapter 24 I don't think I moved a muscle all night. I opened my eyes around 7.30, rolled over, and put a pillow over my head to block out the sunlight. Dozing dreams are the most real, don't you think? I do. On the edge of consciousness, my mind conjured a scene from my childhood. I lay on the grass, screaming in agony while Tommy laughed because I'd broken my wrist trying to skateboard as well as he did. I played college football, but that had more to do with my tenacity. My brother was always the gifted one athletically. My dreams mutated, and I found myself lost in some kind of Rube Goldberg contraption populated by the people who had gathered in the mayor's office in response to the no-prisoners killings. Find him, Jack, Mayor Will said, sounding like the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland. Stop him. By any means necessary, Chief Fesco said. We'll work with and parallel to you said District Attorney Billy Blaze, who strangely wore a button with Tommy's ten-year-old face on it. But we don't want to know a thing about your tactics, added Sheriff Camerata. Are we clear on that, Morgan? In my dreams, it had all seemed perfectly clear. Find and capture no prisoners, then turn him over. Private's role a complete secret to everyone but a select inner circle. But when my cell rang, waking me up for good, things quickly became murkier. I don't like this, Jack, said Del Rio by way of hello. I've been up half the night because I feel like we're being set up to take a fall somehow. They're granting us blanket immunity in advance. I'm supposed to see a copy of the document by nine. What do they expect us to do that they can't? I'm not sure they know, I admitted. Whatever it takes to get no prisoners behind bars. They should be forming a task force or something. Put a hundred men on it. Bring in Cal Justice investigators. Bring in the FBI. City, county, and state are all cash-strapped. I guess they see private as the cheaper alternative. And they don't want to cede authority to the Bureau. I still don't like it. I don't either, but I gave my word. Said we'd do it. Silence. Another call came in. Mobot. 
I told Del Rio I'd call him the minute I heard anything from Chief Fesco, hit accept, said, Maureen. Cynthia Maines just showed up in our lobby, Mobot said. She's demanding to know why we've been calling her cell phone nonstop and screwing up the first vacation she's had with her boyfriend in almost a year. Chapter 25 at twenty-eight and five foot four, in a pale gray dress with pearls and black pumps, Cynthia Maines was a hyper, articulate, and forceful woman who'd attended the University of Southern California's famous film school and been hired almost immediately upon graduation as the Harlow's personal assistant and, eventually, co-producer. So, you must have been intimately involved in the details of Saigon Falls, I said early in the conversation setting a steaming coffee cup before her. She and I and Mobot were in my office. Is this why you've been calling me? Maines asked in disbelief. Look, I had a firm deal with Jen and Tom. I was to get three full weeks off, and it's only been like four days, and they've got you calling me nonstop? I'd like to know what's going on. I've tried their cells, the ranch, and the apartment lines, and no answer. Because they've disappeared. I said. Her head snapped back as if she'd been popped in the nose. What? They're gone, I said. Somewhere between the hours of 6 and 8 p.m. three days ago, all of them disappeared except the dog, who we found terrorized in the help's quarters. Where have you been the last few days? Maines seemed more than dazed, suddenly lost, groping to find her way through what I was telling her. Mammoth Lakes she said in a dull voice. I was up there with Philip, my boyfriend. We rented a house and... What are the police telling you? Why isn't it all over the news? Facebook? Because no one knows, outside of the help, Private, and Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Terry Graves, all of whom hired us to find you and the Harlows. Maine stared off for several seconds, then looked at us. This is for real? I'm not being punked here? It's for real. Mobot said. Got any idea where they might be? I know where they were supposed to be, she replied. They'd scheduled six days at home alone on the ranch. They wanted family time, and Tom was going to begin editing everything shot in Vietnam. Jennifer was going to work the logistics of the last scenes to be filmed at Warner in a couple of weeks. That doesn't answer my question, I said. I don't know, she insisted. They could be anywhere. Where's the jet? In its hangar at Burbank, Mobot replied. Maines shook her head. Then I have no idea. They could be anywhere. But that's not really true. I mean, someone would see them. Exactly, I replied. There is someone who claims to have seen Jennifer and Tom in Mexico the day before yesterday, very, very drunk. She shook her head again. They don't drink. They made that pact when they got married. Neither of them has had a drop in fifteen years. Okay, I said. Any reason for them to be in Guadalajara, drunk or not? The Harlow's personal assistant sat there a long moment, blinking, then slowly rocked her chin right and slightly up before twisting it sharply left. No idea. No business concerns there? Mobot asked. No plans for an orphanage? Not that I can remember. You could check with Camilla. She handles the schedule when it comes to sharing hands projects. You don't have working knowledge of the Foundation? I asked. She shook her head. Camilla and Sanders took most of that load. My involvement was limited to arranging up-to-the-minute itineraries for visits, photo shoots, that kind of thing. Why haven't the police or the FBI been notified? I shrugged. The three amigos asked us to keep it quiet to wait and see if your employers turned up or if we heard from any kidnappers. I told him I'd wait until tomorrow, latest, before contacting the FBI. Well, Maines huffed and made to get out of her seat. I'm not waiting. I'm going to... Before you do anything, could you answer a few more of my questions? I asked. Like what? She said impatiently. Oh, I don't know. Like... Do you stand to benefit personally in any way from the Harlow's vanishing? Chapter 26 
Mainz's manicured fingers rolled to form fists, and her words came out hot. There is absolutely no benefit to me. What are you, crazy? What possible benefit could there be to me in that situation? Look, I hitched my wagon to Tom and Jen six years ago when I had a lot of other compelling offers. It's been the best experience of my life, she went on. Demanding and maniacal at times, but magical more often than not, and fulfilling and lucrative. In no way whatsoever would I jeopardize that. No way. Ever. I believed her. Had to ask. Any more questions? She asked coldly. As a matter of fact. What if I don't wish to answer? I mean, it's not like you're cops. Mobot said. We both have the same goal, Cynthia. To find the Harlows and find them alive, right? I mean, the more people working, the better, no matter who's paying the bill. Harlow Quinn Productions or Uncle Sam? Mains remained stiff, but nodded. What do you want to know? Give me thumbnails on Sanders, Bronson, and Terry Graves and their relationships with the Harlows. Mains thought about that. Dave's a typical attorney agent, all business, with almost all his business coming from the Harlows, she said. Camilla's a bitch, but very good at what she does. She and Jen are friends. They enjoy plotting. Graves? I like Terry, Maine said. He's also very good at what he does, which allows Jen and Tom to do what they do best. Be creative. No beeps between any of them and the Harlows? I asked. She shrugged. No more than the normal give and take. Their wagons are hitched to the Harlows, too. Why would they upset the golden cart? Tell us about life with the Harlows leading up to their arrival back in the States, Mobot said. Over the course of the next twenty minutes, Maines went on to describe the Harlows' whirlwind existence in the last year and what it took for her to help steer their personal and professional lives. She worked for them but considered Tom and Jennifer friends people she admired and trusted. The time spent in Vietnam had been exhausting but exhilarating, and she'd been stunned at the breadth and depth of the saga the Harlows were depicting in Saigon Falls. It was like every day you knew something brilliant was being created, she said. I felt like it was an honor to work on such a project. Sanders and the Harlows were about out of money when they got home, I said. Personal assets were going to have to be sold. That seemed to puzzle Mains. Is that true? If it is, that's the first I've heard of it. Sanders said he told the Harlows about the situation shortly after they arrived back in the United States. Well, there you go, Mains said. I left as soon as I got off the plane. My boyfriend was there at the jet port waiting, and I was in no mood to stick around. So you didn't accompany them to the ranch? I did not she said. I was done once I got off the plane, and everyone knew it. Things had been intense for so long, I needed to breathe. I still do. Did Tom talk about a mysterious new investor in the film? I asked. She half laughed. There are always mysterious new investors on the horizon. That's one of Tom's lines. What about their sex life? Mobot asked. The assistant reddened. I... I'm their personal assistant, but I'm not privy to their life behind closed doors. I said, there were lots of sex toys in their closets. Mains reddened again, looked at her lap. Look, that's way outside my pay grade. All I know is that Tom and Jennifer were devoted to each other and to their children, and that they led an exemplary life. And I've had just about enough of this. I'm going to the FBI. Get them involved. I think it's a good idea, but I don't know what standing you'll have, I said as she got to her feet. Legally, I mean. You're not family. She hesitated, glanced at the door. So what should I do? Let me make the call first, I said. I'll tell the FBI what we know. Try to work with them from here on out. You can call afterwards. Back me up with your concerns. Mains nodded, put a card on my desk, took mine. Then she thumped a finger on the edge of the desk, said, Remember that movie, All the President's Men, about Watergate? That guy kept saying, follow the money. It's always about the money, isn't it? Point taken, I said. Definitely point taken. 
Chapter 27 Twenty minutes later, I was looking at copies of Cynthia Maines's financials, courtesy of Psy. Maines receives a base salary of 400 k a year, Kloppenberg said. But she is underwater on six different investments she made before the crash, three of them in Vegas real estate. Her cash flow is strong, but she's got no savings to speak of. I describe her lifestyle as self-indulgent and her investment philosophy as incoherent. Other than a total lack of use of credit or debit cards over the last four days, Maines has a long and wide history of extravagant purchases, luxury goods, rob report baubles. No bangles? I asked. Plenty of those, too, Sai said. Tiffany's most recently. What else? I asked. I think she was lying about the Harlow's sex life, Mobot said. Either that or she's a prude, I said. But what are the chances of that in Hollywood? Mobot asked. And there was another thing she was being evasive about. What's that? I asked. Guadalajara, Mobot said. I got the impression that she was conflicted, less than forthright. I thought back and felt she was right. Good thing Justine and Cruz are on their way there right now. Sai frowned. They took the jet? Yeah, so? I asked. I never get to take the jet, Kloppenberg said, openly pouting. Report it to a human rights commission, I said. And I want this same sort of report drawn up on Sanders, Bronson, and Graves. Give us a couple of hours, Mobot said. My cell phone rang. Mickey Fesco. Chief, I said. Get down to the Huntington Pier ASAP, Fesco said. I want you and Del Rio to see what we're up against. Chapter 28 Wearing black polarized sunglasses despite the iron-gray sky, a floppy olive drab fishing hat, flip-flops, shorts, and a t-shirt that read, Bass Pro Shops. Nickerson picked up a bait bucket, salt water rod, and tackle box, and shuffled out onto the Huntington Beach Pier, where a breeze was building. With the possible exception of the earbuds he wore and the fiber-optic camera hidden among the various lures stuck along the band of his hat, Nickerson looked no different from thirty or forty other men trying their fishing luck out on the pier. At its far end, more than a quarter mile out into the Pacific, the pier widened into a large diamond shape, dominated by a red-roofed diner called Ruby's. Nickerson skirted left of the diner and took up a position along the rail where he could monitor the pier's west end. That'll do, Cobb said in Nickerson's ear. How long you figure, Nickerson muttered as he squatted over his tackle box and bait bucket. Any time now, Cobb said. Get to work while you can. Nickerson settled in like a man certain of his craft, which he was. He removed lures that looked like pale gray six-inch squid with trailing tentacles. When he was positive no one was watching, he reached through the lower rails of the pier and pressed the lures up against a steel girder. The hooks had been magnetized, and soon the lures, six of them in all, were tucked up under the flange of the walkway. They were very close to the color of the girders and visible only from the sea, which meant only by surfers, lifeguards, or shore patrol, and only if they were studying the girders carefully with binoculars. After rigging up a real lure and dropping his line over the side, Nickerson braced his pole, then crouched over his tackle box. This time he picked up what appeared to be a lead weight painted dull gray. It was about the size and shape of a matchbook as thick as a cell phone. Hoops like the eyes of fish hooks stuck out at either end of the weight. He used brass snaps to attach steel leaders to each eye. He got two large fish hooks from the tackle box and fixed them to the unattached end of each steel leader. Mr. Hernandez just spotted Fesco coming onto the pier, Cobb said. He alone? Nickerson asked, glancing around. An old Vietnamese guy stood at the rail about twenty feet to his left, jigging his pole, looking down into the sea. To his right, some fifteen feet, a dad and young son rigged poles. So far as I can tell. The old Vietnamese guy gave a cry. Nickerson's attention shot to him. The second he realized the old man's pole was bent hard,
he swiveled his back to the windows of Ruby's diner and faced the sea, knowing that all eyes would be on the fight and the catch. Nickerson twisted the hoops at either end of the metal weight, one toward him, one away. Then he stuck the entire rig under the railing, pressing the hooks into the plastic bellies of the two squid lures, thus completing a circuit. He stood up immediately and turned to see the old angler bring up a stout bottom fish, a fantail sole that wriggled and flapped, provoking murmurs and soft cries of appreciation from the other fishermen. Nice fish, Nickerson said. Good eating, this one, the old man said, grinning. His teeth were brown. Nickerson nodded, but behind the polarized lenses, he was watching Chief Fesco moving toward the westernmost tip of the pier and two men he hadn't noticed before, one rangy and good-looking, the other shorter, stockier. Fesco's got friends, Nickerson murmured, and adjusted his hat so the camera better faced the trio. I see them, Cobb said. Watson said, Hold still for a capture. Nickerson froze, stopped breathing for a count of four. Got them, Watson said. You done, Mr. Nickerson? Cobb said. I am, Nickerson said. You should be picking up a signal. Silence. Then, that's an affirmative, Cobb said. Leave them to their scamming. Move your fishing gear in toward shore. Fish for an hour. Chat with a few of the locals. Then get the hell out of there. On it. Nickerson said, and got his pole, tackle box, and bait bucket, only once glancing over toward Fesco and the two men with him, all of whom were looking westward toward the breaking waves. Serves them right, Nickerson thought. Like Mr. Cobb always says, this is what you get for scamming. Chapter 29 The pickup's gonna be here nine tonight, Chief Fesco said as the breeze stiffened throwing his hair into his eyes. Here, I said, squinting at the wind, glancing around at the diner and the deck that surrounded it. Why would he do that? He'll be cornered out here. No, we drop the money, it lands in the water, in the darkness. Del Rio cast a jaundiced eye toward the waves and the surfers and kiteboarders plying the water below us. He said, Still a tough pickup. No prisoners has got to be thinking police boats, helicopters, scuba. The chief stiffened. He is thinking that and more. His letter says any sign of a police presence beyond me making the drop, and six civilians die. We're not cops, Del Rio said. Fesco breathed a sigh of relief. Exactly my thinking, and the mayor's. You're not cops, so your presence is safer, in effect. I squinted at him, then down at the waves crashing off the pier's stanchions far below me. So what's our goal? Hunt the bastard, Jack, Fesco said. Set up an ambush. Capture him. Turn him over to us. I thought it through for several beats. So he claims that any sign of a police presence, he's a no-show and kills six, correct? That's the threat, Fesco agreed. There's more than one guy, then, I said. Del Rio understood. He's got a watcher, or he's the watcher, and someone else is making the pickup. That's how it looks to me, I said, which makes the situation more complicated, more demanding. But doable? Fesco asked. Yes, I said. Terms? The immunity document's on its way, Fesco said. And the mayor's offering you three hundred grand in exchange for no prisoner's capture, or... I raised my eyebrow when his voice trailed off. You're suggesting... I'm suggesting nothing, Fesco said, flustered. You're covered in any case, Jack. We simply can't afford to have some lunatic or group of lunatics killing increasing numbers of people in Los Angeles every day. He, they, must be stopped. Tonight. Looking to Del Rio, I said, What do you think? You already know what I think, Del Rio said. He gestured over the rail. Long fall from here, Jack. Still, the situation intrigued me. My mind was already coming up with possible ways we could set and spring the trap without triggering more murders. Okay, I said at last. We're in. But we're going to need every bit of support you can give us, no matter what we ask for, Mickey. Done, 
he said. Whatever you need, Jack. Chapter 30 Private's jet, a Gulfstream G-550, began its descent into Guadalajara around 11.30 that morning. It had taken Justine and Emilio Cruz just shy of three hours and twenty minutes to make the journey. Twenty-nine, with a dark, sleek ponytail and a clean-shaven face, Cruz was a former California Golden Gloves middleweight champion and special investigator with the State's Department of Justice. He'd joined private two years prior and had proved an exceptional detective. Justine felt as if she couldn't have had any better partner on this trip. She spoke Spanish well, but not fluently. Cruz was fluent. More, he was the kind of guy who saw things that others did not. In some ways, he was almost as good at spotting clues and irregularities as Jack was. Indeed, for the past ten minutes, Jack had been the subject of conversation, as he often was when two or more members of Private were together out of their boss's presence. I know you got problems with him, but the dude's inspiring. All there is to it, Cruz said. Jack gets his teeth into something, never lets go. True, Justine said. It's his greatest gift. But he's got all these walls up around him, never letting you know exactly what he's feeling. What's with that? Justine was trained as a psychologist, and Jack's unwillingness to reveal his inner emotions had played a critical role in the end of their short-lived, intimate relationship. She figured Cruz, as a male, might shed light on this aspect of Jack's personality. But Cruz shifted uncomfortably, said, Follow the Dodgers much? Rarely, and only when it's necessary. Right, which is exactly how I am with all this inner naval stuff, Cruz said. I know you're brilliant at what you do, and I'm not criticizing your profession. Well, maybe a little. But after a while, you know, I find it better to face in one direction, in front of you. Just let the past lay and get on with it, right? But some people don't know how to get on with it, Justine protested. Like a lot of Dodgers fans, Cruz said. Before she could reply, the pilot came on, told them to bring their seats upright for landing. Inside the terminal, an immigration officer noted they'd arrived on a jet owned by private. That's right, Cruz said. We're here to look for several missing persons. Who are these peoples? The officer asked. We're not free to say, Justine said. It's confusing. We don't even really know if they are missing just that we got a report that two of them were seen here in Guadalajara recently. The officer had stared at them stone-faced for several moments, and then asked, How long you stay? Long as it takes to convince ourselves whether they're here or not. How many peoples are missing? Five, Justine said. A family, Americans. And do you think they was kidnapped here? Or came here without telling anyone? We don't know, Justine said. We're here to try and find out. The officer gave them that stone-faced expression again, then stamped their passports and said, Enjoy your stay in Mexico, senor, senora. Chapter 31 After checking in, Justine and Cruz left the Hotel Francis in the city's Zona Central. The temperature hovered in the low 80s. The breeze smelled of simmering chicken, probably a mole. Justine thought. In the distance, she could hear music playing, brass horns. We should make contact with the local police, Cruz said. See if any reports were made regarding the Harlows. Why not go right to the horse's mouth, Justine replied. She'd changed into a light summer shift, blue and conservative, covering her knees. And whose mouth would that be? Cruz asked. Justine fished in her pocketbook, found her iPhone opened the notes app, said, Leona Casa Madre, the blogger who made the claim on her site. She never saw them personally, right? Cruz said. No, but she claimed to have interviewed two people who saw them. Drunk. That's what she wrote, Justine said. No, I meant her, the blogger, Cruz said. I looked her up as well. Two years ago, she got fired from La Prenza in Mexico City when her love of tequila overcame her ability to perform her job as one of the newspaper's court reporters. So she's hardly an unimpeachable source. We really should go to... No, Justine said, standing her ground. I have a gut feeling about this. I mean, 
If she can lead us to the people who actually saw the Harlows, it doesn't matter what her past is. Cruz hesitated, then said, Jack said you lead, I follow. I like that, Justine said. Figured you would. You have an address for her? As a matter of fact, Justine replied. A short cab ride later, they pulled up in front of an apartment building on the Rio Panico, east of Gonzalez Gallo Park. Number eight, Justine said, when Cruz went to the security phone by a locked steel front gate. He buzzed, got nothing. He buzzed again, nothing. A woman pushing two children in a stroller came to the gate. She opened it, looked at them suspiciously, spoke to Cruz in blisteringly fast Spanish. Cruz smiled, flashed his private badge, and replied. Justine got most of it. The woman had asked who they were looking for, and Cruz had given her the blogger's name, which the woman obviously recognized because her head lagged to one side in a gesture of, What are you going to do? Leona always sleeps in late, two, three in the afternoon, then up all night, that one, writing her book, she says, the woman said. She's up there. Just pound on her door. She'll hear you eventually. Maybe she'll even answer. Chapter 32 They found number eight on the second floor on the other side of a surprisingly well-tended garden where flowers were still blooming. Somewhere a cat was meowing, long and loud, as if in heat. Cruz knocked on the oak door. Senora Casa Madre, he called. Leona? After a minute of no response, Justine said, I think the lady said pounding was in order. Cruz shrugged, pounded with his fist, and they waited another minute. That should have woken the dead, he said in frustration. Maybe there's a back door, or a window or something. Justine was about to agree when something told her to try the doorknob. It twisted. She heard a click. The door sagged on its hinges and swung slightly inward. She pushed it open with her fingers, calling, Signora? The cat was louder now, and Justine realized it was inside the blogger's apartment. She took a step into the doorway, finding a room dimly lit by the sun sneaking through the slats of closed blinds, to reveal slices of a pack rat's nest. The apartment smelled of cat urine, rotting food, and the hint of things fouler. Newspapers, magazines, and books were stacked on every inch of every piece of furniture, save a simple, largely bare wooden desk, which displayed the greatest sense of order in the place. The cat meowed again, louder this time. Leona! Cruz called. Justine pointed beyond a kitchen that looked as if it hadn't been cleaned thoroughly in months. Dishes were stacked in the sink. There had to have been at least ten empty bottles of tequila, rotgut stuff, sitting amid other trash on the counters. The garbage reeked so badly she stopped breathing through her nose. It was the lair of an alcoholic, one well down the road in the disease, far beyond caring about personal hygiene. Justine had been in these kinds of hovels before as part of interventions by concerned relatives. She'd never had the heart to explain to them that this sort of existence pointed to little or no hope. Signora, she called, then continued in Spanish. We're with private investigations worldwide. We wanted to talk about the story you put up on your blog, about the Harlows. But there was no reply. Let's check the bedroom and get out of here, Cruz said. Place makes me want to take a shower. Make that several showers. Justine nodded, went to the hallway beyond the kitchen, turned on the light. The hallway had been turned into a pantry of sorts, with canned food, human and feline, stacked on shelves beside several full bottles of tequila. The bedroom was a shambles, clothes commingled with books and paper and trash, and Justine found herself wondering about the bizarre reaches of the human mind how it could drift into a realm where living in a garbage dump felt like the exact right thing to do. The cat meowed even more loudly, and then hissed as if it were facing off with a dog. The noises came from behind a closed door in the corner. Signora? Justine called, and knocked gently at the door. When she got no answer, she looked at Cruz, who nodded. She twisted the knob and pushed the door open. The cat, an orange tabby with mangy fur, 
leaped off a counter and blew by Justine before she could fully digest what she was seeing inside the bathroom. Leona Casa Madre was naked, bloated, sprawled between the toilet and the bath, a broken bottle of tequila beside her. Her head was turned toward the door as if she'd been listening for something or someone before she died. Whether or not she'd seen death come for her, or had talked to death, was unclear. Her eyes were gone, eaten out of their sockets. Her lips were chewed off as well. Now do you think we should contact the cops? Cruz asked. But Justine was rushing from the room, wanting to throw up everything she'd eaten in the last five days. Chapter 33 All rise, the bailiff cried at two that afternoon. The Honorable Sharon Greer presiding. Judge Greer, a handsome woman in her late forties, strode up onto the bench inside the Boucher Street Superior Courthouse, east of L.A.'s Chinatown. She sat, donned reading glasses, and asked her clerk, How many more? Ten, Your Honor, the clerk replied. Let's move. The judge stopped her order in midstream, spotting the district attorney as he entered. Mr. Blaze, she said, cocking her head. A surprise to find you in my courtroom? I didn't think you did arraignments anymore. It's an honor, Your Honor, Billy Blaze replied, running a hand down the front of his suit jacket as if to make sure it was buttoned correctly, swiveling his head, taking in the surprisingly empty courtroom and me. I'd feared a media horde for Tommy's arraignment. Billy Blaze acted like he longed for a media horde. But I imagine that almost every journalist in L.A. was working some angle of the no-prisoner shootings by now. In any case, the district attorney nodded stiffly at me, went through the swinging gates, set his briefcase on the state's table. A harried, mousy woman clutching a stack of manila files hurried after him, and I groaned. Alice Dunphy was defending Tommy? Dunphy was a public defender, and not the most organized person in the world. Then again, maybe she'd just been asked to rep him for arraignment. I prayed that was the case. If Dunphy planned to defend Tommy through the criminal phase, he might as well call ahead to San Quentin to reserve a cell. I noticed something else. Neither Tommy's wife Annie nor his nine-year-old son Ned was in the room. I had no time to consider what their absence meant, because a door behind the bailiff opened. A sheriff's deputy led my brother in. He'd surrendered himself earlier in the day and now wore an orange jumpsuit, wrist and ankle shackles. True to form, Tommy appeared not to care. As if he were wearing his latest suit from Hermes and had come to the room for a high-level meeting among equals. He spotted me, winked, then turned, sat, and began whispering to his attorney. The wink. I kept seeing it. Was this it? Was he going to implicate me in a killing that I absolutely had not committed? Clay Harris might have killed my ex-girlfriend, but I still suspected that Tommy was behind it somehow. And that would explain why he had gotten rid of Clay, to tie up any loose ends. Now he was trying to pin Clay's murder on me. Was my brother going to destroy me for spite? The State of California versus Thomas Morgan, Jr., the clerk announced. Alice Dunphy nudged Tommy. My brother stood, looking at ease, in control, unshaken by the gravity of the proceedings. Charge? the judge asked. Murder in the first degree, Billy Blaze said, paused for dramatic effect. Your Honor, the state plans to seek special circumstances in this case. Special circumstances? Blaze was seeking the death penalty for my brother. The charge and the potential penalty shook me. They seemed to mildly amuse Tommy, however, because he looked back over his shoulder at me and winked again, as if to say, Care to join me in the gas chamber, brother? Ms. Dunphy, the judge said. Before the public defender could speak, Tommy put his hand on her forearm. I'd like to speak on my own behalf, Your Honor. Only a fool acts as his own attorney, Mr. Morgan. Yes, Your Honor. Tommy said, turning on the Irish charm. I've been called a fool and worse many times before. Judge Greer sighed. Your choice, Mr. Morgan. How do you plead? Not guilty. Why doesn't that surprise me? The judge replied, 
then looked at the district attorney. Bail, Mr. Blaze? The state seeks remand, Billy Blaze said. Mr. Morgan is a flight risk. I'll surrender my passport, Tommy offered. And judge, just so you know, we, I, am going to mount a vigorous defense. I know who the real killer is. I have compelling evidence, overwhelming evidence, that the real killer is... His voice faded. The next moment was as long as any I have ever experienced. As long as the moment after a Taliban rocket hit the rotor of my helicopter in Afghanistan. My life, once again, hanging in the balance. Chapter 34 You're arresting us? Justine cried at Commandant Raul Gomez of the Jalisco State Police and Arturo Fox, the chief of municipal police in Guadalajara. Bizarrely, or at least it seemed so to Justine, the two high-level law enforcement officials had arrived at virtually the same time in the courtyard below Leona Casa Madre's apartment, roughly a half hour after Emilio Cruz had called the body in and not ten minutes after the first uniformed officers had arrived. The two men had gone cold, hard, and sardonic when Justine and Cruz presented their private badges and identifications. You are in this country conducting an investigation without declaring yourself to law enforcement, without working through proper channels? Commandant Gomez asked. He was a small, imperious man who delivered nearly everything he said in a scornful tone. We told immigration who we were, Cruz said. It is customary to notify the police, Commandant Gomez said. There's a body upstairs, Justine said. We thought you'd like to know. Yes, you did want us to know, Chief Fox replied. He tapped his temple with a thick finger. But I think the two of you are clever. I think you tell us this to cover your tracks. Fox was as big as Gomez was small, with a broad belly and cheek waddles that shook with indignation as he delivered the accusation. Gomez watched, flicking the nails of his index fingers against his thumb pads. Don't be a couple of corrupt jackasses trying to show off your penises to each other, Justine retorted. The woman's been dead at least a day or two. We only just arrived in Guadalajara. Check the facts. Look at the timestamp on our passports. Justine had moved to dig out her passport, but Chief Fox and Commandant Gomez seemed only to have heard her calling them corrupt jackasses trying to show off their penises, because that was when Justine and Cruz had been told to put their hands behind their backs and she demanded to know if they were under arrest. Of course you're under arrest, Gomez snarled. You broke into an apartment. You may have murdered someone. And have you not heard? In Mexico, we have Napoleonic law. Here you are guilty until proven innocent, and that has not a thing to do with jackasses or penises or corruption. Look, Cruz said, trying to remain calm. I'm sorry. She's sorry. We're here looking for five missing persons. We believed Senora Casa Madre might have some knowledge of their whereabouts. We found her dead. End of story. Yes, Chief Fox said, not buying it. Who is this missing people? Justine and Cruz exchanged glances. Then Cruz said, Tom and Jennifer Harlow, the actors, and their three children. At that, Gomez's head jerked back as if he'd sniffed something fouler than the decomposing body of Leona Casa Madre. But then Chief Fox chortled disdainfully. You really do think we are corrupt jackasses. Take them away, Commandant Gomez barked at one of the uniformed officers standing guard. We'll see if this story of much nonsense changes after a night in the cells. Chapter 35 Everyone in that courtroom was staring at my brother, including me and District Attorney Blaze, who filled the silence before Tommy could finish his thought and implicate someone else, probably me, in a cold-blooded killing. Objection, Your Honor, Billy Blaze shouted. This man can't just go around accusing people of murder, slandering them in a public venue without cause. If Mr. Morgan has such evidence, he should have brought it to my office, which he has not. Sustained, Judge Greer said, glanced at Tommy while my insides churned. Even from my angle, I could see that my brother was enraged that his 
little drama had been interrupted, and I half expected him to start shouting that I was to blame, that I had gotten him drunk, committed the murder myself, put Tommy in the victim's car, fled the scene, or some diabolical nonsense like that. Mr. Morgan, the judge went on, the matter is bail, not your counter-theory regarding the manner of Mr. Harris's death. I am not a flight risk, Judge, Tommy insisted. I have a business here, a wife, a son, and these charges are not true. I plan to fight. I plan to win. Greer hesitated, but only for a moment. Mr. Morgan, you are to surrender your passport to my bailiff, and your bail is set at five million dollars. She wrapped her gavel. Five million? That number sank in along with the general weakness I suddenly felt as the adrenaline that had seized my body began to ooze away. Tommy did not have five million. He was a recovering gambling addict. He didn't even have the five hundred grand he'd have to come up with to get a bondsman to cover his bail. But my brother looked unruffled at the figure, said, I can live with that. Judge Greer wrapped her gavel, looked at her clerk. Next... A sheriff's deputy came for Tommy, while a new inmate appeared from the door to the holding cells. Tommy looked at me, said, Help me, brother. I watched him disappear as if he'd gone overboard in the darkness, leaving me the only one capable of throwing him a lifeline. Morgan, Billy Blaze said in a harsh whisper and pointed toward the door. I startled, got up, and followed the D.A. into the outer hall, where in that same harsh whisper, Blaze demanded, Who's he gonna implicate? I have no idea. Tommy and I aren't close. He squinted. And yet you come to your brother's arraignment? Blood's thick, I replied coolly. Haven't you heard? Billy Blaze studied me. I think the chief and the mayor have grossly overestimated you, Morgan. Think whatever you want, Billy, I said. The district attorney clucked his disapproval and said, I'm watching you, Jack. Your brother's a killer. It wouldn't surprise me if you turn out to be one, too. As Billy Blaze walked off toward the elevators, I wasn't thinking about what he'd just said to me. I was wondering instead if the strange, tattered bond that still existed between my brother and me was strong enough to warrant my posting his bail on a murder charge that he might try to implicate me in as part of his defense. In all honesty, the thought of Tommy sitting in jail, stewing, forced to ponder a life behind bars or worse, a death by lethal injection, definitely had its appeal. But in the next moment, I thought of my late mother, who told us often that as toddlers we'd spoken our own language, and that the blood of twins was thicker than any other bond, and that by our shared DNA we were committed to each other for life. Enslaved to each other is more like it, I thought unsuccessfully fighting the idea that I could just walk away. Keep your enemies closer, wasn't that the old saying? In any case, it was the argument I relied on as I took the elevator to the clerk's office, where I planned to find out what I needed to do to post the bail and get my brother back where he belonged for the time being. At home with my sister-in-law and nephew, not sitting in a cell, resentful and plotting ways to destroy me. Or at least, that was how my illogic was evolving when the elevator doors opened. I went to the clerk's office, where a plump, cheerful woman at the front desk said, How can I help you, handsome? I smiled, saw her name tag, said, You made my day, Judy. Judy tittered. Just doing my job, sir. I pulled out a checkbook. I'm here to make bail for Thomas Morgan, Jr. Her face fell into confusion. Well... Someone's just done that. Shocked, I said. Who? Me, said an all-too-familiar voice. I looked to my left and saw an over-educated, impeccably dressed, and utterly ruthless gangster named Carmine Nochia, leaning against the counter, holding a blackberry. Chapter 36 Rick Del Rio was born into a family of hunters who lived in southern Arizona. His grandfather often took him out into the desert and taught him how to track deer, javelina, and quail. One of the most important things Del Rio learned from his grandfather was to move swiftly through country where there were no new tracks or old ones, 
and to slow to a crawl when he found fresh sign, as it usually indicated the animal was about to bed. Standing close to where Chief Fesco would drop the money at the far end of the pier, Del Rio felt like he was in his prey's bedroom somehow, but he couldn't understand exactly why it had intentionally cornered itself, or at least exposed itself so blatantly to capture. At the same time, there was no doubt in Del Rio's mind that the killer or killers felt comfortable, confident even, that a pickup of two million dollars could be made, as well as a daring escape. But were they actually going to have Fesco make the drop at the end of the pier, or did they plan to take him on some kind of long runaround like in those old Dirty Harry movies he loved so much? Since Jack had left for his brother's arraignment, Del Rio had walked all around the drop zone from above, studied it from the beach, both north and south aspects, imagining a boat, a jet ski, a scuba man. He realized that in a few hours, the underside of the pier would be black and shadowed. No prisoners might approach underwater, but someone smart enough would spot the bubble lines, right? But what about a rebreathing apparatus? And what about the issue of a watcher, someone looking for signs of police presence? Del Rio picked up his cell and hit a number he'd called almost an hour ago. Mentone, came the reply. Anything, kid? No one I can peg yet, said the kid. Del Rio then called Bud Rankin, a former LAPD cop Jack had hired the year before. Rankin was 62, a virtual chameleon, and an expert at surveillance. He was working the pier. Maybe they're not on site yet, said Rankin, who'd also come up with nothing. No way, Del Rio said. If it was me extorting that kind of money, I'd definitely have someone making damn sure the cops weren't all over the place. I'd best keep looking, then, Rankin said, and hung up. Del Rio's attention returned over the rail, down to the water, and the pickup spot. The ocean was turning grayer and white-capped. It could be dangerous to be down there, so close to the pier's pylons, if the wind really got roaring, but Del Rio couldn't see any other way to handle it. This time, he called Jack. Chapter 37 I felt my cell phone vibrate in my pocket, but ignored it. Every bit of me focused on Carmine Nochia, the way a mongoose might focus on a particularly mesmerizing cobra. In too many ways, Carmine was the epitome of the New Age mobster. He came from a long line of organized criminals, stretching back generations through Vegas to Chicago to New York to Palermo but he personally exhibited none of the old mob's more stereotypical traits, the D's and Doe's accent, the cultured attire of a diehard strip club fan, the spontaneous and ruthless acts of violence against all debtors and perceived traitors. Carmine had gone to Dartmouth, had done a stint in the Marines as a commissioned officer, mustered out as a captain, and had even attended Harvard Business School for a semester. He'd studied the ways of the elite and wore their fashions, manners, dialect, and affectations as an almost flawless persona. It's been a long time, Jack, Carmine said, his dark agate eyes betraying nothing, the muscles in his exfoliated cheeks betraying nothing. His hand reached for mine. Always a genuine pleasure. Why would you post bail for Tommy, Carmine? I asked, shaking his hand with zero enthusiasm. His grip firmed as he smiled. Tommy and I go way back, remember? I remember you wanting his legs and arms broken for welching on bets. You always buy into such dramatic nonsense, Jack, Carmine replied, releasing his grip and making a dismissive gesture. Be that as it may, regarding Tommy, stuff happens, and allegiances change when circumstances warrant it. That's the mark of a pragmatic leader, and I very much consider myself a pragmatic leader, able to deal with changing circumstances. I made every effort to show no reaction, but I got the subtext of his reply as if he'd tattooed it on my skin. Earlier that year, Carmine had used leverage that I resented to force me in private to track down a hijacked truck full of contraband prescription painkillers with a street value of $30 million. We found the oxycodone shipment, but used a remote third party to report its whereabouts to the local DEA office. They'd seized the stash before Carmine's men could get to it. I knew Carmine suspected me of a double-cross, 
but I also knew he had no proof of it, or at least that was what I believed. I'd regrettably come to know the mobster when Tommy was mainlining his gambling addiction and into Carmine for six large. I'd gone to Vegas and paid my brother's debt, doing it for the benefit of my long-suffering sister-in-law and nephew, not Tommy. I hadn't been free of Carmine since. And now he had coughed up Tommy's bail. Why? The mobster was all about leverage, so that was what this was, at some level. But designed to lift what? Or move whom? And for what reason? Revenge? Against me? You honestly think you're getting that bail money back? I asked. Carmine adjusted the French cuff of his custom shirt. The difference between you and me, Jack, is that I rarely bet unless I know what horse is going to win. Emotion plays no part in it. Anyway, I have to be going. Give Tommy a ride home. Great seeing you. Let's catch up real soon, shall we? Before I could reply, my cell phone vibrated again in my pocket, and Carmine moved by me as if I were now some stranger on the street. I checked caller ID, hit answer, and watched Carmine disappear toward the elevators. What do you know? I asked. Del Rio said, Come to the pier. I want to run my plan by you. I'm on my way. You might want to pick up a five-millimeter neoprene wetsuit with hood and booties on your way. I suppose a swim is unavoidable in this case. I'm hoping less of a swim and more of a skim, Jack. Chapter 38 Inside the garage in the City of Commerce, Cobb listened intently to Hernandez, who had been keeping track of one of the two men Chief Fesco had met with, the one who had remained behind, the one who had been all over the pier, studying it from every angle. He's not a cop, said Hernandez. At least he doesn't act like one. What's he acting like, then? Cobb demanded. Like a scout, Hernandez replied. He's making it damn tough for me to stay clean. And I think he's brought in a second guy, older, maybe sixty. He's been scanning the beaches and restaurants with views of the pier. And you're sure you haven't been made? One hundred percent, Hernandez said. The squid? Still in place. Police presence? Nothing beyond the ordinary patrols. Beach is quiet. Too quiet. It would be easier to stay hidden if it was hot and wall-to-wall -wall bodies. Fall back then, Mr. Hernandez. Thousand meters if you can. Straight away, Mr. Cobb, Hernandez said, clicked off. Scouts, thought Cobb. But before he could ponder that, Watson got up from his desk with an iPad in one hand. I've got positive ID on the two men on the pier with Fesco. The big guy with the surfer's build was Jack Morgan, owner of Private Investigations Worldwide, fastest-growing security firm in the world, cutting edge, and known to cut corners to achieve his objectives. The other one's Rick Del Rio, also works for Morgan. Both of them are Afghan vets, Marines. Watson handed Cobb the iPad. It's all there. Cobb scanned the documents pulled up on the screen, military records, evaluations, Various articles about Morgan and the company he'd inherited and reimagined after his father was convicted and sent behind bars. Chopper pilots, Cobb grunted, then gave a dismissive flick of his sinewy hand. Stellar safety records until they got shot down. Both have courage, tried to get back in the bird to save the other men. But neither man has any special forces training that I can see. Unless the training was obtained privately, Watson offered. That kind's no good. It's never tested in the crucible, Cobb said, handing the iPad back. We are tested in the crucible, Mr. Watson. Hard tested. They have no chance. We're twenty moves ahead of them in this game. Chapter 39 at a quarter to nine that evening, the wind was coming hard out of the northwest, gusting to twenty knots, churning the Pacific off the Huntington Beach Pier into a roiling, charcoal-colored beast that kept trying to rise up and snatch Del Rio and me. We hung from linemen's belts on opposing pylons, twelve feet above the crashing sea, and two pylon rows back from the western edge of the pier. Below us, two sea-dew water sleds strained and pitched at ropes that moored them to the pylons. The sea-dews were the fastest, nimblest sea-vessels money could buy. 
Del Rio had found them at a dealer a few miles from the pier. We'd launched them right at dusk and had been up on the pylons in the deep shadows ever since, wiping the spray from our goggles, peering out toward the electric halos of light shining down from the pier. No fishing lines dropped to the sea. The weather was just too rough. We counted down the minutes listening to the minimal chatter on the channel used by the law enforcement lurking at the perimeters of the operation. Two sheriff's helicopters were bucking the wind, moving in arcs two miles offshore, running with no lights, ready to respond. Two police helicopters were cruising at high altitude two miles inland. Three high-speed boats, two from the sheriff's detail at Marina del Rey and one from the county's Baywatch lifeguard unit, lurched in the swells about a mile out, ready to intercept any vessel trying to head to sea or run the coast. Chief's on his way, the kid said in my earpiece. He was posted on the roof of a building across Highway 1 from the pier entrance. Nothing within 500 yards, said Bud Rankin, who was up on top of Ruby's diner using an infrared scope to scan the surroundings. My right leg was starting to cramp when I heard the chief say, Almost to the diner. In my mind, I could see Fesco, head down into the wind, walking toward Rankin and Ruby's diner carrying two black dry bags, one on each shoulder. Chapter 40 Cobb wore a convincing fake beard, dark this time, to hide his scars. With the hood of his green rain jacket up, he left a pizza joint a mile north of the Huntington Beach Pier. For a moment, he was back in those desert mountains, hearing the children and women cry, hearing their husbands begging for mercy when pity was long dead and gone. What had they wanted from him? What had they expected? They expected us to die, Cobb thought coldly. They all expected us to die and crumble to dust. That thought turned to blazing anger. They abandoned us. They tried to bury us. Well, guess what? We're not dead, and we're taking what we're due. In a blind rage now, he punched in a number on a throwaway cell phone, said, You ready, Mr. Stern? We're going to rip this, Stern promised. We're counting on it, Cobb said. And tell Mr. Allen, go big or go home. We'll find someone else. Stern's voice cooled. You just make sure you hit the record button. Oh, we will, Cobb assured him. Twenty-five seconds. Synced, ready to launch. Cobb hung up, checked the time. It was 8.58. He punched in a second number, poised his thumb above send. We go big here, he thought, or we all go home the hardest way possible. Chapter 41 Chiefs by me, moving along the rail north side of Ruby's, said Bud Rankin in the earbud tucked beneath the hood of my wetsuit. It is 8.59 and 40 seconds. He's preparing to drop. I said nothing, just swept my attention out and along the perimeter of that electric halo of light, looking for an intruder. Bags are gone, Rankin said. I saw the bags fall. I saw them hit the churning water forty yards in front of me. The dry bags slapped and spun on the writhing ocean surface. My attention darted away, back along that perimeter of light. Anything, Chief? I asked. Fesco was supposed to remain on the rail, advise us of any effort to retrieve the dry bags from below the surface. That was going to be difficult in the extreme in any case. Inside the bags, Sai had placed two small pressurized CO2 tanks, hitched to a switch activated by a pressure gauge. Deeper than six feet, and the tanks would expel their charges, inflate the bags, and drag anyone holding them to the surface. If the pressure gauge trigger failed, Psy could activate the tanks by radio. Fesco cleared his throat, said, Not a goddamned. The explosion came without warning. A brilliant flash, crack, and roar that threw a ballooning plume of flame that witnesses later described as flat blue with a central core that burned as bright as mercury. Del Rio was on the pylon almost directly below the explosion. For a split instant, I saw my friend backlit, jerked, and bent backward against the waistband of his lineman's belt before the force of the blast struck and body-slammed me. 
The hit tore my feet from the pylon, caused my rope to lose purchase. I was aware of falling. Chapter 42 In retrospect, I was lucky to have dropped off the pylon and plunged into the Pacific. The cold water stung my face while currents and eddies swung me at the length of the lineman's rope. I fought to free myself, unclipped the carabiner that held the rope to the belt, kicked toward the surface. The pier lights were still on. Dark smoke boiled thick in the air to the south, billowing out toward the darkness. Police sirens were gathering from multiple directions. There was enough light for me to see Del Rio hanging from his belt twelve feet up the scorched pylon. Rick! I shouted. Del Rio rolled his head toward me. Burn, Jack! He grunted through the earbud. Back's broken, I think. Can't move my... Don't move anything! I screamed. Don't move at all! My instinct was to swim straight to him, to get him down and in the water. But I held on to my reeling sea sled and shouted into the microphone. Del Rio burned and injured on pylon below explosion. Probable spinal injury. Rankin, report. Do you see anyone coming from your position? Chief Fesco? But there was no answer. Only the soaring chatter of the L.A. sheriff, police, and fire departments being summoned to the scene. Then the kid came on, choked up. It's... Bud, Jack, I saw him thrown off the roof. I think he's... In my peripheral vision, I caught a large, swift, dark blur like some huge bird swooping out of the night just northwest of the pier. He rode a short, stubby black surfboard. He'd kicked his feet into bindings of some sort and was dressed much as I was, head to toe in a black wetsuit. But instead of a lineman's belt, he wore a full harness that connected him to a taut black sail about six feet by four that bellied out like a spinnaker in front of him. I figured he was traveling forty, maybe fifty miles an hour, some kind of kiteboarding genius. He knifed into the light surrounding the pier, spotted the dry bags, tacked hard toward them, leaned into his harness, and snatched the first bag up. He blew south into the smoke before I could utter a word. Pick up! I shouted at last, scrambling to get aboard the sea dew. I was straddling the sled, hitting the start, when the second kite boarder appeared from the northwest and snagged the second dry bag in a move as brilliant as the first rider's. The sea dew roared to life. I tugged a knife from a calf sheath, cut the mooring line, drifted, and then hit the throttle. In a split second, the sled gathered power, blew seawater through its turbine, and leaped from beneath the pylons like a bucking horse freed of a chute. Chapter 43 the sea dew launched off the first roller at an odd angle, which caused it to cant hard left and down, the turbine whining against the air. Throwing my weight the exact opposite way, I managed to level it before skipping up the face of the coming wave and out into the air again. I'd ridden a similar sled chasing the three sisters who'd gone on a killing spree at the London Olympics four months before, but then I'd been out on the Thames, a tidal river, not in this chaos of waves that surrounded the pier. The kiteboarders had danced across swells. I crashed through them past the pier, glancing at the scorched, smoking breach on its southern flank and the blown-out windows at Ruby's Diner. This is Morgan, I shouted. Two of them riding black kiteboards bearing southwest of the pier, in pursuit, need support. We are one minute out, Morgan, came the voice of one of the sheriff's helicopter pilots. Baywatch vessels converging on your position, came a second voice. Time of intercept, two minutes ten. Del Rio had had powerful search lamps mounted on the handlebars of the sea dew. I flipped them on the second I broke free of the halo of light surrounding the pier. Rick's back's broken, I thought, as I disappeared into the darkness. I'd called in Del Rio's condition and position, but there was nothing more I could do for him other than make sure the people behind the killings, the extortion, and now this bombing were made to pay. I kept the throttle wide open peering along the brilliant beam of light that shot almost a quarter mile out in front of me. Had they stayed on this same bearing, or had they tacked? And if they had tacked, were they heading inland or farther out to sea? Was there a boat waiting for them? A vehicle? Where? The beam picked up a shadow ahead of me in the waves. It was moving to my left, heading east for shore, about two hundred and fifty yards out. I arced after the shadow, found the waves at my back, and surfed down them so fast that it felt like flight.
At 150 yards, I caught one of the kite boarders fully in my beam, his back to me. He was cutting across the face of the swells. I could see the dry bag lashed there beside him on the board. He looked over his shoulder, back at my light, and for a second, I was sure he was going to draw a weapon and open fire. Instead, he tacked hard, came about, came right at me as fast as I was bearing down on him. It was a game of chicken I felt sure I'd win. The sea dew weighed more than 450 pounds. I doubted the board and kite weighed more than 30. I could hear intensifying chatter on the radio inside my wetsuit hood. There were fatalities back on the pier. I also could hear the choppers closing now. Their searchlights joined mine, throwing a near-blinding glare on the kite border, who never hesitated and never slowed. At thirty-five yards, I ducked down, preparing myself for impact. At twenty-five yards, a wave came between us. I lost him for a second. At ten yards, he reappeared, launched off the crest, soared up and over me at least three stories, dangling below the kite, as calm as a bird. Chapter 44 The move floored me. I'd seen kite boarders in action before, but this guy was a superstar. I downthrottled, drifted the sea to 180 degrees, and accelerated, following the beams of the helicopters playing on the border. He'd landed and was speeding out to sea. This is the L.A. Sheriff's Department, one of the pilots barked out of a loudspeaker. Drop your kite! The border never slowed, but I was gaining ground again. Fifty yards separated us when the other kite border appeared out of nowhere, launching from a wave to my left and tried to take my head off with the steel fin that jutted from the bottom of his board. I ducked and almost dumped the sled, but managed to keep it upright, right there on the verge of disaster. I'd had enough by that point, and I had immunity, so I tore open the shoulder holster, freed the Glock, and went back after the first border, mindful that the second might reappear at any moment. These people had caused mass death. I would not hesitate to shoot one of them, aim for the legs, break them down for capture. But then I remembered what else was in the dry bags. This is Morgan, I shouted. Tell Kloppenberg to blow the tanks. Repeat, tell Sy to blow the tanks. Before there was any response, the second kite boarder flew through the air and landed in front of me, skimmed up beside his partner, both heading straight up the face of the oncoming cresting wave, a ten-footer easy. I instantly realized I'd probably be thrown into a backflip if I stayed on their course and I cut the sled left where the shoulder of the wave wasn't breaking yet, watching the two kite boarders reach the crest. The helicopter search lamps were on them when they exploded off the wave and out into space, sailing on their kites, thirty, maybe forty feet in the air. Right at the apex of their flight, Psy triggered the CO2 tanks. They released with such force that the dry bags instantly inflated, straining against the cords that held them to the boards. The sudden change in aerodynamics threw both kite boarders out of control. The gusting wind caught the kites at the same time the dry bags burst, throwing a small amount of currency and a large amount of cut newspaper out into the sky like so much confetti. The boarders went flipping through the night, board over kite, somersaulting, until the blade wash of one of the helicopters caught and hurled them like rag dolls straight down, twenty feet, through the swirling paper bills. They crashed hard against the sea. I sped up, sure now that I was looking for bodies, injured or dead. I spotted the first one face down, partially covered by his kite. One of the Baywatch boats was on the scene now, heading for the other kite border. I grabbed mine by the back of his harness and yanked him up out of the water alongside the sea dew. He hung there a second, then started choking and hacking. After several moments, he looked up at me in a daze. What the fuck, dude? he moaned. Blowing us out of the sky was definitely not part of the script. Part 3 A Time for Trauma Chapter 45 At 10 o'clock that evening, 40 minutes after I'd pulled one of the kite boarders from the sea, county lifeguards and firefighters began to hoist the backboard and litter bearing Rick Del Rio up over the south railing of the Huntington Beach Pier, twenty yards east of where the bomb had detonated. The smoke was gone, doused by the rain and fire hoses, but a harsh, charred chemical stench 
hung in the air as investigators worked to cordon off the area and document the carnage the explosion had wrought. Media helicopters circled the pier, filming the aftermath for the eleven o'clock news. Six people were dead, including my surveillance specialist Bud Rankin, who'd been nearly decapitated by flying chunks of cement. The other five were an entire young family from Oxnard. The Deloitte's, husband, wife, and three kids under the age of ten. They'd been inside the diner at a table by the window, having ice cream sundaes. Another ten were injured, including Chief Mickey Fesco, who'd been briefly knocked unconscious and had suffered cheek and arm lacerations. But he'd refused to be taken to the hospital, and had just started toward me with a stone-faced Sheriff Lou Camarada when Del Rio's litter appeared at the railing. Morgan? Camarada growled at me. I held up a finger and went to Del Rio's side. His face was burned, contused. He was in a lot of pain, but alert. He focused on me immediately. You good? I asked, feeling the enormity of the moment now. Del Rio was more a brother to me than my own brother. We'd been through hell together many times and had always survived and recovered. But he'd had a feeling about this gig. He'd tried to stop me from taking it on. The idea that now he might be paralyzed was almost more than I could take. He shook his head stoically. Nothing from the waist down, Jack. I felt my stomach drop forty stories. Nothing yet, I said. Stay positive. Kind of hard when you've been on the wrong end of a yo-yo, he replied. You get them? Yes and no. I'll explain later. I'll see you at the hospital. Semper Fi. He nodded, said with little conviction, Hoorah, Jack. Two EMTs lifted Del Rio onto a gurney and slid him into the rear of the latest ambulance to back down the pier. The doors closed and he was gone. Morgan, you've ruined us, Sheriff Camarada said in my ear. I pivoted to find him glaring at me. And how have I done that? He gestured angrily back toward shore. The other end of this pier is lousy with media. They're everywhere overhead. They're going to find out what happened, and... He looked like he wanted to throttle me. I understood why. Camarada was up for re-election in less than a week, and Fesco worked at the whim of the mayor. The chief was studying me as if trying to decide whether I was somebody to be saved or tossed to the wolves. Struggling to keep my own anger under control, I said, I don't have immunity from the fact that I lost a man and may have seen the crippling of another, but no one, including you, Sheriff, or you, Chief, anticipated a bomb. Why would we have? This was supposed to be an extortion pickup, and no prisoners turned it into an attack. Up front, he decided that the money was not going to be in those bags. Up front, he planned to kill as many as he could. How the hell do you know that, Jack? Fesco demanded. Chapter 46 One of the kiteboarders stayed conscious aboard the Baywatch boat that brought us in, I said. I questioned him until he was put in an ambulance. What's the story? the sheriff demanded. I told them what I knew. Danny Stern and Willis Allen were boyhood friends, originally from Hood River, Oregon, and now lived on the Big Island of Hawaii. They'd each won major kiteboarding competitions in the past two years, and had appeared in several extreme sport films. Two months ago, a man named Richard North had called Stern. North said he was a producer of action films, who'd seen footage of Stern and Allen kiteboarding off Oahu. He said he wanted them to perform a stunt for a movie he was making. The fee was $50,000 apiece. North directed them to a website that seemed legit, so they accepted, I told Fesco and Camerata. Stern said North bought airline tickets, flew them over five days ago, met them at LAX. He described North as a big man with long blonde hair, beard, and sunglasses. No prisoners, Fesco said. I nodded. He was driving a late model BMW. He brought them here and gave them three pages of a script for a film called Take No Prisoners. In the script, dry bags containing money are dropped off the pier as part of a ransom deal. Then there's a diversionary explosion. In come the two kiteboarders. North told them to snag the bags and then improvise from there. 
Camarada's scowl deepened. What do you mean, improvise? North said he wanted their moves to unfold instinctively and raw after the pickup, like on a reality television show, I replied. Stern said he and Alan both knew they'd be chased after grabbing the bags. Their job was to evade capture as long as possible. Which means you're right, Jack, Fesco said. No prisoners or North or whatever he calls himself had no intention of accepting the extortion payment. I suspect he thought you'd do just what you did, pack the bags with a lot more newspaper than hundred-dollar bills. But he couldn't have known that, Camarada protested. Does it matter? He obviously believed it and acted accordingly. Both men fell silent, brooding on what I told them. In any case, it's all out of our hands now. FBI and ATF agents will be taking control, I said. The scenario has gone beyond what any of us could be expected to handle. Bullshit, Camarada said. The feds may come in, they may offer expertise, but this is my county. And my city, Fesco said. Yours too, Jack. I'll think on that, I said. Right now, I'm heading to UCLA Medical Center to find out if my best friend will ever walk again. As I left the men, I felt disoriented by the events of the evening, especially the loss. Had it been worth it? No, it hadn't. Rankin and Del Rio were not officers sworn to uphold the law. They worked for me. They did my bidding, and they had suffered for it. Satellite television vans surrounded the police barriers at the east end of the pier, up against Highway 1. Reporters were badgering anyone who moved their way. I thought I'd jump the railing and avoid them, but several of them recognized me and started shouting. Jack Morgan, what's your role in this investigation? What's private got to do with the explosion? One of them, to my surprise, was Bobby Newton, a particularly vicious gossip columnist and television reporter who lived up the beach from me. Jack, she called. Jack, it's Bobby. I ignored her and all of them, tried to move on. But then Klieg lights blazed in my face. I looked at the cameras dead on and said, I'm a consultant here, nothing more. Consultant to whom? Bobby and ten others shouted. I didn't answer, pushed my way by them before they could hound me further, and jogged across the highway, wishing I could talk to Justine. She has the rare ability to slice apart emotions like pain or confusion and expose the underlying fear or meaning. Ordinarily, navel-gazing is not something I'm fond of. That night, I felt in desperate need of a session. But I had not heard from her or Cruz all day. I was at my car, about to call Mobot to see if either of them had checked in, when my cell phone rang. We've been contacted, Jack, said Dave Sanders. They're letting the children go. Chapter 47 In the dim light after midnight, Justine crouched in the corner of the holding cell, watching a woman named Carla. Early thirties, Carla was big, muscular, and heavily tattooed. She'd looked high when she was put in the cell not fifteen minutes before, and had taken an instant dislike to Justine. At the moment, Carla was stalking Justine, carrying the handle of a broken and sharpened plastic spoon as if it were a dagger. After she'd joined private, Jack had insisted that Justine take a course in basic self-defense. She'd chosen Aikido, a Japanese art and had pursued it until she felt confident enough to quit and take up CrossFit to build her strength. But had it been enough? Justine adopted a triangle pose, held up her hands, prepared to fight. In Spanish, she asked, Why are you doing this? Carla said nothing, just grinned, showing a missing upper right incisor. What is your name, American? called Rosa, the only other woman in the cell. Smaller, ratty. She watched with a worried expression. Before Justine could answer, Carla said in English, Her name, Peach. Then the big woman lunged and slashed at Justine with the knife, just missing her belly. Guard! Rosa screamed. Carla grinned again, licked her lips through the gap in her teeth. Now you know I mean it, she said to Justine and lunged again. Justine was quicker this time. She swept her right hand in a circle chopping at the wrist of Carla's knife hand. The move deflected the blade down and away from her belly. It also knocked the big woman slightly off balance. 
Justine encouraged that momentum, pivoted, and slammed Carla into the cement wall. Ugh, Carla said, wobbled, but then spun and slashed at Justine. The blade caught fabric and then skin above Justine's left breast. She began to bleed. Carla slashed again, cutting Justine's forearm. My God, was she going to die here in this stinking cell? All those Aikido lessons, all those CrossFit workouts, all those times when she'd wanted to give up or puke came back to her, made her remember to fight. When Carla moved to cut at her again, Justine's right foot shot out, connected with the woman's shin. Carla grimaced in pain, tried to stab Justine, but Justine hammered down on the forearm behind Carla's knife hand, hit muscles and nerves, causing the woman's grip to evaporate. The knife fell. Both women dove for it. Justine elbowed the woman in the face, snatched it up, and stepped away. You must have had a tough childhood, she said to the stunned woman, who was slowly getting back to her feet. But that's no excuse for bad... Carla shrieked like a lunatic and charged Justine, put her shoulder into Justine's chest, almost knocking her off her feet. They slammed into the bars, facing the hallway. Justine did the only thing she could think of and stabbed the woman in the thick muscles of her upper back. Instead of crumpling, Carla went berserk. She head-butted Justine under the chin. Justine saw stars and felt herself weaken. Carla grabbed Justine's neck with both hands and started choking her. Fight, little sister. Justine rammed her bloody forearm against the big woman's throat. Nothing. She reached over, grabbed the handle of the makeshift knife sticking out of Carla's back, and worked it like a gear shift. Carla's face turned demonic then. Her strength grew exponentially, and Justine knew she would not be able to hold the woman off. Chapter 48 just when the stars became dots and began to gather before Justine's eyes, and she felt herself losing consciousness, she heard boots running. Jail guards with batons appeared behind Justine, clubbed her, and then clubbed Carla. She attacked me, Justine coughed. She tried to kill me. Her blouse was stained with blood. It dripped from her forearm. No way, Carla spat back. Bish tried to kill me, put a shiv in my back, so I came after her. She looked over at Rosa, the smaller woman. Ain't that right? Rosa seemed not to know what to say. One guard said, Don't matter. She's coming with us now. One set of guards grabbed Carla. The other two snapped handcuffs on Justine and roughly led her down the hallway past a row of other holding cells where women hung on the bars and looked at her like she was part of a sideshow, making kissy kissing noises or telling her what a bitch she was or asking her to carry messages for them. Her legs were shaky from adrenaline, and she thought she might heave for the second time in less than twelve hours. And what was happening to Carla? Where were they taking the woman who'd tried to kill her? After an elevator ride, Justine was led down another hallway that had an antiseptic smell. Commandant Gomez stood outside the jail clinic. If he felt surprise at her condition, he wasn't showing it. Instead, he stared at her with an annoyed expression. You and private investigations have powerful friends in Mexico City, Miss Smith. You and Senor Cruz are to be freed and taken directly to your jet, where you will leave the country and not return. A woman just tried to kill me in the cell, Justine said in a shaky voice. What the hell's going on here, Commandant? Where are the Harlows? Do you know? Are you part of a conspiracy? Covering up Leona Casamadre's murder, too? Trying to have me killed? Gomez turned nasty. I am part of no conspiracy, senora. And I most certainly did not try to have you killed. The cells are the cells. We cannot control what happens in them. Leona Casamadre, for your information, let notorious members of a drug cartel use her apartment from time to time. It's the only reason she could afford the place. Pigs died that it was. Drunk that she was. And I have personally checked out these lies about the Harlows. Both supposed witnesses told me they made their stories up, trying to get some U.S. publication to pay them to describe things that did not happen. Now, you have a phone call waiting inside, and I will personally investigate this attack on you, I assure you. I'll bet you will, Justine said. Where is Carla, the woman who attacked me? 
You have a phone call waiting inside, Signora, Gomez said again, stoic, gesturing toward the clinic, where Justine saw Arturo Fox coming in another door. A nurse was holding a cell phone toward her. Justine felt disgusted, degraded. What cartel? she asked the commandant. What drug cartel was Leona with? Gomez hesitated, said, De la Vega. Beyond that, I have no answers. Justine glared at him, then held out her cuffs. The commandant thrust his chin at one of her guards, who unlocked them. She walked into the clinic, ignored the blood all over her, and snatched the cell phone from the nurse without another glance at Gomez. Justine, she said. Jack said, You don't know how happy I am to hear your voice. Given the weight of all that had happened to her in the last twenty minutes, Justine burst into tears. Some crazy woman tried to kill me in here. Stunned silence. You're not hurt, are you? Justine could hear pain and guilt in Jack's voice, as plain as day. Did not understand it. Said, I'm okay. Cut a few places and my jaw doesn't feel right, but I'm okay. How did you find us? Long story, Jack said. Took a few calls to her office in Mexico City. Calderon pulled some levers and we popped you. We're not backing off this, I hope you know, she said. I'm not, Jack said. But I need you here ASAP. No, Jack, this has gotten personal. Jack cut her off. Last night Dave Sanders was contacted by the kidnappers. They say they're letting the Harlow children go. I need you here to examine and evaluate them. We'll be getting instructions in six hours. I'll be there in four, maybe five, she promised. Where are you? UCLA Medical Center, he said, the pain palpable now. What's happened? she demanded. It's Rick, Justine, Jack said. He's hurt real bad. Can't feel his legs. He's in surgery right now. Chapter 49 I sat up all night on a couch outside the surgical facility. Mobot joined me around one, sigh, an hour later. Del Rio had gone under the knife at 11 p.m., two hours before I got to the hospital after a short visit to Sanders' Beverly Hills offices, where a simple email message from a blind source declared, The children will be released tomorrow. Time to be determined. We contact. Justice has been served. They are innocents. As hour upon hour ticked by on the clock, with no word from the doctors trying to treat Del Rio's burns and back, I felt unable to think or talk about the Harlows, or no prisoners, or Tommy, or Carmine Nochia for that matter. For the first time in a long time, probably since my mother's death, I prayed, confessing my belief that I had caused Bud Rankin's death as surely as no prisoners had. I was also the reason my best friend was five hours into surgery, and now six. I begged God for mercy, for Rankin's soul, for Del Rio's spine. I didn't know whom to contact about Rankin. The man had no family and was a real loner. I vowed, however, to honor his passing in some way. Overriding those thoughts was the fact that I'd always considered Del Rio virtually indestructible a force fused to me in battle, a fellow Marine, a blood brother who would never desert me, a man whom I would never desert. As dawn broke over Los Angeles, the idea of that man in a wheelchair for the rest of his life nearly broke my heart. I sipped a coffee Sai had gotten me and gazed up, numb, at the television blaring coverage of the bombing and the deaths on the Huntington Beach Pier. The media had much of the story now and was blaring every aspect except, it seemed, Private's involvement. The mayor was even shown admitting that the explosion had taken place during a phony drop of, Jack, Justine said, shaking me from the screen. Cruz was there too, but I could only look at her. She looked exhausted. Her right forearm was wrapped in bandages. Her lower face was slightly swollen, and yet she was beautiful as always but I could see that something had been taken from her in Mexico, or cracked in her in Mexico, and that only served to bewilder me more. A tiny woman in surgical scrubs exited the operating room. She introduced herself as Dr. Phyllis Oates, chief neurosurgeon at the medical center. 
Who is Mr. Del Rio's next of kin? she asked. I swallowed hard, instantly feared the worst, and said, I'm closest. For a moment, Dr. Oates just looked at me, and I felt like I was being pushed over a cliff. Then the surgeon managed a tired smile and put her hand on my arm. I wanted you to know what a lucky, lucky man Mr. Del Rio is. By all rights, he should have been paralyzed from the waist down. But the lineman's belt and the wetsuit held the broken vertebrae in place, prevented them from severing his spinal cord. There's considerable swelling, and it might take several months. But I believe he'll walk again. And run. I looked at Justine, and Cy, and Mobot, and Cruz, and we all began to cry and hug. I don't remember being happier or more grateful in my entire life. Chapter 50 We've got their attention now, Mr. Cobb, Watson said, looking away from several computer screens streaming early morning coverage of the Huntington Beach Pier explosion, as well as clips from the killings at Malibu and at the CVS. We do indeed, Mr. Watson, Cobb said. Two more cycles and we'll have a clear shot at the prize. They were inside the garage in the City of Commerce. Cobb was stuffing the Lakers hoodie, the blonde wig, the sunglasses, and the cap into a trash bag. There would be no further need for the disguise. It had served its purpose and more. For the time being, law enforcement would be focused on a man answering no prisoner's description, which was how Cobb wanted it. Today? Kelleher asked. Today we rest and regroup, Mr. Kelleher, Cobb said. In the meantime, we let the media do its job, get the drumbeat of threat going, build the panic exponentially, get the government worms all squirming like they've been plugged into a socket. We let them assure the people that they are safe, and then we wait until we start hearing them speculate that we might be finished, that we've left Los Angeles alone. That could be twelve hours after the assurance of safety. Could be thirty-six or forty-eight. And then we go again, Johnson said. The wiry black man was sitting on the foot of his cot, cleaning a pistol. Yes, Mr. Johnson, Cobb said. When that happens, we go again. Meantime, anybody up for breakfast at Robbie Eden's? I could go for three eggs over easy, two sides of bacon, and an order of sourdough toast. Chapter 51 By noon, I was running on fumes riding shotgun with crews driving the company Suburban. Justine was in the back seat. So were Cy and Mobot. Behind them were stacked boxes of forensics gear. I don't believe the Mexicans, Justine said for the fourth or fifth time. The Harlows are down there, Jack, or were. I'm not saying that they aren't or weren't, I replied. But the kids can tell us more, and then we'll decide if we need to go back to Mexico. Cruz barreled us into the Beverly Center parking lot, ten minutes after Sanders' call to say that we would find the children on level six of the luxury shopping mall, near the top of the Macy's Escalator and the Apple Store. I caught up with Dave Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Cynthia Maines on the escalator between levels four and five, two minutes later. The Harlow's lawyer was talking on his cell phone, head down, intent. The personal assistant looked like she'd been crying. The publicist wore dark sunglasses and scanned everywhere around her. Miss Maines, I said. Surprised to see you here. Camilla called last night, Maines replied. She thought I should be here. Familiar faces, Camilla Bronson said, still looking all around. We rode the escalator to level six in a pack. Sanders spotted the children first. All three were sitting in wheelchairs, backed up against the wall beside the bustling apple store directly across from the traffic boutique. They had iPhones in their hands and stared at them like zombies. Malia! Maines cried. Jin! Miguel! But of the three, only Malia, the Harlow's oldest adopted daughter, raised her head toward her parents' personal assistant. Malia had high cheekbones and almond-shaped eyes, which were bleary, red, cried out. She blinked at Maines a second, then said in a little girl's voice, why are we here, Cynthia? Oh, dear God, Maine said, rushing to her, tears boiling down her cheeks. She embraced the girl. You're safe, Malia. You're going to be okay. You're all going to be okay. 
Jin? Miguel? I'm here. Cynthia's here now. The other two children just continued to stare at the phones in their laps. They've been drugged, Justine said. I agree, said Mobot, and moved forward, carrying a medical kit. Over the years, she had somehow found the time to earn her EMT's license, handy at moments like this. We're going to want blood samples. Here? Yeah? Camilla Bronson said, horrified. No, get them out of... Mama? Miguel said suddenly. The boy's head had come up. Over the years, he'd had several operations on his cleft palate, which made him look different from pictures I'd seen. He gazed around in bewilderment. Donde esta mi mama? He began to whine and shook his arm violently free when Mobot tried to touch him. Where's mommy? Jin began to cry as well. Up until this point, Sanders had stood off to one side, unnerved by the children's stupor. But now he saw that patrons leaving the Apple store were looking at the upset children in the wheelchairs. Camilla's right, he said to me through gritted teeth. We've got to get them out of here before... Is that them? cried a familiar, skewer-sharp voice I'd heard just the night before. The Harlow brats? I turned in shock. Bobby Newton was leading the charge off the Macy's escalator. She had two cameramen in tight tow. Chapter 52 It is them! cried Bobby Newton. Wheelchairs? Wheelchairs! What's happened to them? Where are Tom and Jennifer? Downstairs! Camilla Bronson cried, moving into the gossip reporter's way. Tom's buying her a huge diamond at Cartier. The kids are just playing a game, that's all. Bobby Newton was having none of it. I've got Cartier's wired. They alert me when anyone of that stature comes in. Where are they? What's happened to those kids? Tim, you getting this? Seeing the cameraman aiming tight on the children, Justine stepped up beside the publicist. They're minors. They have the right to privacy. They're Tom and Jen Harlow's kids, the reporter shot back, which means they are de facto celebrities, whoever you are. I have every right to... What's wrong with them? Where are the Harlows? In a soothing tone, Camilla Bronson said, Bobby, we'll have a statement later in the... They're missing, Cynthia Maines called out loudly. Someone kidnapped the entire family and only just released the children. Bobby Newton's trembling free hand shot to her mouth, unable to disguise her blossoming joy. Oh, my God, she said in a drawl that ended in a squeal. Is that true? It's the story of the year. It's the story of the century. Bobby, Camilla Bronson said. Bobby, calm down. It's nothing. But the gossip reporter spun around gleefully, microphone in hand, ignoring the publicist. Three, two, one. She snapped at the second cameraman. The other focused on the Harlow children, who were still dazed, unsure where they were. Part of me wanted to lunge for the cameras and hurl them over the railing, but a crowd was gathering, and I have always hated seeing other people grabbing cameras and destroying them. It smacks of thugs and book burning, and I despise both. So, like everyone else, I had to just stand there and listen to her. This is Bobby Newton, your best friend forever, she brayed. I'm at the scene of a shocking, shocking story that's about to rock Hollywood to its core. Jennifer and Tom Harlow, the most powerful couple in all of Filmland, have been kidnapped. You heard it here first, and in a dramatic update, their children have only just been released, drugged out of their loving little minds, and they're right behind me. Look, just look at the poor darlings. You're fired, Camilla Bronson snarled out of the corner of her mouth at Maine's. You can't fire me, the Harlow's personal assistant shot back. I work for Tom and Jen. But I can, Sanders said. I don't work for you either, Maine said, her voice rising. And this cover-up you've been engaged in for whatever reason is frankly shocking and hardly in the Harlow's best interest. The publicist's eyes went wide. She grabbed Maines by the arm, spun her away from the cameras. You tipped her, she hissed, while Bobby blathered on, getting only half of her facts correct. A record high for her. I did not tip anyone, Maines retorted hotly. 
but I was about to notify the FBI because I simply could not wait any longer for Mr. Morgan here to step up and do the right thing. Ouch, I said. In my defense, I spent last night chasing a mass murderer and praying until dawn while my best friend underwent spinal surgery after he was injured in the pier bombing. Maines blinked. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack, I... It doesn't matter, Sanders said, still furious. He glared at me. Help us get them out of here now, Jack. I won't have them treated like freaks. They need to be seen by qualified medical personnel, and... Who died and made you their guardian? Maines challenged. Sanders turned cold. No one has died, to my knowledge, Cynthia, he snarled. But Tom and Jennifer have stipulated in writing that in the event of death or incapacitation, I will serve as the children's trustee and guardian. I believe kidnapping fits the definition of incapacitation in anyone's dictionary. He and Camilla Bronson moved toward the children. Justine said, I'll help you. Cruz, Mobot, and Sai followed. Maine said, I'm coming with you. Sanders whirled around. No, Cynthia, you most definitely are not. As I remember, you are paid by Harlow Quinn, which means Terry Graves can and will fire you. Expect a call momentarily. Coats were draped over the children's heads. Justine, Mobot, and Sai wheeled the three children past the cameras while Bobby Newton prattled inanely that they looked zombified. Sanders got behind them. So did Camilla Bronson. When Bobby Newton tried to join the entourage, I couldn't take it anymore. I got out a pocket knife, slid behind her cameraman, and cut the cables that connected the cameras to their battery packs. Dead, one said. Me too, the other said. I was already moving around them onto the escalator. What? Bobby cried as I disappeared below her. No, I... She must have seen the cut cables because she appeared over the railing, looking like a nut job when she said, Of course it was you, murdering Jack Morgan. What's your involvement in this, Jack? That's what I want to know. What's murdering Jack Morgan's involvement? I winked at her, pulled out my cell phone, and called the FBI. Chapter 53 Eight hours later, after a long nap, a shower, and a change of clothes, Justine entered a large private suite directly across the street from the Beverly Center inside Cedars Sinai Medical Center, where the Harlow children were being kept overnight for further tests and observation. Sanders, Camilla Bronson, and Terry Graves had arranged it all. Justine had not known such suites existed, but here was a common room occupied by Jack, Sai, Chief Fesco, and a half-dozen others, two doctors, a private nurse, and government technicians linking cables to computer screens. Before joining private, Justine had worked for the city and courts of Los Angeles as a child psychologist who interviewed and counseled victims of crime. Even though her horizons had broadened into investigations, she still felt confident that there wasn't anyone on the West Coast better at this kind of thing. Most of the people gathered in the common room evidently agreed with her assessment. Chief Fesco had readily signed off on Justine's involvement. So had District Attorney Blaze and Christine Townsend, special agent in charge of the FBI's Los Angeles office. A tall redhead with a beaky nose, Townsend was familiar with Justine and openly valued her skills and judgment. The Harlow team had been the only ones to object. They had been summarily overruled. What's their current status? Justine asked. They're up after a five-hour nap, the nurse replied. And Miss Bronson just delivered them a large order from In-N-Out Burger. Their favorite, the publicist sniffed. Okay, Justine said. I need you to get me completely up to date on what we know before I go in there. She looked at Dr. Alan Parks, the pediatric specialist overseeing the Harlow children's care. No sign of sexual or physical mistreatment? Park said. They've been nourished, well hydrated, and generally well cared for, other than the fact that they lived in the same clothes for five days. Our blood work confirmed Dr. Kloppenberg's findings. I heard scopolamine and Percocet, Justine said, looking to sigh. Kloppenberg nodded. A modern update on a 19th century cocktail German doctors used to give women in labor. They called it twilight sleep. 
Don't be surprised if they don't remember much. That's the point of the stuff, isn't it? Townsend asked. Pretty much, Special Agent, Parks replied. Beyond that, Miguel has several bruises on his knees and shins. Malia suffered a sprained wrist. Jin appears untouched. And all three had puncture wounds that indicate someone had run IVs into them. Justine looked at Jack and Fesco. Beverly sent her security tapes? Jack nodded. Lots there. Men wearing dark hoodies brought them in off San Vicente Boulevard in the wheelchairs at 10.15 a.m. They used elevators to get the children to level six. A camera outside the Apple store showed the children were left there no more than three minutes before we arrived. The iPhones in their laps were junk knockoffs. No prints on the wheelchairs or the phones. Psy collected epithelial samples from their clothes. No hits yet, Kloppenberg said. Justine looked at Townsend, who said, Not surprisingly, the media is going insane over this. It's gone viral and global. They're giving it much more attention than the no-prisoners killings and the pier explosion. What did you expect? Camilla Bronson said snidely. I've done nothing but field calls since Bobby Newton went live. Justine said, those children just went from fishbowl life to circus life. You'll have to prepare them for that, Townsend said. They won't be exposed to any circus if I have anything to do with it, said Terry Graves hotly. I won't stand for it. Neither will I, Sanders said. Absolutely not, the Harlow's publicist said. Justine softened, said, Well, good. That's a start. Chapter 54 Malia lay in the bed on the right, Jin on the left, and Miguel in the middle. They were eating and watching a rerun of Family Guy. All three children glanced at Justine suspiciously when she entered. Small cameras had been set up, feeding the discussion out to the screens and recorders in the common room. I'm Justine, she said, turned off the television, set her purse on the floor. You with the police? Malia asked. Working for them, and for the FBI. Where are Jennifer and Tom? Jin asked. Justine thought it odd that she referred to her parents by their first names. Then again, nearly everyone referred to the Harlows by their first names. But was that just Jin? Hadn't Miguel called out for his mommy? We don't know, Justine admitted at last. I'm part of a team trying to find your parents. We hoped you could help us. Miguel set down the last of his burger and closed his eyes, hiding his mouth behind his hand, saying nothing. I don't remember anything, Malia said. Me neither, Jin said. Miguel still said nothing. Smells awful good in here, Justine said, settling into a chair. What did you get for dinner? Bacon cheeseburger, Malia mumbled. Not me. Jennifer says it's bad for you. Bacon, Jin announced. No, it isn't, Malia said. Anita says it's the best. Makes you strong. What does Anita know? Everything, Miguel said, eyes still shut. She's here, you know, Anita, in Los Angeles, Justine said. Her goal now was just to keep them talking, build trust. Miguel's eyes opened and his hand dropped. Where is she? I don't know exactly, Justine admitted. But she's here. I know she'd love to see you all at some point. Miguel's face fell. Oh, would you like to see her? Justine asked. Miguel blinked, nodded. So did his sisters. I'm sure we can arrange that, Justine said. But in the meantime, there is someone here I think you might also be happy to see. She opened the door and their bulldog came rushing in, trailing a leash, wagging her butt wildly, snuffling, whining, and trying to jump up on the bed. Stella! Miguel cried. The boy leaped out of his bed and held the bulldog tight while she barked and licked his face. Then, with great effort, the dog weighed more than fifty pounds, he picked her up and set her down on his bed while his sisters crowded in around their brother and beloved dog. Stella Bella is such a pretty girl, Malia soothed. Prettiest in the world, Jin said. Best dog in the world. Miguel beamed and scratched Stella's belly. The dog flopped on her side so all the children could get in on the scratching. Her jowls hung open, making her look like an alien. 
But then, to Justine's delight and wonder, the bulldog began to purr almost like a cat. Does she always do that? Justine asked. Only when she's happy, Jin said. Stella's a wonder dog. I can see that, Justine said. She was very upset when we found her up at the ranch. Any idea why Stella would be so upset? Malia and Jin shook their heads, but Miguel said, Because she missed us, I bet. Justine knew from a brief scan of the children's medical records that in addition to the cleft palate, Miguel had been diagnosed as on the spectrum, not autistic, but very awkward socially. To her surprise, however, at least in the presence of the dog, he exhibited few, if any, signs of Asperger's syndrome. I'll bet that's what it was, Justine agreed. Stella's a smart dog. Miguel grinned. The dog made him happy. The dog made them all happy and more relaxed, open. Justine decided the dog could be her ally. If Stella could talk, Justine began, what do you think she would remember from the day you all disappeared? Anything. Anything at all. Chapter 55 What kind of question is that? Camilla Bronson demanded out in the suite's common room, where Justine's questioning unfolded on screen. A brilliant one, I retorted. She's getting them to separate from whatever happened to them by forcing them to engage their imaginations and look at their memories through the dog's eyes. Stella's like her key into their minds. Indeed, over the next two hours, using Stella whenever she could to preface questions, Justine brought out snippets of information that together created a loose tapestry of the Harlow family's life on the day before their disappearance. Stella remembered that she suffered from jet lag but felt happy to be out of Vietnam with all those crazy scooters that almost ran her over. The bulldog recalled getting up early with Malia, who'd promised Jennifer she'd feed and water the horses. Jennifer liked to sleep in. The dog also remembered that Jin had worked on a watercolor painting instead of unpacking her room, which had annoyed her mother no end. Stella further recalled that Miguel had climbed a live oak tree he'd never climbed before, and Hector, the caretaker and groundskeeper, got upset with him and had to fetch a ladder to get him down. How long have you known, Hector? Justine asked. Forever, Malia said. Hector came with the ranch, Tom told me once. Their adoptive father had gotten up around nine the day after their arrival back at the ranch, got coffee, and disappeared to his editing room in the basement. The bulldog and all three children saw him go through the kitchen on his way there. Despite his promise that he'd spend time with the children, Tom had spent much of the day working. Jennifer rose later around noon, complained of jet lag, but then she too went to her office and worked for much of the day. They'd had dinner together around six. Miguel wanted to play soccer afterward, but Tom said he had too much work to do, took a plate of food, and returned to his editing room. Stella remembered this because Tom had dropped a cubed piece of chicken and she'd snagged it before he could. Tom told Stella she was like a shark, Jin recalled softly. As the group that was gathered in the common room watched the screen, the bulldog on the bed next to Miguel seemed to grow puzzled. Was that possible? Her eyebrows definitely rose. She clearly knew the kids were talking about her. When did Stella go out last? Justine asked. Probably after we went to bed, Jin said. Jennifer always took her out last, let her go pee and poop while she went for a run. Did Jennifer go for a run that night? Justine asked. Jennifer never misses her run, no matter what, Malia said flatly. I heard the screen door slam when she went out that night. It's below my window. What time did Jennifer come back? I don't know, Malia said with a heavy shrug. I was in my room when she left, but then my iPhone died, so I went to where we watch television. Off the kitchen? Justine nodded. And? That's the last thing I remember, Malia said. I was on the couch watching the CW. And then, like, nothing. How about you? Justine asked Jin. Chapter 56 Jin shook her head. Miguel? The boy looked off into the distance, 
He had covered his mouth again with his hand. Even so, you could see the memory of some traumatic event ripple across his face. Then he shook his head, said, No. What were you thinking about just then? Justine asked. Miguel shrugged, said, It was like a dream. I don't think it was real. What happened in your dream? Justine asked softly. Was Stella there? She was sleeping in my bed, the boy said. How do you know that? Because she farted when I got up to go pee. It was horrible. Jin giggled, nodded. Stella's the smartest, prettiest girl, but she's got the worstest farts. The dog's eyebrows went up again. Justine said, Okay, so Stella farts in your dream, Miguel, and then you go pee, and then what? The boy blinked, and the repressed memory passed across his face again. I heard noises, he said. I didn't know what they were, but I knew they were bad. How? He hesitated, hand worrying the bulldog's neck, said, I don't know, but I was scared. I started to run, and I fell and hurt my legs. He pointed to the bruises on his knees and shins. And then I don't remember anything. When you say bad noises, do you mean screams or... Crying, Jin said suddenly, looking off somewhere herself. I remember a dream, too. Someone was crying. Where were you? Justine asked. In your room? At home? Jin appeared puzzled, but then said, No, I was in like a bunk bed, because I was lying on my back, and I could reach up and touch the bottom of the mattress. It wasn't very far. You remember seeing that in your dream? Justine asked. No, it was night. I could just, like, feel it. And the crying? Justine pressed. Where was that? Who was that? I don't... Jin said before her voice trailed off. Malia's mouth hung open. I had that same dream, too. Someone was crying. Where? Outside of where I was, Malia said, growing agitated, tears starting to dribble. Only, I don't think it was a bunk bed. I was in a box. I felt walls all around me. I heard the crying through the walls. Was it a man or a woman crying? Your mom or dad? The oldest Harlow girl shook her head. No, it sounded like a child crying, not Jennifer. Couldn't have been Tom? Malia blinked, thought, said. But I heard men talking, and that stopped the crying. And then I heard loud noises like chains clanking and something heavy hitting something metal, and then a sound like a jet, the way the engine sounds when it starts up. I know that sound, Justine said, paused. The men you heard talking in your dream, what were they saying? I don't know. They were speaking Spanish. Chapter 57 Del Rio's face was puffy, bandaged. A carbon fiber and canvas girdle wrapped and supported his torso. He was flat on his back, hitched to several machines and an IV, but breathing without a tube. I'm spending too much time in hospitals, I said in weary greeting. It was past ten. Other than two twenty-minute catnaps, I hadn't slept in nearly forty-eight hours. I should have listened to Justine, gone home, slept hard. But I felt I had to be by Del Rio's side. It was my duty and my honor. Del Rio smiled, coughed, looked at me through a medicated haze. They say it will all heal. You can't know how happy I was to hear that news, Rick. I said, grabbed his hand and shook it. How happy all of us are. Don't feel Jack now, Jack, Del Rio said. But they got me on all sorts of stuff supposed to reduce the swelling. He paused. What all happened? Nobody'll tell me anything. I gave it to him in broad strokes. The death of Bud Rankin, the chase at the pier after the explosion, the identity of the kite boarders, the sheriff trying to say Private should take the fall for the whole fiasco. What did I tell you? 
Del Rio rasped. I raised my hands in surrender. I should have listened to you, but we had and have immunity. Anyway, FBI's involved now, in both cases. Both. I summarized Justine and Cruz's trip to Mexico, the release of the Harlow children, and their spare and fuzzy recollections of their capture and captivity. Del Rio closed his eyes. For a second, I thought he'd lost consciousness, but then he said, Those sounds she heard, the Harlow girl. Sounds like loading coffins on an airplane, right? I thought about it, nodded. Could be, or something like it. There'll be paperwork on that somewhere, he said. You can't just go flying bodies around in coffins. That true? Well, you'd think. I couldn't argue with his logic. Said, I'll have Mobot look into cargo flights to Mexico the night they disappeared. Guadalajara. Del Rio nodded, glanced at the clock. I don't remember you saying Fesco or anyone else got another demand from no prisoners. Because there hasn't been one, at least to my knowledge. More than twenty-four hours, he said. No more killings, either. He was right. What did that mean? Anything? Or was no prisoners just trying to lull us into thinking? Where's it all going next? Del Rio asked. Private's end of things. Justine and Sai are returning to the Harlow's ranch in the morning along with a team of FBI techs. See if there's anything they missed, I said. Justine done with the kids? He grunted. Couple of hours of mind-flogging doesn't seem enough for her. I shrugged. She offered to go back in the morning. But Sanders wanted to give the children time to get settled into his house before they were talked to again. I have to admit, he seems very protective of them. They all do, Camilla Bronson and Graves. Justine's arguing that I should send people back to Mexico ASAP, but the FBI's already heard her story and they've got more clout. No prisoners? I want no prisoners because of what he did to you, I said coldly but I have no idea what Private's official role will be going forward. My cell phone rang loudly. Shit. I wasn't supposed to have the damn thing on. I glanced at the caller ID and was taken aback. I hesitated, clicked answer. More slanderous accusations to throw my way? Jack, Bobby Newton sighed. I just have to draw the line at someone disrupting my God-given First Amendment rights. Uh-huh, I said. How are they, the poor little darlings? I could tell she'd been drinking. Bobby liked to drink, early and often, another winning aspect of her character. Who, I said. Coy boy, she said in a scolding tone. I let the silence grow, knowing it would drive her crazy, personally and from a journalistic point of view. Bobby had broken the story of the Harlow kidnapping and the release of the children. No doubt about that. But stories like the Harlow's disappearance required near constant updates to feed the cable, internet, and network news monsters. Give Camilla a call, I said. I'm sure she'd love to talk. Camilla Bronson carries grudges, Bobby said. And I don't. Come on, Jack. That's old news. Live and let live. I waited several beats, then said, Tit for tat, Bobby? What's the tit? She demanded, and I heard ice cubes clink against glass. An update on their physical and mental condition, the little we know about the day of the kidnapping, I said. Hmm, that is tempting, Bobby said. The tat? Who tipped you off? Was it Maine's? A good journalist never reveals sources, she protested. You know that. Too bad, then. Gotta go, Bobby. Wait, wait, she cried. Okay, okay. You go first. Nope, I said, and stayed silent. Offer's good for ten seconds. Five seconds went by, then nine. I was about to end the call when she said, Terry Graves. That threw me. Why would... I'm waiting for my tit, Jack, Bobby said. Sorry, Bobby. Your information came in a second after tit deadline. What? You... you lying son of a... I ended the call, feeling like balance had been restored in the universe. You can only take so much grief from one person before you give it back. 
I looked at Del Rio, hoping to... He was sleeping. There was a recliner in the room. I sat in it, shut off my cell, kicked back, shut my eyes, and drifted off to a place where there were no mass killers, no celebrities, and no conniving attorneys. Not like my hometown at all. Chapter 58 Justine suffered that night. In her nightmares, she kept hearing the muffled sounds of someone crying, kept seeing the chewed lips of Leona Casamadre, and kept reliving the knife fight with Carla. Twice, she woke up shaking and in a cold sweat, unsure where she was. Twice, she wondered about the brutal vividness of the nightmares, worse than the actual experience. Was she infected? Running a fever? Hallucinating? She woke for a third time a few minutes before five, feeling Carla's fingers around her throat, seeing the woman's insane eyes and the shivs sticking out of her back. Justine lay there, panting, trying to figure out why the nightmares would not quit. And then she thought she knew. She recalled hearing about this kind of relentless cyclic dream from soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Jack had had this very same sort of dream. The dreams were what had driven him to seek her out in the first place. I think I'm suffering from PTSD, she said, as she sat up and turned on the light. Post-traumatic stress disorder, rampant among vets, seen in cops and firefighters. And now her? Was that what was going on? Justine pulled her legs up tight to her chest, realizing that the attack in the jail cell was the closest she'd ever come to dying the closest she'd ever come to deadly violence. Once again, she felt invaded, like a part of her, some basic innocence, had been ripped from her, leaving no visible wound other than the ones on her arm and upper chest. The clinician in Justine clicked through the symptoms of PTSD that might affect her. Recurring nightmares, hypervigilance, inability to sleep, inability to feel certain emotions, heavy drinking, heavy medicating acting out sexually. Her head ached. She was still tired but did not want to sleep again. She got out of bed, got dressed for CrossFit, thought it would be good to go sweat the horrors away. She found a coffee shack open at 5.30, got a double-shot latte, and prayed that the workout of the day didn't include running. She arrived at 10 to 6 and parked across the street from the box, which, to her surprise, was already lit up. Usually Ronnie, the trainer at the early class, arrived at the very last second. She went inside, finding Ronnie talking excitedly on his cell. He hung up, looking shaken. You okay? Justine asked. No, the trainer said, puffing his lips. My sister, she just went into labor, and her boyfriend left her. I said I'd be there for her. Well, go on then, she said. I'll have to cancel class, he said. Go, she said. Give me the key. I'll wait until ten past, tell whoever shows, lock the place up, and put the key back through the mail slot. Ronnie hesitated, but then ripped the key from a chain and took off. Justine looked around, thinking, Life goes on, doesn't it? But Rankin dies. A baby is born. Chapter 59 Justine knew she probably shouldn't use the equipment without a trainer present, but she'd been there long enough to feel she could at least do something, say, ten rounds of five pull-ups, ten push-ups, and fifteen sit-ups. She was into round six, hanging off the bars, when she heard the front door open. It was that guy, Paul. His curly brown hair hung above his soft, nice eyes, which found her immediately. We the only ones? he asked, coming in, looking up at the clock. It was five past six. No class this morning, Justine said, and explained about Ronnie. Oh, Paul said. What happened? He was pointing at the bandages on her forearm. The one on her chest was hidden beneath her shirt. Justine looked at her arm, hesitated, then said, Fell rollerblading. I broke my wrist once doing that, he said. Are you working out? She told him she was. Mind if I join in? He asked. Justine once more noticed how appealing he was. Sure, she said. Just no weights or rowers, liability issues, I think. Paul grinned. 
He warmed up and stretched while Justine finished her last four rounds, which left her sweating and heaving for air. When she got to her feet, Paul was crossing toward her, carrying a heavy green rubber band about three feet long. Can you show me how this kipping thing works? he asked. Ronnie said I should use the bands to learn it. Oh, sure, she said, checking the clock. 6.20. No one else was coming. She helped Paul set up the band, looping it over the bar at the top of a pull-up station. She showed him how to step into the band with one foot, while holding on to the bars. Now fully drop down, she said, recalling how she'd been taught to kip. He did. The band stretched. His feet hung two inches above the floor. Okay, Justine said. Now you want to get your body rocking, as if you were pushing your stomach out and then snapping it in and back toward your spine. That momentum carries you into the pull-up. Paul tried. It was a pitiful attempt. He was throwing his knees forward, not his belly. Here, she said. Can I put my hands on you? He smiled down at her, a nice smile. A very nice smile. If it will help. It helped me, Justine said. Okay, then. She smiled, nodded, moved around to his side, put one hand on his lower back and the other on his stomach. Jump up. Paul jumped up and caught the bar with both hands. Justine pressed against his back so his belly arched against the band. Then she pushed backward quickly. He swung on the band and lifted. Feel it? she asked. I did, he said, then began to play with the motion. It's almost like what trapeze artists do. Exactly. In less than ten tries, he had it, and was using his body and the band to snap himself up into the air six, then seven times in a row. Justine clapped. You've got it. Paul slowed, stepped out of the band. He was grinning. They were very close. You're a natural, you know that? A teacher, I mean. Justine noticed how good he smelled, blushed, but did not look away or try to create space between them. I just did what... No, he said, taking her hand. I mean it. You... You're really wonderful. I'm sorry to be so forward, but ever since I met you, I've thought about you a lot. They stood there looking at each other for several beats. Justine's heart raced. She felt outside herself somehow. She heard her own voice as if from far off, like in a dream, saying, Did you ever just want to give in sometimes and do something totally crazy? Totally not you? Paul's gaze went lazy, and he nodded. All the time. Justine could not believe that she replied. We should lock the door then. Turn out the lights. A moment of surprise. Then Paul murmured, Perfect. No one will even know we're here. Chapter 60 At five minutes to eight that morning, Terry Graves entered his office in the Harlow Quinn Productions bungalow on the Warner lot. He carried a grande Starbucks and was reading that morning's Hollywood Reporter. Dave Sanders was trailing him, chewing on a bagel, engrossed in the Los Angeles Times. The office was surprisingly small, and the furniture surprisingly understated, given the success of the company. Except for the various framed movie posters, you would not have pegged the room as belonging to a Hollywood power player. The producer was almost around the back of his desk before he noticed me sitting in his chair, looking at him. I was finishing an egg and bacon sandwich, one eye on the television, which showed a clip from Bobby Newton's footage of the Harlow children. What the hell are you doing in here, Jack? Graves demanded. How the hell did you get in here? Sanders said. I'm resourceful, remember? I said. That's why you hired me. What's this all about? Graves said, indignant now. Bobby Newton's footage of the Harlow kids? I said. I just heard it's the number one clip on YouTube, something like seven million hits since yesterday. And it's the number one most linked to site on Facebook. There isn't a news channel or newspaper in the world that isn't carrying the story. Does that surprise you? Sanders demanded. The question is, does it surprise you? What? The producer scowled. Of course it doesn't surprise us. I didn't think so. 
The attorney caught the edge in my voice. What's that mean? Bobby Newton told me that Terry here is the one who tipped her about the kids. I suspect you were in on it too, Dave. And maybe even Camilla. What the fuck are you talking about? Terry Graves snapped. The coverage, the uproar, the publicity value of the Harlows disappearing, especially when they're making the movie of a lifetime, makes me wonder what's really going on here. The producer's eyes flared. I have no, zero, not a interest in this kind of publicity. And what Bobby told you? That's an out-and-out -out lie from a lunatic lush who will say anything to further her own ego-glorifying ends. I had to admit, Terry Graves knew the Bobby Newton I knew. Sanders became livid. And for thinking that we had anything to do with any of this, you're fired, Morgan. Vacate the premises. Invoice me for your time. I watched him, saying nothing. Get out of my chair, Terry Graves said. I don't think that's in your best interest, gentlemen, I said, not moving. Our best, the producer shouted. Should I call security? I don't know. Will that be how you handled the FBI? What are you talking about? Sanders demanded. You don't think they're coming here eventually, Dave? I asked. For an attorney, you have no sense of how criminal investigations go forward. They'll be wanting to review the books, look at every file that Terry and you and Camilla Bronson have concerning the Harlows. Sanders stiffened. My files are protected under attorney-client privilege. And mine are protected under the First Amendment to the Constitution, Terry Graves said. I shook my head. I don't think any of that will fly in a case this high profile. You will not be able to control this story, gentlemen, no matter what you do. It's taken on a life of its own. Stand in its way. Get ready to be trampled. Sanders thought about that. His tone turned more businesslike. What are you suggesting? I'm not suggesting anything, I replied. I'm telling you that if you are as smart as I think you are, you'll allow me and my investigators access to all your files. We'll look for anything amiss and notify you. That way you'll have a heads up before the FBI hands it to you with your head down. You don't think I know what's in my files? Terry Graves asked. I do. And I'll tell you, Morgan, I'm more than comfortable with what's in there. How about you, Dave? I asked. The entertainment attorney grimaced. I'm fine, too. And we're not interested in your proposition. I stand by my decision. You and Private are fired. We don't need your advice or services anymore. Suit yourself, I said, standing up finally and reaching out to shake Terry Graves' hand. The producer looked at my hand with extreme distaste, did not take it. Neither did Sanders. I exited as gracefully as I could, thinking that the Harlow Quinn team really did need my advice, and really did need private services. Take their security system, for example especially the computer security system. Like most people, Terry Graves was lazy when it came to things like passwords. I'd found his written down on a sticky note under a divider in the top drawer of his desk. Leaving the bungalow and heading toward the gate and my car, parked just outside the Warner grounds, I kept my hands in my pants pockets and gripped the flash drives I'd used to copy everything I could find in the producer's computer regarding the Harlows and Saigon Falls. Chapter 61 Two hours later, Justine sat in the passenger seat of the Suburban as Cy drove them north out of Thousand Oaks on the 101. Kloppenberg was monitoring up-to-the-minute radio coverage of the Harlow disappearance. Justine barely listened. Her mind surged with battling thoughts and emotions about what she'd done so blithely earlier in the morning. How could she have done that? She barely knew Paul and locked door or not, they'd taken such a chance, making love on the floor of the gym and up against the steel poles that supported the pull-up stations. But maybe the possibility of getting caught had only magnified the experience. Even now, hours afterward, Justine had to admit that the sex had been incredible, mind-blowing. But that's not me, she thought in sudden desperation. The Justine I know doesn't hook up with strangers and— she alternated between wanting to call Paul, 
to tell him how amazing it all had been, and wanting to sob. Was this the kind of random sexual acting out she had feared? She couldn't come to any other conclusion. The knife fight in the jail cell in Guadalajara had seriously affected her. For God's sake, she knew risky sexual behavior was a symptom of PTSD. And yet, she'd just gone ahead, almost as if she were an adolescent again, unable to make rational choices. You okay? Sai asked, as they drove into Ojai and headed toward the Harlow's ranch. Huh? She replied, feeling foggier than normal. I'm just tired, Sai. I haven't been getting much sleep lately. Lot of that going around, Kloppenberg offered. You see the text from Jack and Del Rio? Justine shook her head. Rick moved his right big toe about an hour ago. Jack saw it. She smiled. That's so good. I know, right? Sai said. There they are. Ahead on the winding road, Justine could see several satellite broadcast trucks set up across from the gate to the Harlow's ranch. With Klieg lights and cameras trained on the Suburban, Sai pulled into the drive behind two vans emblazoned with the symbol of the FBI. A short, slight man, forties, buzz-cut, FBI blue windbreaker, already stood by the front gate. Good, Sai said. That's Todd McCormick. We work peachy together. You being sarcastic? No, I mean it. He's first-rate. Little uptight. FBI, what do you want? But the man's completely on it when it comes to forensics. They got out, Sai introduced Justine to McCormick, who seemed Kloppenberg's exact opposite in almost every way, and yet Justine noticed immediately that the men appeared to have some kind of quiet bond, a shared expertise and curiosity that was remarkably free of ego or competition. I saw the tapes of the children, McCormick said. Of course, I've heard of you, though I've never seen you in action. Impressive, Miss Smith. Thank you, Justine said. You trained in forensics as well as child psychology? McCormick asked. Justine shook her head. Got to admit, it's a little off from my perspective, the crime tech said. What's that? Sai asked. Townsend letting you both back on the crime scene, McCormick said. Sai grinned coldly. Private's forensics teams and labs are fully accredited with every major law enforcement agency in the country, even yours, Todd. If you remember... I have lectured at the FBI Academy. I remember, Sai, McCormick said before gesturing toward Justine with his chin. No offense, but I was talking about her, Justine said. Look, I'm here because Jack Morgan thinks I have a good eye for things. Special Agent Townsend concurs. I certainly won't touch anything you consider evidence, Mr. McCormick. I'll notify you the moment I find anything that seems germane to the investigation. You could tell the FBI tech didn't like it. But he nodded. You have a key? No, said Sai. I thought you got it from Sanders. Justine sighed, stepped by them to a keypad. Don't worry, gentlemen. I have the entry code. I wrote it down the last time I was here. Chapter 62 How the hell did you get access to these kinds of files? FBI SAC Christine Townsend asked me. We were inside the lab at Private. Mobot was at her workbench, uploading the data onto our system. I copied them from Graves' computer at Harlow Quinn, I said. Stole them, you mean? Townsend cried. Are you out of your mind? I won't be part of this. Whatever you might find in there is tainted now. None of it can be used in any court in... Does it really matter? I demanded. Look, with all due respect, I thought we were in the business of finding the Harlows. Shouldn't we keep that the number one priority? I have a sworn duty to uphold the Constitution, she shot back. As Chief Fesco and others have pointed out to me recently, I don't operate under the same restraints, I replied. Besides, I don't like being lied to or being manipulated, and Sanders and Graves are guilty of both. What's their motive? Townsend said skeptically. Why does this situation benefit them beyond what you said about publicity? You said the Harlows were almost bankrupt, that the film was on the verge of ruining them financially. You'd think they'd be more focused on that. I never said the Harlows were almost bankrupt, I corrected. That's what Sanders told me. As of last night, I doubt nearly everything he has said in this case 
and graves in Bronson, too. Taking the files is my way of double-checking things. Townsend said, I still can't be part of this. She headed toward the door. Don't you want to know what we find? I called after her. I didn't say that, the special agent replied and went out the door. Mobot called to me. Where do you want me to start? This is a lot of ground to cover with a one-woman show. Before I could answer, my cell rang. A number I did not recognize, but given all that had been going on, I answered. Jack Morgan. It's your favorite bail bondsman, Carmine Nochia purred. We should meet sooner rather than later. Carmine, it is not a good time. Wasn't a good time for me last year when the DEA found that truck. So there it was. Carmine either knew or openly suspected me. I suppose not, I said. But what's that got to do with me? Carmine laughed. Cool as ever, Jack. But again, we should meet sooner rather than later. The three of us. Three? Yeah. You, me, your brother. Tommy and I have a proposition for you. An offer I can't refuse? A pause, then a short laugh. You're a cool son of a bitch, Jack. I try. How about Tommy and I drop by your office? Carmine said. Haven't seen the place in a while. Say, like an hour? Say, like, I'll be waiting. Chapter 63 Justine wandered into the Harlow's bedroom, noticed the mirrors, six in total, none alike, two floor lengths on either side wall, two smaller framed mirrors, one on the doors to the closets, and a long thin one on the interior wall up high, right below the ceiling. It seemed to reflect nothing but the Italian plaster. She heard a grunt, noticed McCormick waving an ultraviolet wand over the sheets on the Harlow's bed. Weren't they fresh, the sheets? What did he expect to find on them? Justine headed into Jennifer Harlow's closet, finding the drawer of sex toys Mobot had first discovered, and then the Sibian machine sitting on the floor beneath a row of haute couture dresses. Justine closed her eyes, tried to get inside Jennifer's head. The woman was obviously highly sexed. The actress seemed to have one of the best of everything in the self-pleasure toy category. But what did that mean? A lot of highly creative people were also highly sexed, Picasso, for instance, and Anais Nin, and a dozen other actors she could name right off the top of her head. It certainly didn't mean... or did it? Was it possible that Jennifer used all these toys because her husband did not satisfy her often enough, or at all, anymore? Justine flashed on an image of her entanglement with Paul earlier in the morning and felt faint. What in God's name was I thinking? Was that how Jennifer Harlow was? Sexually impulsive? Or maybe the toys were just that, toys, something to energize a marriage of twenty-plus years. She opened her eyes, looked down, thought, But how do you explain the Sibian? She got down on her knees, looked at it. According to Psy, the machine was the ultimate in erotic gizmos for women, a combination of the thundering power of riding a horse bareback, coupled with... Justine imagined herself on the thing, and then shook her head violently. She was not going there. She was getting this all under control. Her hand lashed out, sweeping aside several of the dresses. She saw something behind the Sibian machine, a crack in the closet wall she hadn't noticed before. She pushed back the dresses, smelling faint perfume. Jennifer's? The crack was regular, rectangular, like the seam around a narrow panel or door, except she could see no handle. She knocked on it and was surprised to find it was made of some kind of metal. She felt along the seam counterclockwise, pressing, prodding. Nothing. She was about to get up to see if McCormick might have better luck when she noticed an aberration in the wood trim that ran along the carpet five inches below the bottom seam. It was a knot that had not been sanded smooth. Justine pushed at it, felt no give. She got her finger alongside the knot and nudged it left. Nothing. She pushed right, felt it give and slide until she heard a hydraulic click and the metal pocket door slid back, revealing a steel ladder bolted into the wall 
two feet away. Chapter 64 The passage to the panic room, Justine thought, leaning out to shine her maglite into the shaft. About twenty feet below her, she spotted a cement floor and a door. About eight feet above her, a faint light shone from another passage. She thought of telling McCormick, the FBI tech, but she knew that meant she would not be able to explore for herself. She ducked through the open pocket door, leaned across the space, and climbed the ladder until she was level with the second passage. Unlike the one below, this passage had no door, just a narrow entry that dog-legged left. Justine held the light between her teeth, stepped across the space, found footing inside. She took another step, met a wall, turned left, and found herself in a room about seven feet high, fifteen feet long, and twenty deep. There were bunk beds, a table with six chairs, and a small kitchen whose shelves were stocked with canned goods. She noticed a switch in the entry and tripped it. Another pocket door slid out, blocking the entrance. Light fell into the panic room from a window placed flush at the top of the wall. It was about a foot wide and ran most of the length of the space. Just above the window on the ceiling, Justine noticed metal brackets, a series of them, spaced at three-foot intervals, five in all. She tried to orient herself based on her movements after she'd left Jennifer Harlow's closet, tried to figure out where the window faced. It's not a window. It's a two-way mirror, she muttered to herself. Again, she looked up at the brackets. Simple, bent, and drilled steel bars screwed into the ceiling. There were extra holes in the bars and signs that something had been bolted to them at one time. Except for electrical plugs in the wall and what looked like a socket for a cable connection, the place was empty. A cable connection? Justine looked back at the brackets, imagining screens and cable lines hanging there. But why? And then she saw it. Not screens. Cameras. It made sense, didn't it? The Harlows were filmmakers, after all. Justine wanted to see what a camera might pick up from the window. She jumped, grabbed hold of two brackets, and pulled herself high enough to peer through the two-way mirror, which afforded her a complete and elevated view of the Harlow's bed and the FBI tech still working on it. She swung her attention around the room, spotting the other four mirrors. Were there brackets for cameras behind them? She was going to find out. As she returned to the ladder, Questions and hypotheses darted through her mind. What were the cameras for? In case they had to use the panic room and wanted to document intruders? She supposed that was possible, but for some reason it didn't make total sense to her. She tripped the switch, the door slid open again. She left it open and climbed back down the ladder. She almost turned and stepped back through the open pocket door into Jennifer Harlow's closet, but decided to go all the way down the ladder first. As she neared the bottom, her flashlight beam picked up an alcove of sorts set opposite a steel door. There were three steel shelves set in the cement in the alcove. On the wall between each shelf were an electrical socket and another of those cable connections. She looked closely at the shelves and saw no dust. Which meant what? The shelves were cleaned regularly? Or had they been cleaned after something was removed from them? Unable to answer... Justine turned toward the door, spotted a switch beside it. She flipped it up. Nothing happened. She shrugged, turned the deadbolt, and yanked open the door. In the darkness, she heard a crash and then a voice yelled out, Who's there? Identify yourself or I swear to God I'll shoot! Chapter 65 Brother dearest, Tommy said as he entered my office, arms spread wide. He was wearing a $5,000 suit, no tie, and appeared to have hit the tanning salon earlier in the morning. I remembered my brother winking at me in the courtroom the day of his arraignment. Was this part of his plan? Figure out a way to get me to admit that I was at the scene when Clay Harris took a 9 millimeter round to the chest? It was not beyond Tommy to go this route. I still suspected that Tommy had hired Clay to kill my ex-girlfriend in the first place in order to frame me for the murder. Since that didn't work out, it only made sense that he'd try to frame me for Clay's murder instead. But I had no proof. Carmine entered my office right behind Tommy, 
his skin an even deeper red against his starched white collar and yellow cashmere sweater. Jack, the mobster said, as if we were long-lost golf buddies. How gracious of you to entertain us at such short notice. Uh-huh, I said. What's the proposition? What, no business pleasantries? Tommy said, taking a seat across the desk from me. I'm not feeling particularly pleasant, brother, I replied. Tommy beamed at me as if I'd said something of deep significance. Carmine shut the door. He looked around my office, a space I intentionally keep devoid of personal effects. In my line of work, I found that it pays to know more about other people than they do about me. Carmine gazed at me, popped his chin up. Place bugged? Good idea, but no, I said. You fellows wearing wires? Tommy cocked his head as if I'd gone paranoid, which I had. Nah, Carmine said. I was never one for taping myself. I said nothing. Tommy scowled but took off his jacket, unbuttoned his shirt, and showed me his chest and back. Satisfied, brother? Carmine, I said. Fuck you, Carmine said, as Tommy tucked his shirt back in. I sighed wearily. What's the proposition, then? I'm a busy man. I heard that, Tommy said, and laughed. Saw that, too. The expression on your face when Bobby Newton caught you with the Harlow children. It was worth the price of admission. You're a television star, brother. You really are. Glad to have entertained you, I shot back. By the way, I found it interesting that you designed the security system at the Harlow's estate, Tommy. The one that was so easily foiled. I looked at Carmine. You two didn't have anything to do with their disappearance, did you? The mobster acted insulted. Do I look like I'm in the business of kidnapping celebs? Chapter 66 I smiled and said, You look like a man capable of anything, Carmine. Carmine smiled. I'll take that as a compliment. Wasn't meant that way at all. That wiped the smirk off his face, which reset as hard and as cold as I'd ever seen it. He sat in a chair across the desk from me, crossed his legs, a man who felt like he was in control. You fucked me over big time, Jack. How's that? Six million in oxy, Tommy said. I can't control the DEA, I said. But you can tip them off, Carmine growled. It's the simplest explanation and I've come to believe that the simplest explanation is the most likely explanation. Could simply be that someone in your organization ratted you out, or someone stumbled into the load and reported it. Shit luck. Carmine shot me his patented shark smile. Doesn't matter in this case now, does it, Jack? It's what I believe happened. Am I right? I said nothing. Carmine said, You gotta pay, Jack. You gotta balance things. I did not reply. Heh, <laughs> Tommy laughed, and I wondered if he'd been drinking. It's not like you're going to find some horse head in your bed. Miracle of miracles. How about a guy carrying piano wire in the back seat? Carmine pursed his lips. You're behind the times. Nothing like that, Tommy said. Nah, Carmine said. Your brother gave me deep insight into your complicated psyche. Imagine that, I said. Right? Carmine said, and then made a gesture with an index finger that encompassed the room. Tommy here says you love this place, private, more than anything in life. Like every day you're trying to make up for the fuck-up your father turned out to be. Deep, Tommy. Tommy grinned and turned his palms up. Truth's the truth. So? So, you're selling Tommy this dump, Carmine said. We're buying you out, Jack, Tommy confirmed putting private where it should have been in the first place, in my hands. Private's not for sale and never will be. There's a lot to be said for economies of scale, you know, Carmine said as if he hadn't heard my reply. With Tommy's company holding the lion's share of the security system design business, it doesn't make sense to go to all the trouble to build up our own investigative business when your company, private, is right there for the taking. Harvard B-School. Tommy said, tapping his temple with one finger. Great mind, that Carmine. Do your homework, Doltish, I snapped. Carmine never finished Harvard B-School. 
He got tossed out for cheating on an accounting exam. Carmine's red skin turned livid, but he held his voice in check. That's a lie, but it doesn't matter, Jack. Instead of piano wire, we'll offer you 3.2 million, which is a hell of a lot more than the company's assets. And you get the fuck out of L.A. If you'd actually finished Harvard Business School, you'd know a company like Private is not valued on assets as much as client base and reputation, Carmine, I replied calmly. Private's value is ten times your quote at minimum. But it doesn't matter because, as I said, the company is not for sale. Of course it is, Carmine said agreeably. Because you are about to put it up for sale, Jack, and will be more than willing to take our preemptive bid. Why in God's name would I ever do that? I asked just as agreeably. The mobster looked like a cat that had just polished off a nice plump rat. He rubbed his belly, said, Because if you don't, you'll be looking at the inside of Folsom or Pelican Bay with a reservation for a chemical cocktail. I felt my stomach go queasy, a feeling that deepened toward nausea when Tommy said, If you don't sell, brother, I'll have to go with Defense Plan B which calls for me putting you at the scene of Clay Harris's murder, gun in your hand, with a cold reason for vengeance for what that bastard did to you. It's a much more plausible story than my supposed motive, definitely enough to cast reasonable doubt, and that's all I really need to skate on this. You, however, will be in for a world of shit. Unless you sign over the company, of course, Carmine said, pulling a checkbook from his pants pocket. I'm prepared to put down good faith money right here, right now. We'll let the attorneys take care of the rest, okay? Tommy was almost gloating at the corner he and Carmine had boxed me into. Either I sold them private, or my brother implicated me in a murder where I was present at the scene, but not a participant. Not to mention the possibility of piano wire. I studied each man in turn, examining the angles of their proposition in my mind. Can I ask what Defense Plan A is, Tommy? Attorney-client privilege on that one, brother, Tommy said. But don't worry, it's just as bomb-proof. A shocker, as they say on court TV. My twin seemed more than confident about the power he held over me, and over the company our father had left to me, and not him. Carmine, meanwhile, looked like he'd just had a second helping of rat. The mobster said, Let's just get this over with, shall we? Ten percent good? Three hundred and twenty grand earnest money? Chapter 67 Sigh, Justine yelled. Don't shoot! Oh my God, she heard Kloppenberg grunt. Shaking, she stepped back and flipped the switch in the shaft, flooding Tom Harlow's basement editing room with light. Sigh had his hand on the console, struggled to get to his feet. He looked at her, affecting dignity with his nose up. He pushed his glasses tight to his forehead, said, Well, you succeeded in scaring the living bejesus out of me. Justine laughed and put her hand over her heart. It didn't do much for my blood pressure either. She looked around. What were you doing down here? Kloppenberg brushed lint from his jacket sleeve, said, Going over it a second time. As a matter of fact, I was wondering what was behind that door when the lights went off and you jumped out. I didn't jump out, Justine said. You make me sound like the boogeyman. I thought that's who you were, exactly, Sai said. What's up there? Justine described where the shaft led and what she'd found. So all computers and all cameras were taken with the family, Sai said. Anything in here? He shook his head. All the editing equipment is intact, but there's no hard drives, no film. She frowned. Nothing at all to do with Saigon Falls? Nothing. Justine ran the facts as she knew them through her head. The shaft connected the Harlow's bedroom suite to the panic room and the editing room. The children had said that their father had spent much of their first days home down here in the editing room, working on the film which was what Tom had told Sanders he was going to do when they got back. Was the film behind their disappearance? Had Tom's cameras happened upon something politically explosive while they were in Vietnam? Or something that implicated... 
McCormick, the FBI forensics tech, entered the editing room, looked surprised to see Justine, glanced at the open door to the shaft, frowned, but said, Thought you should know, Cy. Cadaver-sniffing dogs just hit. We're digging for a body. Chapter 68 I pointed a finger toward my office door. Privates not for sale, and you two were just leaving. Heh, <laughs> Tommy said. That's not how this is. It's exactly how this is ending, I said, then gazed over at the mobster. Carmine, I respect you, so I've got to level with you. I told a fib earlier. Gee, that's a fucking surprise. Gonna come clean now? Tell me you did tip the feds and you're sorry? Sorry? No. This place is bugged, I said firmly, staring him right in the eye. Audio, video, multiple angles. I've got every bit of your little extortion scheme on record, including your admission that you sought contraband narcotics and participated in a conspiracy to rig my brother's trial with me as the fall guy. Carmine's rat seemed to be giving him sudden indigestion. That's bullshit. You show me. No. I think I'll show FBI Special Agent in Charge Christine Townsend, a personal friend, and take my chances in court where I will testify against my brother, I said, and folded my hands across my chest, not looking at Tommy at all. Anything else to say, or are we done? Carmine licked his lips, looked around the office, trying to spot the bugs. Then he smiled. You think you can outmaneuver me? I just did. That pissed him off completely. He stared bullets at me, muttered, You fucked me, and Carmine Nochia is like an elephant when it comes to that sort of thing. So you're having tusks implanted to go along with your phony Harvard MBA? Is that what you're telling me? I asked. You're a dead man, Jack, Carmine said, stood, nodded to Tommy. A pleasure, Carmine, Tommy, I said, as always. I waited until they slammed the door behind them, then held off another minute before collapsing into my chair. Sweat pooled at my lower back. They'd had me and I'd bluffed my way out. There were no bugs in the room, no audio, no video. But there sure as hell were going to be by the end of the day. Chapter 69 Cy and McCormick used soft brushes to whisk away the last of the soil covering the corpse's face. The victim's chest and denim shirt were already exposed, revealing a bloom of dried blood and the exit hole of a bullet wound. He'd been shot through the heart from behind. He'd been in the ground at least five days, and the smell on the downwind side of the grave was worse than the odor in Leona Casa Madre's bathroom. Justine crouched upwind, listening as the barking cadaver dogs were loaded back into a kennel truck and watching Kloppenberg and the FBI tech work, uncovering the dead man's bloated features. For reasons she did not fully grasp, these things only served to throw her mind back to the attack in the jail cell. She saw Carla coming for her with that knife, that shiv. Justine's breath began to speed, and so did her heart. Spots appeared before her eyes. Suddenly, she wanted to be anywhere but by a grave. Then she heard Sai say, It's Hector, Hector Ramon, the groundskeeper. The spots faded, and she looked down at the grotesque mask the decomposition had crafted. How can you know that? Kloppenberg gestured to a silver bolo tie around the victim's neck. I saw a picture of him in his quarters. He was wearing it. We'll run dental records to confirm, McCormick said. Much the way her mind had whirled back to the attack in the cell in Guadalajara, Justine's thoughts now flew to the timeline of events she'd been carrying around in her head. Based on the surviving security camera footage, Jennifer Harlow had last been seen leaving the house on her evening run around eight. Justine would bet that Hector Ramon was killed at roughly the same time, or shortly thereafter, in that two-hour gap that Del Rio had discovered. But why kill the groundskeeper? Why not others? Are the dogs still searching? She asked. Dissecting the estate on a grid pattern, McCormick said. Justine blinked, nodded, felt indescribably tired. She looked at Sai. I'm not feeling that well, Seymour. Think I need to head back to L.A. You okay? He asked. 
Just a little lightheaded, she said. And there's not much more I can do here today anyway. Sai's elastic face turned concerned. I've never heard you trying to cut short your workday before, Justine. You want to see a doctor? No, I just need to go home, get some sleep. I'll be better tomorrow. Chapter 70 Gwen Scott Evans wore a mask, a bikini made of iridescent feathers, and glittering high-heeled pumps. She held out her hand to me, said, Have you seen Tommy or Carmine anywhere? They're late for the ball, Jack, and I so wanted to dance. Jack? Mobot called and rapped on my door jam. I startled awake from a nap on the sofa in my office, sat up, looked around groggily saw the wonder lady moving toward my desk and groaned. Time is it? Four in the afternoon, she said. Sai just called. Cadaver dogs sniffed Hector Ramon's body at the Harlow estate. That woke me up. Any other bodies? They're looking. Mobot is by nature a mothering type. She also has a case of OCD when it comes to messiness and rearranges my desk whenever she can. She started stacking folders said, Found a few things in those files you brought me. Tell me, I said, sitting up, desperately wanting a cup of coffee now. Maureen looked down at the hopelessness of my desktop, hesitated, sighed, said, It's better I show you. I followed her down the hall to Sai's lab, trying to figure out why I was so damn tired, then remembering that facing down a mobster and a conniving brother is a stressful thing, rings you out. I stopped in the office break room, got a cup of coffee, and then went to sit beside Mobot at her workstation, looking at an array of screens that displayed scans of various legal and financial documents detailing the activities of Harlow Quinn Productions and the making of Saigon Falls. This is dense stuff, Mobot began, and some of the accounting practices at work here are as archaic as a film studio's, and forgive me, I haven't waded through half of it yet, but... But you found something, I pressed. Much as I love her, Mobot has a tendency to qualify everything if I let her. She nodded, annoyed. Until roughly twenty-four hours before they disappeared, the whole kit and caboodle was on the verge of insolvency. They were burning through cash at an astonishing rate shooting in Vietnam. That's what Sanders said, I replied. He did, Mobot replied. He also said that Tom predicted a white knight investor, which is what he got. When? Day after they got back, she said, and typed on her keyboard. Up popped evidence of a ten million dollar deposit in the account of Harlow Quinn Productions. Cancel check? I asked. Ahead of you. A scan of the check appeared on the screen, made out to Harlow Quinn. The check was drawn on a Panamanian bank and dated two days prior to the Harlow's disappearance. The account holder was identified as ESH Limited. Who's ESH Limited? Don't know, she admitted. Yet. But here's the really interesting thing. Mobot gave her computer another command, and records of four other payments from ESH Limited to Harlow Quinn appeared. One for two million, three for five million each, all had been made within the last twenty-four months. I glanced at the total, said, Twenty-seven million. There's the deep, deep pockets. Whoever ESH Limited is, they own a third of this film, maybe more. Sounds about right, Mobot agreed. Whoever they are, they've got lots of money in the Harlow Quinn game. And yet Terry Graves never mentioned getting a ten million dollar cash infusion, I said. Hard to believe, Mobot said. Chapter 71 Sir, you're not supposed to be here, a voice complained, and I felt my feet rudely pushed out of the way. You need to sleep. Go home. Find a hotel room or something. In a chair in the corner of Del Rio's room in the medical center, I blinked awake to find a Filipina nurse named Angela glaring at me, hands on her hips. She could not have been more than five feet tall, but she was imposing, and I sat up quickly, saying, I didn't know I was. Don't listen to him, Angela, Del Rio called from the bed. Jack's been a freeloader going way back. 
He'll sleep anywhere he can. I grinned. That sounded like the Del Rio I knew and loved. Then I looked back at the nurse, who was still royally ticked off. My face fell. She tapped her nurse's clog on the floor, arms crossed, said, I have to bathe this poor man. You want to watch? I think I'll spare Rick that final indignity, I said, stood, edged away from her, feeling like she might try to bite me if I wasn't careful. Del Rio was laughing, so I went out the door with a major smile on my face. There were many things about my life at that point that were muddy, to say the least, but hearing my best friend laugh was not one of them. Hearing that laugh gave me hope that no matter what Tommy or Carmine or the team at Harlow Quinn or no prisoners might be plotting, an important part of my life was going to be all right. That thought was enough to keep me in a positive state as I waited until 6 a.m. for the cafeteria line to open, then ordered up two bacon and eggs over easy breakfasts and carried them back to Del Rio's room, mulling over events prior to my coming to the hospital last night. Sanders, Terry Graves, and Camilla Bronson had not returned my calls, but Special Agent Christine Townsend had, and after hearing what we'd found in the Harlow Quinn files, she promised to have someone look into ESH Limited. The rub was that she didn't know how long that would take. On the way over to the hospital, Cy had given me a full oral report on what had been discovered and not discovered at the Harlow's estate, including the body of Hector Ramon, the secret shaft, and the camera mounts in the panic room. He also said Justine wasn't feeling well and had asked him to take her home early. He said she'd been quiet the entire trip down from Ojai. Doesn't sound like her, I'd said. No, it doesn't, Cy had admitted. I'd called Justine's house and cell phone several times, left messages, but had not heard back until shortly before I fell asleep in Del Rio's hospital room. Around midnight, She'd texted me that she was okay, but dead tired and crazy for sleep. I knew the feeling and yawned as I entered Del Rio's room with breakfast, only to come up short when Angela blocked the way, looking at the food suspiciously. What's that? she demanded. Bacon and eggs over easy, English muffin, black coffee, I replied. His all-time favorite breakfast. She shook her head. Richard is on a special diet. No worries, I said, sweeping past her. I'll eat Richard's bacon. Wait, she sputtered angrily. Angela, Del Rio called. Come on, I can't take the stuff they bring around on the carts. There's nothing wrong with my swallow reflex. A speech pathologist lady checked yesterday. She said I was good for anything I wanted. Hmm, <laughs> Angela said, glancing at me as if I were public enemy number one. I'll look at the chart again. If it's not on the chart, he's getting out of here. Then she stormed out of the room. Del Rio said, She's kind of protective. Notice that, I said, putting his tray on the table. Del Rio's attention flickered past the food, past me, focused on the television hanging from the ceiling. Turn that up, he said. It's the pier. Picking up the remote, I turned off the mute. A gratingly familiar voice filled the room a report by none other than Bobby Newton, who was standing near the entrance to the Huntington Beach Pier. As the pier opens for the first time since the bombing, police, local business people, and residents are cautiously optimistic, she intoned. It was a sentiment echoed early this morning by both Mayor Wills and Chief Fesco. The screen cut to the mayor and chief hurrying into City Hall. Wills slowed, said, there hasn't been an attack by no prisoners in nearly 36 hours, and no contact from him whatsoever. We cautiously hope things stay that way. The screen jumped to Fesco, who said, We're still in full pursuit of this maniac, but it is possible he's come to his senses, realized we will catch him, and decided to end the random violence and this obscene extortion scheme before it goes any further. Chapter 72 In the garage in the City of Commerce, Cobb and the others were watching the same television coverage, listening to the same remarks by Mayor Wills and Chief Fesco. Close enough, Cobb said, clapping his hand against his thigh. No prisoners is back in action. You're up, Mr. Johnson. 
The wiry African-American cranked his head around, cracking his neck. Have you developed a scene of opportunity, Mr. Cobb? We have, Cobb said. It will take nerves of steel to take full advantage of the situation. Luckily, I've got them, Johnson said. Cobb nodded. It was true. Johnson had been with him longer than any of the other men. He was not creative or impulsive like Hernandez. He wasn't clever with his hands like Nickerson, or a tech genius like Watson, or a savvy web guy like Kelleher. But Johnson did have nerves. No. Balls of steel. The crazier the situation, the tighter he stuck to the plan, to the objective. Bullets could be flying. People could be dying all around him in the chaos of war. But Johnson just kept plowing forward. Noon, Cobb told Johnson. Lunchtime. That'll shake them up, Hernandez said. Shock them out of the mundane. Exactly, Mr. Hernandez, Cobb said. And when they're good and shocked... We'll turn the tables on them one last time, and take them for every penny we can get. I like that idea, Mr. Cobb, Hernandez said. Me too, Johnson said. A lot. I'm thinking a place in Tahiti, you know. Don't let yourself start dreaming of how you'll spend it all, gentlemen, Cobb cautioned. We have to be totally focused until the deed is done. Then you may dream as big as you want. Hoorah, Johnson said softly. Who fucking ra? Cobb looked at Nickerson. You'll brief him? My pleasure, Mr. Cobb, Nickerson said, handing an iPad to Johnson. You'll see the floor plan as well as photographs I shot in there yesterday. I've identified suggested entrances, exits. This should be a target-rich environment if there ever was one. Watson continued to coach Johnson through the particulars of his attack plan. But Cobb's mind was already pushing on. He looked at Watson, who was staring as he had been for hours at the screen of an iPad. Where are we, Mr. Watson? Cobb asked. Will you be ready? Watson stroked his pale goat's beard, looked up, nodded. All they have to do is make the connection, and it should be a short crawl back up the data stream to the open digital vault. Traceability on their end? Cobb asked. Virtually nil, Watson said. They'd have to be looking for us to counterattack in the virtual world. And what's the chance of that? None, Mr. Watson, Cobb said happily. Their attention will be completely diverted. Outstanding. Watson beamed at this rare compliment, but Cobb noticed Kelleher tensing and looking up, worried now. We just lost Facebook. Shut us down. Too bad. We had more than 350,000 following the feed. I believe we'll lose YouTube next, but as of now, we have over 15 million hits. Cobb thought about this. They'll try to track us through the accounts? Affirmative, Watson said. But they won't get anywhere. Everything we fed them was done on stolen computers that are now in a landfill in Oxnard. Suggestions, gentlemen, Cobb said. Options, Kelleher said. We could go to Twitter. Cobb considered that for several seconds, said, No, I vote silence. Nothing unnerves people more than silence, especially people whose mundane lives are threatened. Every creak in the building, every sudden movement by a stranger, every loud noise gets reflected and amplified until every moment becomes tainted with fear and anguish. That's what we're after here, gentlemen. Part 4. No Exit Chapter 73 An hour earlier, just as dawn was cracking, Justine sat in her car down the street from CrossFit, watching the regulars filing broccoli into the box, wanting to join them, but feeling as if she'd betrayed them, betrayed herself by using the place as, well... She'd hoped that a solid night's rest would help her see things more clearly, more rationally. But now all she felt was confusion. Who was this person growing inside her whom she simply did not recognize? Then she saw Paul and her confusion deepened. He was jogging down the sidewalk from the east toward the gym. That endearing smile plastered across his face. 
Her overwhelming impulse was to leap from her car. Part of her wanted to stop him before he entered and bring him back home to her bed. Another part of her wanted to confront him, tell him it was a horrible mistake brought on by a horrible incident, and that it could never happen again. Or at least, not without their getting to know each other better. But the better part of her wanted to rest her head on the steering wheel and cry. For much of her life, Justine had felt in control of her emotions and actions, anchored in a way that helped her help others deal with the aftermath of trauma. Now, she felt weirdly unanchored, beyond adrift, as if she'd been caught in a slowly twisting whirlpool that threatened to drown the person she'd always believed herself to be. Fighting for air, literally feeling the panic of drowning, she threw the car into gear and, without looking, pulled out onto the street. Tires screeched on cement. A yellow lowrider pickup truck nearly sideswiped her, veered into the opposite lane, almost had a head-on with an approaching bus, but then swerved back into the lane beside her. Justine almost threw up from the adrenaline that flooded through her. The sensation got worse when an iron...